Good afternoon. Welcome to today's city council meeting. We'll reconvene in open session. Uh, Mr. Gouin, item 3.1. Thank you. Item 3.1 is a wireless small cell deployment on city-owned streetlights and joint utility poles. And presenting is Deputy Director of Development Services, Gabe Osborne. Good afternoon, Mayor Schwedhelm and members of the council. As Mr. Guin mentioned in the introduction, the item before the council at this point in time is an update on our small cell deployments, which are cellular infrastructure that is being installed in the right of way. I'd like to begin the study session by providing a brief background of how we got to where we are today. And that background will include past council discussions. So we've had two action items that resulted in policy creation or amendments that we'll talk about. And we also had two study sessions to discuss the deployments of small cells. Also get into a detail of the different cellular types. So we're, we're focusing mainly on small cells, but we'll also talk about macro sites, which are cellular installations that are taking place on private property. We'll talk about the difference as well as the legal framework that controls those. So there is quite a bit of federal and state requirements that affect the approval process when dealing with cellular sites. Also talk about the inst can I interrupt you just for a minute? Just Absolutely. for council, we're gonna stop after I think about slide 16 to give you an opportunity to ask questions then we'll finish the presentation. And then on slide 32, I think there's 33 slides after that, another opportunity. So you'll have two opportunities to ask questions. Sorry, so, Gabe, go ahead. No problem. So we'll also talk about installations. Uh, so this will focus on, on the installations that we currently have within the city limits. So those are either going to be installed small cells or permitted small cells. Those are all focusing on deployment of the 4G network that Verizon is focusing on. Now, of course, there is more of a nationwide discussion about 5G. So we will have a further discussion in the presentation about how the deployment of these small cells would potentially support the installation of a 5G network. We're also gonna talk about community concerns. In the previous two study sessions, we focused a lot on the importance of expanding cellular connectivity. It's either closing coverage gaps or it's providing better data. So an example of a coverage gap would be dropping a cell phone call while driving down a street. The better data would be more capacity to high-speed data and better speed. So that's really catered to individuals that are using phones for that purpose of downloading video, for example. So we see from the prevalence of cell phone use that that is desired. And But instead of focusing on that, we, we wanted to focus on some of the negative sides of that rollout. And those came through with the community concerns that we heard. So we're really not gonna talk much about the portent of the network expansion, but we're going to talk about the community concerns. That, that's the intention of this study session. So following along with that, we wanted to take Take those community concerns and see what we can work out as far as solutions go to those that are within our control. So we'll be talking a lot today about a limited release on streetlight installations. So all the installations thus far have been on PG&E utility poles. So we'll talk about the importance of that. I'll explain further why we want to do that and that will be limited to commercial areas only, non-residential. And I'll talk about what that looks like as well. And the intention behind that is really to address the concerns that we've heard over the last year or so. Um, we will also be talking about emergency alerting. That, that came up in previous study sessions. Uh, we were fresh off of the 2017 wildfires at that point. Uh, since then, we had massive evacuations due to the Kincaid fire. Uh, we've also had power shutdown events. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the importance of maintaining um, emergency alerting in those types of events. So when looking at the previous council actions, uh, there, were, uh, there was an adoption in July of 2007 that created Council Policy 300-04, and that's our telecommunications policy, and that deals with the installation of telecommunications equipment and antennas, and it mainly focused at that time on either publicly owned or privately owned parcels, not the right of way. And those are usually where you see macro sites, they're larger installations, so most of the language in that policy really governed macro sites. We amended the policy in February of 2017 to incorporate small cells. So those are slightly different, they're smaller in size and they're located in the public right of way. And that policy governs the guidelines that the provider must follow before getting approval of those sites. And in the policy it requires a master license agreement, so that would be the provider executing an agreement with the city that gives them rights to install small cells in the city limits. It does not give specific poles. Then they have to follow through with a site license agreement, which is approval for a specific pole. And that is a discretionary act Action, so we can control the outcome of that. There are also annual license fees that are negotiated into the master license agreement and the execution authority has been delegated down to the city manager or his or her designee. Currently, assistant city manager Guin has the authority to execute those agreements. 
In addition to the adoption of the policy, we had council study sessions conducted on March 6th of 2018 and June 5th of 2018. And at that point, we were deploying small cells really based on the fact that we had an approved policy to do so. So the intention behind the study sessions was to provide an update. And based on the feedback we received from council members and from the community at that time, we elected to pause the installations that we controlled under the policy, which were those on streetlights. So for the last year or so, we've been trying to figure out a way to move this forward while addressing the concerns. So since the pause was placed by staff, as we talk through some of these solutions, some of them will move forward based on the language of the policy as early as tomorrow, and some of them will require a future council adoption. And I'll be very clear as we step through these as to which one will happen now, and that's our proposal, and which ones will come back to council to lump it back together into more of a formal policy discussion. So we'll start with a brief discussion of macro sites. Uh, so these are typically larger installations, as we can see of the image on the left, that's an antenna array. Uh, so there's multiple antennas, uh, they're larger in size, uh, there could be multiple providers on one site. Uh, so the building on the right is actually the fire training center. So that's a city facility and we see the antennas on the top. Um, for other city facilities, are, they're commonly on water tanks. Uh, so they look for the height to get the, the proper coverage for the antenna. So they also go in private structures. So oftentimes the provider will negotiate with a private property owner. We've seen them in church steeples or on private buildings. And the construction is addressed under the zoning code as well as the council policy. The approval process requires that the provider submit a use permit or a design review. Uh, they are reviewed against published design guidelines in the zoning code. And as part of that process, they're required to submit an alternate site license agreement as well as a radio frequency analysis, excuse me, site uh, alternate site report and a radio frequency analysis. So the alternate site analysis basically looks at other sites in which a similar facility can go to make sure that this is creating the least amount of impact. So they have to show that they looked at other sites prior to getting approval to put it on private property. The radio frequency analysis looks at the radio frequency emissions from the site. And we'll have a hefty amount of conversation about this. This is an important piece to the overall deployment. Uh, so this will be covered for, further in future slides to explain how how that review process works. So in addition, the review process involves public meetings and public hearings. That's part of the use permit or the design review. Uh, there are building permits. Um, those are not for the installation of the equipment. Those are for the attachment of the equipment to the building. So that's what we look for as, as part of the building permit process. And there are also lease agreements if it's on city-owned property. So as I mentioned, there is a significant amount of legal framework associated with all the cellular installation types. Um, the important one is associated with the RF. And, and this it actually comes from the Federal Communications Commissioner, the FCC. And the RF is basically has to be reviewed against admission limits presented by the, the FCC. So they determine the thresholds in which these sites can exceed. And then there's an analysis that takes place through the review process of the site to determine that they're, they're within the threshold. And there were federal law that was generated in 1996, and this is a Telecommunications Act, that states that the city is prohibited from denying a permit to construct a wireless facility based on health concerns over RF emissions, provided that the emissions from the facility comply with FCC standards. So a big piece with the review is ensuring through that analysis that the installation meets the FCC standards. The more recent cellular type is the small cell. And this is smaller in size typically, and they were designed to basically fill in smaller coverage gaps. So we're seeing the placement uh, predominantly occur in the public right of way. And they are currently covered under council policy 300-04 and chapter 13 of the city code. And that section of the city code deals with street encroachments and it requires an encroachment permit process. So typically when we review these installations, uh, they are reviewed to ensure that they're consistent with public street standards. Um, we're concerned about pedestrian travel, vehicular travel, and protecting the public corridor. Uh, it's important to note with the small cells that there are two pole types that they go on and there's two separate processes for those pole types. So as we can see to the left, that is what's referred to as a joint utility pole. That pole is actually owned by PG&E. The city does not retain ownership rights over that. So on that pole, to the top, we have power. 
and the white circles are the small cell equipment, and the cables that are midway up are other communication cables. They may be fiber, they may be Comcast, um, but we have multiple providers on that pole. So those poles, since they're not owned by the city, do not fall under council policy 300-04, and they are able to go straight to an encroachment permit process, and that was discussed um, in depth in the previous council uh, study sessions. So as part of that, they apply for an encroachment permit. They have to submit a traffic control plan that makes sure that the actual construction under the uh, encroachment permit does not impact traffic. We looked at it for consistency with design standards, and it does have a notification requirement. The notification for requirement for encroachment permits is a little different than entitlements or design review applications. In that situation, since it's covered under the standards, it looks at construction impacts, and those are typically noise, um, impacting driveways, closing sidewalks. So the notification process is typically 48 hours prior to performing work, uh, which for the small cells we learned as part of this process is not enough for the community. They need more notice on these. So we'll talk about this as a fix a little later on in the process. Uh, there is also a building permit, and that's typically for the meter installation, and PG&E often requires that prior to setting a meter. Now, once again, there is legal framework around these. In this situation, it's from the state. So the California Public Utility Commission has granted the wireless providers rights to the poles. So they treat them very similar to a wired provider. So PG&E, when making a determination, doesn't have the authority to deny the installation on the pole as long as it meets certain criteria. And that criteria is usually associated with the installation not impacting the operational nature of other utilities that are on that pole and the structural aspect of the pole. So it's holding more weight. So as part of the process, the provider is required to submit a structural analysis, and in many of these situations, the pole is being replaced to address that as part of the installation. The other type of small cell are those that are on city-owned poles. So when we talk about pausing, um, this is what the pause has applied to. So we have not installed any small cells on city-owned poles to date. So from a construction process, it's very similar to the joint poles. Uh, they are required to get an encroachment permit. The council policy requires more front-end work. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, they're required to obtain a site license agreement um, as well as a master license agreement. They're also required as part of the review to mitigate any operational issues. So we do maintain the pole to provide the street light. So what we're looking at is how does that pole react in a pole knockdown? Uh, so there's shutoffs to make sure that that can be safely handled if it's laying in the middle of the street. We also look at routine maintenance and how they're occupying the pole to make sure we can handle that properly. Um, another aspect is we look at controlling the ground equipment. So what we've seen with previous rollouts, there's larger cabinets, and we'll talk about that in a little more depth later on about what the benefit of that cabinet is, but it's also a piece that occupies the right-of-way around our infrastructure. So what's the benefit of maintaining that right-of-way corridor and reducing the impact? So the legal framework in general around small cells is the FCC has been pushing for encouraging the deployment of these devices, and there was an action late last year that really encouraged agencies to move these forward. And one of the important pieces is they really say that we can't deny them. Um, it really brings in the RF, but one of the important pieces is a shot clock. So they created a shot clock, which basically defines the period in time in which we must review the application. And it's defined as either 150, 90, or 60 days. And most of the small cells will likely fall in 60 or 90 days. It's based on the complexity of the installation. And the application can be deemed automatically approved if the state or local agency does not act with in that time frame. Um, now, what we'll talk about a little later on this presentation, all of this is fairly new. There is going to be a lot of case law that comes out of this. There's a lot of challenges associated with some of these, and it is going to take time to figure out ultimately where these land. But this is really the initial stance of, of where the FCC has been coming from with a recent order. So the next slide shows the actual deployments that we have in the city. So when we saw previous maps, what those maps focused on were permitted applications, but they also focused on applications that we had not seen yet. So they were really conceptual sites, and those are always good because we can understand the overall deployment of the provider. So what we see here is the only sites that we've had installed are from Verizon, and once again, these are all on the joint poles. So we had 31 completed, and those are reflected by the green dots. We have 14 that are issued permits that are, have not been started, and those are the orange dots. 
And then the blue dot is important. They are not small cell sites. They are locations where they were providing wiring or fiber to support the small cell sites. So that was a piece that the community wasn't really understanding our last go around because we were focusing on the small cell sites in particular with our data transparency. And all of a sudden work to support the small cell was happening a block away. So we wanted to make sure that that was brought into the conversation too, to give the complete package of what that impact to the overall area looks like. So what we had in the other map, and I don't have a slide that shows that, but we can talk about what was being proposed the last go around. So we had two companies at the, at the table the last time we did a study session. That was Verizon that was interested in deployments and mobility. And Verizon had 68 sites at the time that they were looking at, and that would include these, and anything in addition to those would have been the streetlight sites. And mobility had 18 sites that they were looking at. So that was a total of 86 deployments that we were looking at in the city with those two providers. Providers. Of course, that did not include AT&T at the time, and it did not include Sprint. So as we move forward, we'll see a more comprehensive program as we bring more of the providers to the table to better understand the total saturation of small cells. So as part of the rollout process, there was a significant amount of community outreach that was performed. Um, Verizon was the main provider at the time, and they conducted open house events uh, that occurred in really the first quarter of 2018. And there were four of those. They were conducted in various days throughout the week and various times. And looking at the stats, uh, we had 26 participants from the community in the first event, 20 in the second, 10 in the third, and four in the last event. And in addition to those meetings, we wanted to conduct more down to the neighborhood level sort of meetings with the community members that had concerns with this. And that's highlighted in those neighborhood meetings at the bottom with the Hidden Valley Group and the Neotomas Group. So those were two potential sites that were being looked at the, at the time. They were both on joint poles. And we wanted to get a good understanding of what that overall residential neighborhood was concerned with to really understand if it was RF, it was aesthetics, to basically be able to bucket all those concerns. So um, we actually had two with the Hidden Valley Neighborhood Group, one with myself and one with Verizon, talking to them about coverage, and then I conducted a meeting with the Neotomas group around that same time frame to, to better understand what those concerns were. And what we found is that they had a tendency to fall into the following categories, is we did receive concerns regarding health risks, and they were citing RF exposure. Uh, those had a tendency to come out in both the community meetings as well as the neighborhood meetings. Uh, there were a lot of concerns about aesthetics and the look and feel of these installations. And some of that concern was how does that affect property value? So they were claiming potential loss of property value. Uh, there was definitely a concern about saturation. And what we saw at the time, and what many of the members that the community thought was really the tip of the iceberg with small cell deployments. We only had Verizon installing, and Verizon had about 68. There were concerns that there would be more from the other providers, and we would have a significant number of these in residential neighborhoods. Many individuals cited a lack of notification, so it was either a lack of early notification or a lack of notification. Um, and then we also had environmental impacts, and that was mainly associated with the cabinets that were being installed, which provided backup batteries to the small cells, powers it pro approximately four hours after power outage. And there were concerns about how that battery backup would operate in a vehicle strike situation, um, which we'll talk about in future slides as well. So as I mentioned, what we've really wanted to do is get it down to what the community concerns are and how can we fix these. And with the federal regulation, obviously the RF standards become problematic because we can't make a decision based on RF. So oftentimes I'll get the question, are small cells safe? And that's a bit of a challenging question to ask because of all the technical review that goes into the development standards and the review. So what we wanted to do is bring a consultant on board that could handle the technical aspect of RF testing of standard development in really 5G, and how is that going to evolve as far as the standards go from a 5G standpoint? So we went into contract with Hammond, Hammond and Edison, and I have Bill Hammond with me today, who will talk about the RF aspect. So the way it works with the RF consultants is they often do reviews for the cellular providers. They participate in community meetings supported by local agencies, by school districts, and by cellular providers. So as a licensed individual, they are tasked with basically taking the information that's brought to them, making a determination, and giving a finding that's to the best of their knowledge. So at this point, I'd like to build, bring Bill forward to have him discuss the main points that are highlighted in this um, slide. Good afternoon, Mayor, uh, Council Members. My name is Bill Hammett. I'm a registered professional engineer in the state of California. 
registered professional engineer in the state of California. I manage a firm of uh, 18. We're located uh, just on Highway 12 in, in Sonoma. I uh, have been there since 94. Um, a regular part of our practice is the calculation or the measurement or the mitigation where it's appropriate of radio frequency exposure conditions. We do this work for, uh, for uh, broadcast stations, for wireless carriers, for cities, for school districts, for landlords. As engineers, the issue is really straightforward. What are the exposure levels, whether calculated or measured, and how do they compare to the standards? Um, I've been doing this for 34 years. Uh, McGraw-Hill has published uh, the text I wrote on this topic, and I figure it's been well over 20,000 sites we've done evaluations for uh, over that period of time. Um, I wanted to uh, talk, uh, address the question, are small cells safe? Uh, the timing is good in that uh, the FCC just released its most recent report and order. It had said uh, some time ago, uh, back in 2013, that they were going to study this issue and consider uh, a new set of rules, and they've released those rules. Uh, the, the key finding is that there is no change in the exposure standards. They have not tightened. Uh, the exposure standards that have been in existence since uh, they were adopted in 1996. Um, 1996, uh, it was an act of Congress. It wasn't the FCC that said, well, let's have standards. It was an act of Congress signed by Bill Clinton, uh, the Telecommunications Act, that directed the FCC, you will adopt a standard, and that'll be the only standard uh, that's applicable throughout the country. Uh, Mr. Osborne has mentioned that the exemption that is in the Telecommunications Act exempts local jurisdictions from applying anything tighter than the federal standard. Um, so part of the analysis that he described the application process is a showing of whether or not it will comply with the standard. That's the, the threshold that, that needs to be met. Once that threshold is met, then the issue of RF exposure, health effects is off the table as far as a local jurisdiction is concerned. Um, so that's one piece of, of current new information is the FCC's uh, report and order. Uh, another key piece of information uh, is an update in the standard on which they had, they had based their, their adoption on. That is, the FCC is not a health agency. In fact, when Congress said you will adopt a standard, they went to EPA and said, well, what do we adopt? And EPA said, well, we don't have a standard. So the FCC ended up adopting a blend of two standards that were in existence at that time. One of those was the IEEE standard, uh, the 1992 standard. It was updated in 1990, uh, 1999, it was updated again in 2005, and now it's just been updated again in 2019. So we have that document based on all the research that's been done uh, over that period of time. This is the standard. It's a, a very interesting technical read. Uh, they have not tightened the standards from the previous edition. And then the third bit is uh, uh, the expectation from the uh, ICNIRP people. This is uh, the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection. They have had a standard for many years. They also, much like IEEE, was looking at its standard. Do we need to tighten it? Do we need to change it? Um, and ICNIRP hasn't yet issued theirs, but they've given an indication that they're not planning to tighten the standard. So uh, the, the, a key quotation um, from all of this new information, um, and this is from the, the new 19, uh, 2019 standard, there is no credible indication of adverse effects caused by chronic exposures below levels specified in the standard. So for 70 years, they've been doing research on this topic, um, and they, there's no credible evidence of any adverse impact. That's at levels equal to this standard or below. So I'm just repeating exactly what the what the standards say. All right, excuse me. Uh, if people are going to interrupt the presentation, you're interrupting the meeting, and you'll be asked to leave. So we're going to give everyone time to share their opinions with council, and please respect the folks that are sharing their opinions with us now. Thank you. So those are those are the facts of what ha what the the environment is for the uh, standards. Um, FCC, IEEE, ICNIRP coming up. Um, I want to talk a little bit about 5G, and I suggested to Gabe that he put it in quotation marks because 5G means several different things. At heart, um, it's a technology for encoding data onto a radio wave. So uh, if you 
listen to the radio, AM is amplitude modulation. It's a way of putting information onto a radio wave. Um, FM is frequency modulation. It's a way of putting data onto a radio wave. Um, as we've gone through different generations of uh, improved data capacity by the carriers, uh, by the industry, you know, we've had 2G and 3G uh, where there were different technologies. In 3G, they had two different technologies, GSM and CDMA were two different methods for encoding data on the radio waves. By the time they've got to 4G, LTE is a term you may have heard, long-term evolution. That's the technology, that's the technique that they use for encoding data on the radio waves. 5G NR, new radio, is just that. It's another way of encoding information onto radio waves. So when people say 5G, they could be re referring to the new, more efficient way of coding, energy, coding data onto radio waves. Um, and 5G can be rolled out on the same set of frequencies that are being used uh, at all the existing sites right now that are on your phone now, that have been for a long time, the different frequency bands that the FCC has allotted for that purpose. 5G sometimes refers to a different set of frequencies. And the commission is releasing new frequencies in the millimeter wave band. They're higher by about a factor of 10 in frequency. The wavelengths are shorter, they can get more information on, and it's going to be uh, a very, powerful method for downloading uh, information. So uh, we need to make a distinction because a lot of carriers now are going to talk about doing 5G on their existing frequencies. No change, no, no change in equipment. Um, some carriers are, are, have purchased from the government these new millimeter wave uh, frequencies and they'll be using those frequencies for 5G. The bandwidth is larger up there at the new, new bands. And so it's gonna be easier for them to get more data uh, through more bandwidth. But uh, T-Mobile uh, purchased uh, old TV channels um, in, the, in the 600 megahertz band. Uh, they're gonna be looking at doing 5G on that. Sprint has some frequencies in the, what's called the BRS band um, at around 2.5 gigahertz. Um, so they're using existing frequencies and rolling, trying to roll out 5G to see if they can get better, better data capacity, which is anticipated. So the question was technology, yes, it's a technology. Does it also refer to frequency? It can refer to frequencies. And some of the comments we hear behind me are, are talking about the new millimeter wave um, where the standards do apply. We can go back to the question of the standards. The standards include the millimeter wave frequencies. The limits are, are established there. Um, and the, the literature uh, that I gave you the quote before, a lot of literature is done at millimeter wave frequencies, no credible indication of adverse effects. So that's the answer to, uh, to the initial question, are they safe? Full compliance with the standards. Now, I was also asked to talk about the testing requirements, uh, which are a local issue. And some jurisdictions uh, have more strenuous measurement requirements than do others in terms of monitoring. What we find, having done this at literally tens of thousands of sites, is that the carriers install the radio, particularly at the small cells, they'll install the radio, turn it on, and it runs. The radio's running at maximum capacity. It's not like somebody can crank up the power at some other location. Um, the radios are put in and they're relatively low power facilities, five watt, 10 watt, maybe 20 watt radios. Um, just put them in and they run. So the, the levels that we've observed are very steady from, from these facilities. Um, and uh, the initial testing in some cases, uh, they may be put in omnidirectionals. I know that some of the Verizon proposals were for omnidirectional antennas, where they're up high um, on top of a phone pole higher than the neighboring uh, homes and residential areas. Uh, and those will be omnidirectional antennas sending it in all directions. When you get into more built up, um, uh, urban areas, uh, they'll often use directional antennas going up and down the street rather than back toward buildings, which may be closer. And so part of the, the testing process that we use, uh, we go in a bucket truck, go up and with, a, and with our meters measure at the antennas to make sure that if it is a directional, it's oriented correctly, make sure that levels um, are ex as expected 
well below the standard. Typically, we measure the distance to the public limit as a matter of a foot or a couple of feet. That's as far as the energy uh, goes before it drops below the, the public limit for a full-time, 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week exposure levels. And the inverse square law, and then I'll wrap up, the inverse square law says that as you move twice as far away from a power source, the energy level goes down by a factor of four, two squared. If you go 100, if you go 10 times as far away, the power level is going down by a factor of 100, 10 squared. It's dropping with a square of that increase in distance, which means when you get um, uh, 10, 20, you know, it, it's, it's dropping rapidly. A typical exposure level, even opposite at the same elevation as, as an antenna, would be a percent or less. So in addition to the safety factor built in the standard, there's another 100 times safety factor in most typical installations, at least. I'm happy to, to take questions. This was the point at which you wanted to pause yes, after slide is. 16. So I can talk at length on a variety of topics, how the systems work, the derivation of the standards, whatever uh, might be of interest. I know you've had several study sessions already. Great, thank you. Bring it back to council. Questions for either staff or Mr. Hammond. Seeing none. Go ahead, Go ahead Mr. Chavis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, what's considered a, a dangerous level of uh, RF? Um, the standards have uh, two tiers. So there's a, there's a public exposure level, um, five times m relaxed from that, so five times higher is the occupational level. The occupational level has a 10 times safety factor in it. So you'd have to be 10 times the occupational limit before you reach the most sensitive measure of, of uh, responsiveness. Mm -hmm. And that measure, um, I'll read you the quotation, the most sensitive reproducible effect is disruption of food-motivated behavior in animal species, ranging from rodents to primates and over a wide range of frequencies. So they'll have primates doing some task or, or related to, to food, and behind the wall where they can't see it, they'll turn on uh, RF and add a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more. At some point, they can sense it, and they just assume being in the other part of the room. That's the most sensitive measure. It's not uh, cancer, it's not cataracts, it's not any of these other things that you'll hear about, which occur, do occur, at exceedingly high levels. Mm -hmm. but, so but there's at, not like a, a level, it's not a number? It's, yes, yes there is. It's four watts per kilogram. That's what the, the research shows, 70 years of research shows, is a threshold of effects, and that the one I just described is that effect. Okay. So the standards have a 50 times safety factor, puts it at 0 0.08 watts per kilogram. That's the 50 times to the public limit, and if, as I described, you're 100 times below, you're 0.0008 watts per kilogram, well below that four. What level is common to experience in a small cell tower? Um, the question is proximity. If you're up at the antenna itself, you're working on the antenna, or you're changing the lights, you're going to be below the um, below the one milliwatt uh, typical exposure threshold level. Um, you might be 50% of the limit. If you're in a building nearby, you're going to be uh, one or two percent. If you're at ground nearby, you're going to be a tenth of a percent. So 100 times below, 1,000 times below. Okay, and if we're dealing with the same uh, radio waves, what would what would that would that be the same as if I was standing next to uh, a radio using high wattage to put out FM? Um, FM is? antennas would be uh, higher. They're, they typically will operate at, at higher power levels, and they're up high on on towers, so mm -hmm. the proximity, you can't really get near them. That inverse square law is what comes into play. Okay. So uh, we do work, uh, Sutra Towers a client, um, up on top of these uh, uh, tall towers that have the high power transmitter antennas on them, and we help them with the occupational exposure limits so they know what to shut down and so forth when people are doing work on the tower. Okay, and, and I, I forgive me, I know you touched on this, but how, do, how does this compare to the new, the new millimeter wave frequencies? Are these smaller frequencies that are moving through the air? The, the, they are a higher frequency, which means they're a shorter wavelength. They're more efficient at carrying information. Um, but they are part of the radio frequency spectrum. Uh, 
Um, there's a large spectrum that goes from uh, the, the alternating current that comes out of the wall socket 60 mm -hmm. times a second. Mm -hmm. um, a wavelength at that frequency is 5,000 kilometers. Here to New York is one wavelength at 60 hertz, the power line frequencies. Um, frequencies in the radio spectrum vary from 1,000 feet at, uh, at uh, AM mm -hmm. to a uh, fraction of an inch up at the millimeter waves. But they're larger? They're, they're larger frequencies, I guess. What, one of the concerns that I think um, somebody mentioned to me was that the, the smaller wavelengths allow it to pass through hard material easily. Is that, is that a valid claim? It's, it's actually the other way around. It's the other way around. It's the other way around. In the radio frequency spectrum, um, when you get into ionizing energy, mm -hmm ultraviolet x-rays uh, that add up over time, a little bit of damage, and I, we can talk about that, but the wavelength is so short, it'll get into a molecule and break off an electron. That's called ionization. So ionizing energy is up above light, above ultraviolet and x-rays. We're not talking about that. We're talking about um, radio waves, where the wavelength is anywhere from a thousand to you know, a half an inch, and those uh, don't like to go through something you can't see through. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we in and out of, of um, in San Francisco, as an example, you have to offer um, measurements to anybody who lives within 25 feet of an antenna. So we're in and out of apartment houses a lot because they're typically on apartment houses a little higher than the residential areas around. Um, and we measure directly below the antenna, you're getting next to nothing. Um, geez, is it, is it really working? Well, yes it is, you can go over by the window and it's higher at the window because the energy is going out toward the horizon, bouncing off of some other source and coming back in through the window. Um, you move the, the probe over next to the, the wall instead of the window, it goes down. A very reproducible, good demonstration of the fact that the energy is happy to go through something you can see through, doesn't like to go through things you can't. Thank you, and you mentioned uh, in your presentation um, that there were some strict uh, testing standards being implemented in other municipalities. Um, can you touch on that a little bit? What, what type of methodologies are they adopting as they adopt ordinances like this? Well, there's, it's, uh, the, the jurisdictions can insist on um, a preliminary study which has been talked about, uh, a theoretical study. We use the manufacturer's um, data for the antennas. We use the drawings as to where the antennas are gonna be, mm -hmm. evaluate where accessible areas might be where people could walk on a roof or in ground or in buildings nearby, and then calculate what it is at all those locations. All those locations have to comply with the standard uh, in order for the city to uh, have passed that threshold in, in order to grant a permit. Um, after the fact, um, the, uh, the cities can adopt um, whatever uh, program, and you're asking which one, San Francisco, every two years the sites have to be recertified. That's not the smell cells, that's only the, the macros that are on tops of buildings mm. that require a build, uh, conditional use permit. Um, every two years, and that's about the most strict of those. So we're in back to these sites every two years. Um, typically the operation hasn't changed, but the environment might have changed. Uh, a door that was formerly locked might be unlocked. For small cells, um, it's not a question of the environment changing because there are buildings nearby and the small cell is there and it runs. Uh, it's not that anything is changing in its operation, because if they do, they have to, if the carrier wants to make a change, they'd have to come back here and go through a permit process again that was described. Um, so that doesn't change, and the environment really doesn't change. Um, so in some cases where we've been back again um, after a change has been made, um, and, unless there's a change in the environment, it's still the same. Thanks so much. Certainly. Council, any other questions? Gabe, I have one question for you. If you can pull up slide 10. And just to reiterate, make sure I heard that with, that's a joint utility pool. If there was a complaint to a, resi a residence of Santa Rosa saying, city council, we don't like those in our neighborhood. Do we have any authority to do anything whatsoever on a utility pool that's pictured there? 
Yeah, that, that's an excellent point, and, and we will cover it in depth in further slides. Um, one of the challenges has been on the aesthetic front, how can we control that? So as it stands currently, the city doesn't have a policy that governs the aesthetics. Other agencies are a bit more involved in that, and they have attempted to control that. Um, I will cite San Francisco as an example. They look at how do they physically look from one's living room on the pole? How do they look in historic areas? Do they impact view corridors? So there's potentially mechanisms that we can look at um, as it's currently standing now with these deployments, and I, I do want to stress this, is we have Verizon and AT&T at the, at the table right now, and they're looking at deploying. Um, it, it's, it attempted a very collaborative approach to understand the community's concerns and see what we can do to control those. And that isn't just the, the metal pole. We've had conversations about the joint pole, how we can reduce cabinet size, what can we do to push it closer, what can we do to spread it out, to, to have those little aesthetic features to it that make it look better. Um, that's that's a good start, and I think what we'll talk about in future slides is how do we let that evolve into something that can solve the problems in the residential areas, and I think what will what'll be pretty clear out of the study session is there's still concerns in those communities, and that's what we want to be sensitive to. So looking at what's in our control, how can we let that evolve, and that will be the next phase of when we come back to council and, and look at, and unless some, some of the case studies play out and understand what's going to happen with the FCC and develop a comprehensive policy that addresses that. Great. Thank you. Okay, looks like those are all the questions for the first portion, slide 17. Okay, so the, the next series of the presentation is really going to look at the solutions that are mainly policy related that we uh, have in our control now and we will be looking at, at adopting in the future. So currently, what we wanna do is address the metal poles and we are proposing to move forward with a limited deployment in non-residential areas for the metal poles. And the benefit of that, there's a few. Um, one, it helps us guide our aesthetic requirements. Uh, we can get a better understanding of operation how this equipment will impact our ability to maintain that a pole. It takes some pressure off the joint poles um, and it gives more options of placement. So one of the important pieces that came to my attention from the community is when really get down to it, a lot of times they say that's just not the appropriate location for that, but it happens to be the only pole that we can put these on. So what we're going to use that program for is to help guide that bigger policy that we come back to council. So as I mentioned, I would point out those pieces that we would move forward with, this is one of those. We would start working with the providers. It would require executing agreements. It would require notification to the residents well up front before we even gave any level of approval to understand what the concerns were. And as I mentioned, it will focus on commercial areas. So I'll have a slide that addresses those locations. Um, we also want to increase transparency in the process. So um, we learned a lot of lessons from the rebuild and that's the delivery of information and how important that is and how important it is to be transparent about the decisions that are made. Um, so we're we're looking at mapping portals, we're looking at providing RF analysis and getting into those individuals, we're looking at FAQs and guidance documents. So we want to bolster up our web presence to make it easier for people to get the information they're looking for to better understand what's happening. Um, one of the important pieces is we really want to align our code sections. So um, we have notification processes that are a little different in our zoning code than our right-of-way code. Um, we want to make sure once again that we are engaging the community early and often, understanding those concerns and we want to align those code sections. Uh, so between the Council policy between chapter 13 and chapter 20 of the code, we wanna bring forward a formal package that addresses some of these and benefits. Um, we also have a desire to improve emergency learning and I'll leave that to the slide. Uh, Paul Lowenthal from our fire department is here to present that slide and he'll talk about some of the benefits of that. Um, but it's really to develop solutions for aesthetic concerns, which we feel as if we can control, and it's giving some level of location flexibility, which gives us the ability to address some of those concerns that we're hearing. So that's some of the direction, and those will, this will cover some of the future slides. We'll go in a little more depth in some of these topics. So we have engaged the two providers to look at some locations that would be included in, in our limited deployment, and the slide we see now is the result of those conversations with Verizon. Uh, so typically when we say commercial areas or non-residential areas, that's a based on zoning classification. So it's defined by the zoning code. And then if we're right on the fringe of a commercial area, if it's directly adjacent to residential, we then look for a, a physical buffer, and that's usually 300 feet. So we'll take 300 feet, pushing it into a commercial zone. Um, where it gets a little challenging is because we have a lot of areas under transition. So we have mixed use, we have transit village, we have downtown, where potentially you could have residential in a zone that was historically commercial, 
but you usually have really good locations as far as the street configuration or the placement where it isn't directly adjacent to a residential unit. It's right in the middle of commercial. And the two examples you'll see that uh, kind of highlight that is we have one on Mendocino Avenue, which that's rightly right across from the JC. It's a good corridor from a street standpoint. People are used to seeing that type of equipment on those types of streets, but it's one block away, 200 feet from a residential area. So although that's a good location, what we've discussed is how we'll address the potential community concerns is we'll do a hefty level of outreach. And if we hear any concerns about it, we'll move forward with a different location because it's not right in the middle of the commercial area. Same holds true for downtown. So there is a location that we're looking at right next to the entrance to Prince Memorial. It's actually right across the street. Next to commercial, good buffer to residential, but close enough to where we would engage those individuals to see what sort of concerns they have with that. Um, one of the other benefits that I didn't touch on the other slide is a lot of what we'll see with these street lights or photo simulations, we wanna see what these really look like and work through that, and that, that'll help us control the aesthetics. Um, when we look at these other locations, they are clearly in commercial areas, Santa Rosa Avenue, Corby. Um, we have one location here that's identified as Cleveland, Cleveland Avenue, that's actually Maxwell Court. Once again, that's in a transition area, but that's fully in a commercial area right now. So those are the areas that we're identifying. When we look at AT&T, um, they actually have five, we're allowing up to six. And in this situation, they have one right in front of Cottingtown. Um, they're focusing more on that Corby Avenue, Wilgen Court, very much commercial. And they have a location in Verizon, had one as well on Stony Point Road. And that's right in front of city facilities on Stony Point Road. Um, we initially, with the providers, talked about that as a good location because it's close to the team that manages it. So they wanted to use that as a bit of a pilot to look at that site to understand how it was gonna work with the electrical components of the street light. So the next few slides just give us a rough idea of those locations we're looking for. So once again, no residential, it's close to commercial, it's really not close to where people are occupying buildings on commercial, it's well protected, that's exactly what we're looking for. So that is a photo simulation. Um, so that's roughly the size cabinets we would be looking at. There usually is ground equipment associated with these, but we think we have some solutions to get rid of the ground equipment altogether. Now that will come back into play if we start talking about backup batteries, and that, that's a decision. And this is one of those items that we'll clearly point out that we are looking for impact from the council on that. Um, and that will control the ground equipment. The next location is front of Cottingtown. It's very difficult to see because it's essentially hidden by that tree. Um, once again, not around any residential, fairly open major arterial roads. Those are the areas we're trying to identify. And this is the location in front of the Transportation and Public Works building on Stony Circle, the location that we wanted to use as the pilot. So once again, um, we're, we're really talking about solutions from a mapping standpoint. So the image we have to the right was the RC Resilient City recovery maps that we developed for the rebuild. And one of the tools and the, the concepts we used in this was pretty simple. It was essentially spatially people know where things are and they wanna click on them and get as much information as possible about that. So we've actually already started the development of a mapping function that will act in a similar fashion. Uh, so we'll highlight the cellular facilities, we'll give people information about where they are from a timeline standpoint, a permitting standpoint, and any associated documentation that they would wanna see. So that's the transparency aspect that we wanna bring in. Um, we also heard concerns about lack of notice. So we've been working with the providers on that to say that we not only need to notice on the poll, we basically need to see a listing of the properties that received the notice, and I also wanna see the feedback so we can talk through that. So we're giving confirmation of noticing through this mapping portal as well. Then um, we also talked about links to state and federal resources and requirements, and then as other agencies have developed, there's a comprehensive list of FAQs that we'll be developing as part of this process. Um, this is another one of those items that is happening now. We will work through this in the next coming months and hope to have a delivery in the next six months of a final product. We talked a little bit about code alignment and that is an important piece because if we start developing more stringent requirements from a, 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 an aesthetic value where it becomes more discretionary, um, we wanna make sure the code supports that. So as we work through this limited deployment, we're gonna look at various techniques that we can implement on these poles to make them look better and we're gonna wanna memorialize that in the code. Uh, so that'll be across the board and we want to treat basically macro sites to some extent in the same way we treat small cell sites because people have the same level of concern and there's community 
engagement and the community engagement is more robust in that level than it is in small cells. So we're trying to figure out once again how we can engage the community. That will be memorialized in that process. Um, so it's really when we get into noticing, it's developing consistent radius to make sure that we're not differing based on the small cell type. Um, we want to give get feedback prior to approving any site licenses agreements, not before construction prior to granting that overall approval when it's discretionary. Um, we also want to streamline and review and improve the process on both macro and small cell. Um, the more we can make this consistent, the easier it's going to be to meet shot clocks and requirements from the federal government on turnaround times. And really the big focus is on the public process on these. Um, I think the, the lessons we learned from the, the deployments prior to is we really need to do that better job of engaging the community. So I really can't stress that enough. So when we look at some of the solutions that we will implement, these are more how we get into some of the design criteria. So uh, a lot of agencies, I've, I've done quite a bit of research through the state of California and throughout the entire nation on small cells to see how aesthetics are really controlled. There are not too many agencies that specifically control the box that is placed on the cabinet. That is left up to the provider, so that's the physical equipment. They do place the location in the, or they do, excuse me, control the location and the size of that box. So typically when we see small smells, there's antenna uh, which are the devices to the top. And there's radios that communicate with those antennas, some level of powering to the device, and there's what's referred to as backhaul. So all these small cells connect to the bigger network in some way, shape, or form. And that might be a fiber optic cable that comes in, but there's some communication measure to, from the antennas to the radios going out to the network. And then what we've seen in the cabinet on the right is that battery backup has a tendency to have a larger cabinet. Um, there are options to look at going below ground with these. Uh, there are pros and cons to that approach. Uh, the cabinets, there are better locations in some situations for the cabinet. So we're looking at the appropriate location for that type of equipment and our design criteria could then specify when we're going to allow this when we're not. Um, so the equipment size and placement is pretty critical. That's what most agencies focus on. This expands on that a little bit. Um, so the image to the left was produced in the Press Democrat. That's our link lane location. And, and many of the residents in that area were not happy with that installation um, for a few different reasons. So what we did is we worked with the provider. And this is just an example of when you reduce some of the equipment, you control the impact visually of how it looks. And some people still may not agree that it looks well. So this is a step in the right direction. And it's simply just removing the large cabinets. And there are tricks such as painting the equipment to make sure it blends into the pole. That's pretty consistent through most agencies that control aesthetics. Now, when we look at the backup battery supply, uh, this location is actually on Montgomery Drive uh, near Channel Drive. Uh, there is residential on the opposite side of the street, but it backs up to this, so those are their backyards. Uh, we did reach out and we did not receive any negative comments on this. There were actually positive comments on this one. Um, and if we look at the placement of the cabinet, it is set back from the street, it is not in a planter strip, and it is behind the pole and there's a retaining wall. So if we looked at protecting the box, there are situations in which you can do that. It usually means pushing it back from the right of way. Um, the aesthetic aspect of the box is, is it directly in front of somebody's view out of the living room. And we can look at it along those lines to, to basically kind of govern where that goes. Once again, we will talk about those benefits in the future slide about that backup power, but this is more on the aesthetic front. Uh, this is uh, actually an image from San Francisco. Um, these are street lights, and they're very small devices that you can hide with signage. Um, so once again, on the aesthetics, there are signage measures or certain things you can do to screen the equipment that's placed on the pole. Uh, this is something that we want to entertain. Uh, these images were taken from the city of Fremont, and they have a utility box art program. And these aren't small cell boxes. These are likely boxes that are controlling traffic signal equipment. Um, if providers want to put these in, we have talked about how can they mitigate the visual aspect by placing art. And there's a few different ways to run that program. Um, we can keep it in-house, and we can require an in-lieu fee, and we can acquire an artist to develop a theme for boxes in certain areas, or we can create those themes and have the provider perform the art. So one of the pieces that we're going to roll up into the code update is this program and bring that back to council for a determination in the future. So we definitely want to look at this and we've even talked to the providers about working something out potentially through the limited release to see what that program would look like as a bit of a test case. 
So the other important point is location flexibility. So this is an image of a Hidden Valley neighborhood and we dealt with this community group on two different occasions. Uh, there was a proposed location in this neighborhood and they had concerns with it. And this is a Google Street View image and what you can see from this is the only pole out there is the wooden pole and the street light is actually on the wooden pole. That's actually the white circle there. Uh, so the only options the provider has is the wooden pole. They have a tendency to be a 20 foot setback give or take from the residential unit. So you can't really create a buffer from the home. And the placement is usually mid-block and intersection. So inevitably that wooden pole, when you look at it, falls in some front of someone's home. So we sat down with the provider. We looked at how it would work from a coverage standpoint to look at other locations. And in some situations, you can pick locations that do not have a pole but are better for the community. And we have a lot of areas of Santa Rosa that look just like this, much in the east, much in the older area. Link Lane's a prime example where the undergrounding hasn't quite commenced yet. So one of the pieces that we do want to look at, once again, will require a future council action, is the ability to erect a custom pole as a way to mitigate residential concerns. So if we meet with those groups and they all agree that there is a better location and that works for the provider, we don't necessarily want to limit that by the fact that we don't have a pole in that location that's potentially a solution. It will only be limited to that sort of occurrence. We typically don't want to add more poles. The desire is to pull those down. Um, so we definitely want to play around with that tactic and see if it's a, a reasonable solution to mitigate some of the residential concerns. And I believe that's where we wanted to take the next break. Uh, the next one, so most of those items were policy related. Um, and before we get into the emergency alerting and more of the fire related pieces. Yeah, thank you. Council, are there any questions over that portion of the presentation? Mr. Tippetts. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Gabe. Um, I appreciate it a lot. The, um, one, you know, one of my prevailing questions is, is on, on the one hand, I, I like that we're trying to take control of a situation that otherwise seems like we don't have any control over it. You know, one of the frustrating parts for me, and I'm sure it's shared on the council, is when we get calls from concerned neighbors or residents, uh, the best answer I have for them is, sorry, it's the CPUC's jurisdiction. Um, but one of my concerns is if, It's my understanding that these antennas or small cell towers require a patchwork of relatively tightly knit antennas to provide ultimately the coverage that these carriers are seeking. Um, if we are trying to do this piecemeal, how is that going to achieve in the long run for the carriers what they ultimately want to do? What I'm driving at is, is my fear is are we bridging a gap to the residential neighborhoods where the CPUC poles exist. That's an excellent point. Thank you for bringing that up. And I think that gets into the concept of what is the comprehensive deployment program. So when we sit down with a carrier, we don't necessarily just want to talk about what it's going to look like in a limited deployment in commercial areas, because you're absolutely right. Is that a way to basically move forward with that? And does that then put further pressure on the residential? What we want to do is figure out a solution for the residential. So the better understanding of that exact situation of Hidden Valley, if we have sites in which the provider needs to fill a coverage gap in those areas. How do we basically tackle that? So knowing where they're all going is really critical to the conversation because you have a better understanding of figuring out the ones that are easy, that people don't have as much concern with, and the ones that are more challenging in the residential areas. So I'm gonna ask the question a little bit more bluntly, but how do we ensure that? What recourse will we have over the CPUC polls, both aesthetically and from an encroachment perspective? And, and that's a difficult one, and I think that what we're going to have to have play out is some of the case law associated with that to better understand the aesthetic controls on that. So with the CPUC and the, the federal government with the FCC requirements on the emissions, where it becomes challenging, what I've seen from most agencies is they've managed to grab that control back through aesthetic controls. Mm -hmm. And the development of those aesthetic controls is really important. And from a timeline standpoint, the FCC order required that they be in place at a certain time and a lot of agencies jumped on that and a lot of agencies are also sitting on the fence a little bit to see how it plays out. So I think what's really important to control that is we have to understand legally what we can control, which may take time to figure out, and we have to get right into policy development to look at that. With that comprehensive discussion of the provider as well as the community to understand how to frame that policy. Um, but it is an excellent point and it is the challenge we've really struggled with over the last year is really understanding we know we have control over the metal poles, what really can we control on the joint poles which I believe is gonna take a little time to figure out exactly what that looks like. 
Okay, I appreciate that straightforward response and um, I'll hold my comments till later on that. Ms. Wexner? Thank you and um, appreciate all the community outreach and I look forward to, I'm gonna hold most of my questions and comments to give the public um, who took time out of their workday a chance to uh, comment on this. But I do have a, a couple of uh, preliminary questions. One is for the areas identified that the council and the planning commission have jointly made really clear that we wanna support residential development, uh, specifically Maxwell Court in downtown. Would we be setting a precedent where uh, where these, util if we go forward and, and, and later on decide that we're going to try something else and we have the authority to do so, would we be putting ourselves in a position of having given these utilities to go ahead and then have people who are hope, hopefully moving into these you know, transitional neighborhoods be in, in an area where there's mixed policy? Once again, sorry about that. Once again, an excellent point. And I think that really is the challenge in a mixed use area, especially one that's in a transition state such as downtown, such as Maxwell Court, is you would focus on that on commercial you would allow something like that under a limited deployment, and then all of a sudden, as we allow this to progress, we determine that that scenario has changed and it's become residential, and then from an aesthetic standpoint, there's more controls on that. So I think that that's similar to how policy in some situations progresses, that if we have rollouts and we determine from just the course of learning that it doesn't necessarily work, that we do have the position um, to basically change the aesthetic controls that would, would govern that in the future. And do you see this as any way interfering with the council goals of developing those two areas? So what we've seen from the small cell, it's, it's a very difficult conversation. Uh, once again, I, I kind of mentioned that we have a lot of individuals that use cell phones. Uh, we do receive a lot of public comment that is beneficial. So the most recent round of comments we received were all positive about individuals getting better connectivity. So people are using the phone for data, and when we get that input, we know that there that side that is interested in that. Of course, there's other residents that have those concerns. So it's been very difficult to balance this out. So at what point does it become a product that we know people living downtown would potentially want? Then it becomes a little challenging because then we're balancing out the other side of it. Yeah, it, it seems like you don't have a crystal ball right in front of you, and and that seems to be a problem. But I do appreciate you trying to opine on, on that question, which doesn't have a, a very clear answer, understandably. Uh, I'm wondering, last question before I, we move, I move on is, do we have any sort of mechanism to claw back, not just address aesthetically, but adjust the location w if it becomes a problem with any of these sites? We do when we have the license agreement. So for the streetlight poles, we control, it's a discretionary action. We can say yes or no to that. Um, and the, one of the, the tricky pieces was on the brown poles. And you get in certain areas where there are mostly streetlights because the undergrounding has commenced. And those are more recently developed areas or where undergrounding policies have come through and dropped those poles. And those areas, we're just going to have more control because those poles the city owns and we have a policy that governs how to do that. Uh, the challenge becomes in those areas where it's more predominantly the joint poles or there's a mix, how we balance it out in the absence of an aesthetic policy that can control it. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Sawyer? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm curious about the coverage. Is, are there any requirements that every uh, area of the city have the same coverage? I and mean, if, if, if the worst that happens is that we have a, uh, a gap in the coverage or the coverage in one, on one block is just less than it is on another block, is there any, if that's the, if that's the biggest result or the most negative result, um, which to my mind sounds not all that important actually, just because there's a gap in that coverage, is there a requirement that, they, that the coverage be consistent? So there's discussions about coverage gaps and how you actually determine that there is a coverage gap as justification for rolling those out. So we have no requirement locally to say certain coverage needs to be met in certain areas. That's on the provider to provide that product and the, the benefit to them of providing a better product is they're, they're satisfying their customer base. So that's definitely part of it. And, and there's a little bit now with data being an interesting piece because it's not as much of a coverage discussion in some situations with voice calls falling 
calling, it's all about data capacity. And at, at that point, if you start seeing more of a demand, then it gets more into that discussion than identifying these coverage gaps. So it's basically giving more capacity to the network than a coverage issue. Um, so that's the tricky part to balance out between the desires of the community for more data, as well as determining what these coverage gaps are, and as well as the provider having that ability to provide the product that their consumers want to some extent. So to answer your simple question is we don't necessarily control it. Uh, we can actually force the providers to justify where the coverage gap exists and have that brought into the conversation to get a better understanding. Um, that's very similar to our site analysis process we look at at macro sites. So how are you meeting your coverage demands in the most unobstructive process possible to make sure that they look at those sites and, and play that out, um, but there are no specific requirements on our end. I appreciate that, and just as a follow-up, does the community have a role in determining whether they are willing to accept a gap in coverage um, as opposed to having um, another antenna in their neighborhood? Well, and I think the way we want to look at it, and this is based just on experience, is that the community should. And I think it's the example that we looked at in our Hidden Valley area. So it isn't talking to one resident that has the pole in front of their house. It's talking to the overall community and the overall neighborhood to better understand how that works. And oftentimes when we get to that level of conversation, there is the desire to see additional coverage. They understand the benefit. It isn't always all about RF. It gets into aesthetics and placement. And I think that that's where you get into not only the engagement of the community at that level, but the flexibility to be able to address their concerns. Because I think in this situation, it's really important to get that feedback and be able to incorporate that in the process. Thank you. Okay, I think those are all the questions. Paul? Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, Paul Lowenthal, Assistant Fire Marshal with the Fire Department, uh, speaking specifically to the wireless emergency alert capabilities. Uh, in October 2017, obviously we're aware that our ability to provide situational awareness to fires developing around Santa Rosa was limited, as well as our ability to directly use uh, wireless emergency alert tools. Uh, since then, obviously a lot of changes have been have occurred that we've spoken with council directly about. Uh, one of those is our ability to monitor uh, fires developing around the city of Santa Rosa through the network of cameras, but a critical component of utilizing that early detection is also making sure that we're providing the emergency alerting to our community. Um, if you remember last year, we tested the emergency alerting capabilities here in Sonoma County and specifically in Santa Rosa. And one thing that became very clear to us was that when we work and operate in areas where we're trying to provide emergency alerting, the ability for the recipient to receive that emergency alert is dependent upon carriers as well as location of the cell sites. Um, we tested it specifically in Roseland. Um, we saw how it did not work, and but for us, that was actually good to know. Um, as we're working to uh, move forward and provide that early notification, early detection to our community, one of the things that we're working closely with to avoid what happened in October 2017 is target specific areas that we want to uh, get the emergency alert to. We refer to it as geotargeting. So one of the common concerns that comes up that I know we've talked about in the past is Oakmont. When we look at the need to evacuate someplace like Oakmont, one of the concerns is they think that we're going to evacuate all of it all at once. And that would typically not be our intention. We'd want to geotarget specific areas within our community, set the boundaries of where the evacuation needs to occur, and through um, our IPAWS system, our integrated um, emergency alerting system, we, we utilize um, a geotargeting system to area and map out specific areas that we want to evacuate so that we don't run into issues where evacuating more than we need to and having unintended consequences with that. Um, so we do benefit uh, from uh, additional uh, sites that allow us to add those sites into the areas that we're geotargeting to make sure that the people that need to receive the emergency information are actually getting the emergency information. Um, there's also discussions about the data uh, that can be used to support the emergency alerting and whether or not we'd able to put maps. So currently right now you see that when you use our emergency alerting, specifically wireless emergency alert, it's limited to text. Um, we've also now enhanced it to where you can add in the links, but there's talk about being able to actually integrate in maps uh, that would be beneficial uh, during a wildland fire. Um, in regards to the backup, um, one of the things that we have actually been asking because of uh, outages and or catastrophic 
uh, disasters that do cause long-term outages is the ability to get emergency information uh, to our community in those first several hours. So we're seeing a lot of the macro sites actually taking their backup power um, and extending it with the installation of uh, larger tanks to support their generators. Um, but we're also actually asking on the cell sites. Uh, currently, uh, we're seeing a lot of installations where they have uh, only an hour or a couple hours of battery backup, and we're looking at asking that they provide additional batteries uh, to make sure that we have a longer um, battery backup in place so that we can get critical information uh, to those that need it, especially in the first few hours of a disaster. Okay, and that actually brings us to the completion of the presentation. So we'll go over a little bit of the next step. So I'll bring all that together into one slide. And we really bucketed that into two categories. So we're, we're focusing on really that limited release on streetlight poles. That's the piece that we can move forward tomorrow or we would like to move forward tomorrow. And there's a few different steps in that. So what that would involve is we would be executing master license agreements with AT&T, is that, that'll bring the two providers to an equal playing field. Um, we will be executing site license agreements with going through the appropriate public noticing processes for those sites that we discussed. Um, those sites aren't written in stone. As I mentioned, if we start seeing public feedback from those transitional areas, we'll move those sites into more of commercial. Um, that's also an area where we can accept feedback from council on if, if those transitional areas are sensitive and we want to go to more commercial, we can definitely work with the provider on those sites. But the concept of moving forward six sites is what we want to move forward with this week and start that. Um, that's going to involve working collaboratively with the cell providers to improve that notification process, so we'll work those requirements in. Um, we do want to identify areas of potential battery backup. Once again, a good piece to get feedback on. Do Should we focus on these and make that a primary goal? Or or should we let aesthetics be the primary goal? So there are some locations where we can easily put them in, but it would be great to get some feedback on the direction. So we also are going to improve the educational mapping resources, um, and we are going to develop RF testing procedures. So that was discussed briefly in Mr. Hammett's presentation. We want to define really what that looks like, and part of it is requiring that RF analysis, and we can require the provider to provide it. We can hire a consultant, and the consultant can provide it with a cost recovery mechanism to it, or we can provide some peer review on the technical aspect of it, and then there's a frequency in which we can provide it. And like was mentioned in previous slides is that typically any change or modification to that equipment, we can basically have the RF analysis rerun to make sure that those are safe anytime it's touched as part of a permitting process. So we're going to look at that as well. Um, the second bucket are the bigger code changes. So it's really how do we want to get back to our council policy 300-04 and look at those deployments that are allowed into that. We are not moving forward with those until we go back to council. So this is where we get into the really hefty code upgrades uh, between chapter 13 and 20. Um, we want to look at our design criteria. We do want to look at ways of streamlining the process. Um, and it really is that core of developing the solutions for the residential area. And at that point, we'll come back to council for the more formal adoption, which brings forward more solutions that addresses some of those concerns. Now, if we highlight some of these particulars, um, most of what's in one is easy enough to move forward under current priorities. We've been working on most of those. Um, when we get into the utility box art program, that's going to take a little more time to develop. Um, and then doing the code adjustment, something of that nature, is usually a six-month to a 12-month process. Uh, what we're looking at now is a lot of agencies have moved forward with this, so we're not really reinventing the wheel. We're taking what's already worked out, and we're making it work for the city. Of Santa Rosa. So what we'll look forward with this is there's some level of cost recovery model. It does benefit the providers by moving forward um, to help assist with the cost associated with that. Um, but it will become a priority discussion. So we'll start shrinking the turnaround time, um, but the start date will have to be determined. Um, if there's concern about design criteria, there's certain pieces that we potentially could pull out of there and focus on in a more rapid fashion, if that's better in a deployment to start saying we need to jump on that. Uh, but these are the ones that take a significant amount of staff. Time. So I wanted to make sure we highlighted those. So at this point, that concludes the presentation. Um, what I encourage anyone to do that has concerns about this, that's my contact information. We are going to be engaging the community as we move forward with this, looking for different solutions. So I encourage people to reach out and come to the table with some ideas. So with that, I will actually slide back to this slide, which lists some of the details. Great. Thank you so much for the presentation, Gabe, and others. Um, so I think we'll first take a public comment here. So we have 
Oh, you have a question? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I did one, want to get a clarifying question um, before we hear from the public, because I think that it'll be interesting to hear what our residents do have to say. Is there a significant conflict between focusing on simultaneously on aesthetics and battery backup? I think the aesthetic, the battery backup should focus on the, the, the aesthetic discussion and the reason being is because there may be better ways to control that cabinet from a battery backup. So if we say our goal is to try to provide battery backup, if it ends up with that cabinet, can we put them underground? Is there ways to shrink that cabinet size? Can we place it on the pole in a different fashion that doesn't have the same impact? So it actually helps govern the aesthetic conversation because it lays it down as a foundation and in a direction we want to take it. Okay, and can you discuss um, the, the meaningful differences between um, the options for our testing procedures um, between the peer review, the city consultant, or applicant responsibility? So often they are a means to the same end and you have a private consultant run an RF analysis and you generate an RF analysis. So one of the requirements often with macro sites is to say you have an RF consultant, you submit that and then we review it. Um, oftentimes we don't necessarily have the technical expertise and it's presented by a licensed professional. So the benefit of having that individual as a consultant is you can work through and get a better understanding and you control the result of it a little more. Uh, so it isn't necessarily the applicant providing that. Uh, the peer review aspect would step in if you really do not have the technical expertise, you can have another licensed professional review the findings to make sure that the conclusions are correct. So the benefit of bringing it in house is we control the timing of when the RF is done more than we currently have now. So that would say once again that it's done with initial installation, there can be a theoretical that's done up front to understand what it would look like, testing when it's installed and then testing when it's modified and that's similar to what other agencies have done. Thank you, I look forward to hearing what the public has to say about those things. Okay, we are at that point, we wanna hear from the public. Uh, since we do have several cards here, just as a reminder, I'm gonna allow three minutes um, for all your comments. Um, please let's not respond to every comment. Um, the intended audience is the five of us here, so if you wanna wave with your support, that's fine, but please, let's keep the applauding, uh, verbally acknowledging something, let's keep that to ourselves so we can uh, hear everything that everyone's got to say. So first up is Paul Andre Schwabach, followed by Tom Laporta. Uh, my name is Paul Andre Shabrak. I'm a urban planner um, and a property owner in San Santa Rosa. And apart from the well-documented adverse health effects, one key issue facing the city council is whether it is more important to install wireless transmission facilities throughout the city, which will result in significantly reduced property values and thereby lowering the property tax revenues versus the doubtful benefits of increased uh, connectivity. Um, the research clearly indicates that over 90% of home buyers and renters are less interested in properties near wireless transmission facilities. Documentation of a price drop of up to 20% is found in multiple surveys and pu published articles, and I've got the, the references and the documents that I'm giving to you. Uh, the U.S. Department of Housing and Her Urban Development, which is HUD, considers wireless transmission facilities to be, quote, hazards and nuisances. HUD requires its certified appraisers to take the presence of nearby WTFs into consideration when determining the value of residential property. HUD also prohibits FHA from underwriting mortgages for homes that are within the engineered fall zones of wireless transmission facilities. Uh, the, the standard property sellers questionnaire, which realtors all over California use, uh, requires specifically list cell phones as one of the disclosures of problems in a property. Uh, and there's a, also uh, in your uh, packet, there's the National Institute of Science Law and Public Policy Survey, which was done in 2014, over a thousand people, found that the overwhelming majority of respondents, about 94%, reported that cell phone towers and antennas in a neighborhood or building would impact their interest in a property and the price that they would be willing to pay for it. And 79% said that under no circumstances would they ever purchase or rent a property within a few blocks of a cell tower or antenna. 
88% said that no, under, under no circumstances would they ever purchase or rent the property with a cell tower or a group of cell towers on a roof or on the side of a building. So these are, you know, what you're planning to do would actually result in an immense drop in the value of property as a result of the proliferation of wireless transmission facilities. One of the effects for your tax revenues would be it would go down. And property owners like myself would suffer a significant drop in our equity. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Laporta, followed by Jennifer Laporta. Hello, there we go. My name is Tom Laporta and I have a background as an RN and an electronics technician. Here's a simplified version of how data carrying radio frequency radiation, which includes microwave radiation, affects us all. This radiation creates chaos in our bodies. If you're healthy, you may not notice any immediate effects, but the radiation is adversely affecting you nonetheless, suppressing your melatonin, and interfering with whole body central nervous system function, reducing sperm quality and quantity, impairing cells from communicating properly, and causing inappropriate cell division. <clears throat> Constant exposure slowly chips away at our defenses. The main energy producers in our cells, the mitochondria, are like electricians who detach electrons from food and push them through our wiring. This is called the electron transport chain. The electrons complete a reaction resulting in the production of energy. However, RF radiation causes a work slowdown by those mitochondrial electricians. That's less energy for health and more opportunity for disease to take hold. Or if you're already sick, disease progresses. The scientific literature has been out there for decades informing us that our cells are thrown into chaos when exposed to man-made RF radiation via calcium channels. It's like a distracted hotel doorman who holds the door open too long and a crowd rushes in. Now you have to corral the people and get them back out the front door. No way to run a hotel or a cell. Over 10,000 studies indicate that RF radiation is not benign, no matter what the telecom interest industry purports. You can't see what you're not looking for, but we're all here today because we did look and we found that exposure to RF radiation is hazardous particularly when modulated and when its wavelengths match the very dimensions of our brain and other organs, producing maximal absorption and maximal consequences. In the face of all this evidence, why do some studies show no ill effects? If the cell is healthy, it can maintain a higher voltage, a more intact cell wall, and repair minor injuries from other environmental hazards. The cell may initially absorb RF radiation without acute adverse effects, but damage is still being done. What we don't see is hurting us. The evidence is clear, it's out there for the looking. Public officials need to use whatever tools they have to put the brakes on new wireless transmission facilities in the city. Let's not pay for faster download speeds with our health. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Laporta, followed by E. Orleans Coley. I attest and affirm that the following statements are true, accurate, and within my personal knowledge. The Telecommunications Act of 96 recognizes the actual environmental effects of radio frequency radiation, or RFR, from wireless telecommunication facilities, or WTFs. This act left regulation of the health effects entirely within state and local officials' authority obligating said officials to protect its residents from health effects with regard to the placement, construction, modification, and operation of WTFs. In plain reading, quote, no state or local government or instrumentality thereof may regulate the placement, construction, and modification of personal wireless service facilities on the basis of the environmental effects of radio frequency emissions to the extent that such facilities comply with the commission's regulations concerning such emissions, end quote. On 3-6-18, during this council meeting, as recorded on video on the city's website, City Attorney Sue Gallagher stated, quote, 
The FCC preempts any state or local involvement on issues of RF emissions. There is federal law statute. There are FCC regs and also case law I looked at. Dot, dot, dot went so far as to say if a local jurisdiction or a state made any decision that was even partially based on RF emissions, that decision would be set aside, even if there were good, valid, other grounds for the decision. So that's pretty strict, end quote. Clearly, the recent decisions with T-Mobile versus San Francisco and the NEPA decision earlier this year underline that this old view is incomplete. FCC is not the U.S. Congress and does not make laws. Congress's TCA does not preempt local authority over WTF operations, including emissions. Rather, when given the choice to preempt operations, Congress positively left all authority over operations entirely within state and local officials' hands. By making reports like this, the city attorney did not have this, did not have all this Ugh, recent law. It is necessary that you immediately stop all placement, construction, modification operations of new, recent, and applied for WTFs. Please write a letter to your wireless applicants that all of their applications are incomplete. The required environmental assessments or EISs must include negative health consequences and safety concerns as per, as per the 4419 California Supreme Court ruling in T-Mobile versus San Francisco. This will give Santa Rosa time to update its ordinance. Please, let's have reasonable setbacks of these towers to where people sleep, live, and heal. I have expressed no concern or any other non substantive matter, but I solely matters of fact and law. Accept your oath of office. Thank you. E. Orleans Coley, followed by Bill Cossett. Thank you. You actually pronounced my last name, Kurla, German. I represent an organization uh, that is nationally wide, and here in California, I'm the president of Eagle Forum of California. It's an organization that has always been very concerned about privacy rights and property rights. I have written two books that I'm going to give to you. One I wrote uh, back in 12, 2012, Just Say No to Big Brother's Smart Meter, and this one is Whoa Nelly, 5G Dangers and deception of powerful new wireless technology. I am very concerned because I believe that this data collection that is coming in on all of us is so pervasive. It's already pervasive with 4G, but with 5G it is going to be sped up so much more quickly. As you've already heard, that's one of the big things that they're using to push 5G, everyone wants faster data. They want to be able to download a movie in three seconds when it used to take 24 hours. But this data collection is really going to be the big oil. It's going to be bringing in so much money. That's what is really pushing 5G. That's what the big tech companies want. And some have estimated maybe $5 billion are going to be coming because of 5G. Well, in my book, I mention this quote, smart cities, that's what we all want to have our cities be, with 5G will be like an expounded electromagnetic microwave blanket above each city and county, permeating the airspace and providing seamless connectivity where people and things will exchange data instantaneously. This is what it's all about. It's called the Internet of Things. I have a whole chapter on it. And how can this happen? We, as well as all of these things, will have to be connected. They want to have things to things to things to people connected. How can that happen unless people also have chips? That's the ultimate goal and I have much information about that in my book. Tom Wheeler, who used to be the head of the FCC under Obama, said that this super fast data collection is what, is what 5G is all about. I urge you to please consider this and say no 
with any further implementing deployment of these small cell antennas. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Cossett, followed by Martin Miller. Uh, yes, hi, my name is Bill Cosset, and I'm a resident of the Neo Thomas area. We addressed the uh, council uh, uh, last May um, in regards to the residential placements of these uh, mini cell towers. Uh, but thanks for the time today to uh, address uh, the council. Um, my concern uh, is, again, the saturation that, uh, that these cell towers will provide. I'm glad to hear that the uh, licensed professionals now on board to uh, you know, uh, verify the use of these mini cell towers. Um, but I would really like to see them, if there's 31 in place now, to turn several of them on, use them under actual circumstances for several weeks, and make the measurements there, and then have the licensed professional check the results that he comes up with against what the manufacturer is saying will happen to see if we're perhaps oversaturating uh, these areas because there seems to be an awful lot of dots up on that map for, for uh, that just Verizon alone would like to install a mini cell tower. Uh, and if we're gonna have up to four providers, uh, if AT&T is coming on board now, and then there's two more major providers, uh, what's the situation uh, uh, with, with, that type of set, with that type of saturation? Are we going to be overcovered when we don't really need to be. So uh, that would be my suggestion. And also that I'm just a little concerned, uh, very concerned with the fact that we're using 1996 uh, standards, uh, you know, dial up modem era standards in 2019 for 5G um, and beyond. So uh, it's a, uh, I think that's a, a major concern from what I'm hearing uh, uh, so far today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Martin Miller, followed by Jennifer Starr. Hi, I attest and affirm the following statements are true, accurate, and within my personal knowledge. Um, my name is Martin Miller. I'm a licensed acupuncturist. I also happen to be a licensed health insurance broker. I live just over the border of Santa Rosa and spend a great deal of my time visiting and serving customers in this uh, Santa Rosa area. Uh, there's a growing body of research establishing a direct causal relationship between uh, cell tower frequency microwave transmissions with markedly increased occurrences of cancer in the population and living near to them. So you have on one hand the 1996 standards and you have on the other hand the experiential reality which I'll mention a few for you now. Here's a short sampling. Long-term exposure to microwave radiation provokes cancer growth, evidence from radars and mobile communication systems. This particular report, which I'll provide to you afterward, even a year of operation of a powerful base transmitting station for mobile communication reported, reportedly resulted in a dramatic increase of cancer incident among population living nearby, unquote. Uh, this next one is mortality by neoplasia and cell cellular telephone base stations. By that, they mean cell, uh, cell towers. This 10-year study on cell phone antennas by the Municipal Health Department of Belo Horizonte and several universities in Brazil found a clearly elevated relative risk of cancer mortality at the residential distance of 500 meters or less from cell phone transmission towers, end quote. The figure of 500 meters comes up several times in a number of these studies. This one, a Epidemiological evidence for health risk from mobile phone base stations stated eight of the 10 studies. Now these studies happened in uh, seven different countries, including France, Germany, Portugal, uh, and uh, Israel. Those are the ones that come to mind. Rep oh, and Poland. Reportedly increased prevalence of adverse neuro neurobehavioral symptom or cancer in the population living at distances less than 500 meters from base stations. What's interesting about this is none of the studies of these 10 studies reported exposure above accepted international guidelines suggesting that current guidelines may be inadequate in protecting the health of human populations. And of course, there was a large Ramazzini study in which lab animals were exposed to environmental uh, levels allowable, comparable to allowable limits from cell towers that found the rats developed increased cancers and this also confirmed the same results as the $25 million U.S. National Toxicology Program, 
which uh, was the gold standard of these studies that also found the same results. Uh, this last one I mentioned is increased incident of cancer near a cell phone transmitter station, a significant high rate of 300% among all residents living within 300 meters, and there was a 900% increase among women alone. I think I fit it in, thanks. Thank you. Jennifer Starr followed by Jane Hirsch. Hi there, I'm a resident um, in Sebastopol. I'm very interested in this topic and I'm just studying along the way. I have two, three children and um, I cat and I care about our health and happiness in our home. Um, one of the things that I'm learning just through looking at different articles and stuff is that data mining and selling data is m making more profit than oil. And um, <clears throat> So just the mere fact of looking outside of ourselves for information is already like a big dysfunction in our culture. Um, thinking about aesthetics and what things look like, um, I think our communities are gonna look pretty bad with more anxiety and depression and children with attention deficit disorder and all of the other ailments and illnesses that are connected to the um, radiation frequency that is gonna be coming out of these devices. <clears throat> um, I you know, wish and hope that we can all get humble and just be grateful for the internet that we do have and um, have some more patience with the downloading process. Um, I think our culture needs to slow down instead of speed up. Um, I was passed a letter that was written by a doctor, um, Gary Camarada, MD. Dear Mayor and Council, I'm writing both as a concerned citizen as well as a concerned public servant with regards to the proposed permitting of 100 close proximity microwave radiation antennas in Santa Rosa. I'm a family physician who works in our community health clinic system and have been in practice for now, now for over 25 years in Sonoma County. Wireless radiation has biologic effects, period. There, this is no longer a subject of debate when one looks at PubMed online library of all medical research and the peer reviewed literature on the topic. These effects are on all life forms, plants, animals, insects, microbes, in humans. <clears throat> we now have clear evidence of cancer with ca causality essentially established. Growing evidence links, growing evidence links wireless radiation to DNA damage, neuro psychiatric effects, cardiomyopathy, leading to congestive heart failure and diabetes, <clears throat> mellitus, leading to renal failure and need for dialysis. So 5G is not a conversation about whether these biologic effects exist, they clearly do, period. 5G is, conversa is conversation about unsustainable healthcare expenditures. Why do I say this? The data on the adverse effects of wireless radio frequencies has been accumulating for decades now. This with virtually no in industry or public health oversight of the develop developing technology. In essence, we have been sitting on the data in our public health of diabetes, mental health disorders, and suicide, as well as in Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And Jane Hirsch, followed by Kim Schroeder. Hi, I'm Jane Hirsch, a fairly long-term Santa Rosa resident. I am very opposed to this, mainly for health concerns as radio frequency has been proven to be injurious to all living organisms, not only birds and bees, but everybody in this room, we need to back off, consider what we're doing very carefully. We may worry that the state or the feds can overrule anything done in this room or decided, but we're, if we can take a stand for health, for our community, for life and the planet, I think we should do that, thank you. Thank you. Kim Schroeder, followed by Scott Compton. There you go. Okay. My name is Kim Schroeder. I'm a San Rosa native and resident. I attest and affirm that the following statements are true, accurate, and within my personal knowledge. Regarding slide 17 of the uh, San Rosa City presentation, and I've attached exhibit A, here are the solutions to protect Santa Rosa's health, safety, property, environment, and history from so-called small cells. Here and after wireless telecommunications facilities, or WTFs, an ordinance must include both city-owned light poles and PG&E utility poles. 
WTFs irradiate, block the landscape and skyscape, and disallow he healthy private living. As such, they cannot lawfully be placed within 1,500 feet of sensitive areas, including without limitation residential and school zones, senior centers, healthcare facilities, playgrounds, and parks. A detailed list of preferred or disfavored locations is included the, in the attached recommended revisions to San Rosa's telecommunications ordinance. Few examples include, all WTFs require a conditional use permit. Notify all property owners within 1,500 feet of the proposed installation within 14 days of public hearing. 1,500 foot setback from other small cell installations. Radio frequency data report requirement, ADA compliance requirement, general liability insurance in the amount of two to five million to protect the city of Santa Rosa, obtained, paid for, and maintained by the permittee. Per the last item, note that the reinsurance and insurance industries have refused to insure the wireless communications industry for 4G and 5G technology. When allowed in commercial or industrial zones, WTFs must comply with City Code 20.44 and their effective radiating power, ERP, must be limited by means of protective fuses to 0.04 watts. Such limit as allows carriers to provide more than adequate coverage, but not irradiate at maximum capacity. The protective fuses are of nominal cost and will earn the city considerable income from violations of this ERP limit. The Telecommunications Act of 1996, TCA, does not preempt local authorities from regulating the operations of WTFs. Indeed, it requires them to do so. Any refusal to, re to regulate, as city officials are obligated to do, and any misrepresentation, such as a false denial of the existence of authority, renders an official ultra vires. The best solution for any city is fiber to the premises, FTTP. Fiber optic cable is the most energy efficient, expedient, reliable, secure, safe, and democratic way to offer broadband service. With fiber, individual households can choose whether they want to run wireless in their homes via Wi-Fi or not. Santa Rosa would use the fiber optic cable that we're already paid for through our phone bills as a starting point, which the wireless industry uses free of charge. I've expressed no concern or any other stand of matter. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Scott Compton, followed by Alex Crone. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and uh, Council Members, thank you for having me. My name is Scott Compton. I'm actually, I drove down from Bend, Oregon to be here. Um, I've been working with the community up there because there's a cell phone tower going in at an elementary school right adjacent to the school. It's a 78 foot tower. So it's very low to the exposure to the children there. But um, I really wanted to kind of give everybody an overview of what I do and who I am. I run a company called Lifestyle Hygiene. I'm an electromagnetic specialist. I'm also a video game designer of the past two decades. And I'm a previous biologist at Stanford University. So I'd like to give you an, uh, kind of an overview of um, like the biological effects that everybody's talking about here and, and kind of put this in preface with the physics of what we had presented earlier today. So the biological effects, obviously we've heard the DNA effects, genotoxic effects, blood-brain barrier effects haven't been mentioned yet, learning behavioral memory effects, myelin sheath effects, that's your insulation around your neurons to protect your, protect your brain. That can be degraded over time with this, we are seeing in the scientific literature. Autophagic activity and neuron effects, inducing stress and anxiety effects. And a big one that Martin Paul talks about a lot is the calcium channel, the VGCC effects, voltage-gated calcium channels on the surface of our cell membranes. But the real question is, why, why aren't we seeing, why, why is there a discrepancy between what we're hearing, which is the intensity of the RF, and, and what else is going on with the light? But light itself, frequencies have different properties. And one of the properties that's never talked about here, and we won't hear industry talking about, is the polarization of the light. Polarization, sunlight comes down naturally, and it's, and it's non-polarized, meaning it just is chaotic all around. It doesn't have like a waveform actively to it. Um, we're not hearing a lot about the, the pulsed effects of the light, like even our artificial lighting is off of the 60 hertz grid and it's pulsing at us every moment. And that has biological effects. And the modulation, how, how the actual carrier waves are modulated on the light is also quite unique and different when, when you do it artificially. So when you look at these effects in the science, what we see is an increased biological activity of these artificial frequencies. So yes, ionizing radiation can cause damaging effects like from the sun, but you have to have your proper dose size to do it. Um, and non -ion there are non-ionizing effects, which I just talked about, which cause these biological effects. So my big question is why are we having somebody, a physicist, talking about 
what really a doctor or a biophysicist should be talking about on these on on this when we're talking about safety up on that board. And what previously mentioned, we also heard, we also saw in slide seven at the beginning of the presentation, it was actually going to the SEC law and on health effects, but really it's it's really defined back in 1996 as environmental effects, right? And RF has also classified, they use this as a blanket term, radio frequency, when you look at 300 megahertz and higher, higher frequencies, this is microwave radiation. So I just wanted to make sure this is all clear. Thank, Thank you, Scott. Alice Crone, followed by Catherine Dodd. I attest and affirm that the following statements are true, accurate, and within my personal knowledge. My name is Alex Krohn. I'm a licensed physical therapist, and I work and live in the city of Santa Rosa. I address herein slides prepared by city official Gabe Osborne. Slide three, exhibit A. The amendment council policy 300-04 was drafted and presented to city staff and council on February 14, 2017 by Eric McHenry and Verizon representative Miss Canada. The presumed exemption of so-called small cells here and after WTFs to our city code 20-44 is without merit. We have submitted evidence onto the public record that proves the same equipment and technology used for macro towers are being used for small cells. In addition, we have proof that the amendment to council policy 300-04 addenda for applications were not complete prior to the execution of the master's license agreement. Therefore, these two contracts, contracts are void ab initio. Slide 10, Exhibit B, the 2016 California Public Utilities Commission order was used throughout this entire process by city staff persons to advise city council falsely that it had no jurisdiction over the placement of WTFs on PG&E utility poles. City staff further used this document to advise city council not to adopt an ordinance to regulate the placement and thereby any other activity of WTFs on PG&E poles. These public officials were and still are ultra vires in, do in doing so. Slide 13, Exhibit C. This map is highly inaccurate, indicating falsely the only joint utility poles under contract, according to the information obtained from the city staff and their website, were for only 41 poles. This slide is showing 45 utility poles now. Such incompetency makes it unreasonable to expect the city to maintain an accurate, precise, detailed, and dynamic website portal, as is such proposed in slide 23. Slide 15, Exhibit D, Mr. Osborne falsely categorizes health as a mere concern. Despite established science, science pertaining to adverse health effects, which already occur in Santa Rosa and will increase with additional WTF irradiation of Santa Rosa homes, schools, workplaces, and other institutions. Such peer-reviewed science literature as we have voluminously submitted, is admissible under the Supreme Court Dobert rule and cannot be refused, ignored, or mischaracterized. The Communications Act of 1934, of which the Telecommunications Act of 1996 is an amendment, states that its very purpose to protect safety and property. Therefore, Health Safety Property Value Act notification and environmental impact are substantive and cannot lawfully be suppressed or dismissed out of hand as it has been done in this slide. I have expressed no concern or any other non-substantive matter, but solely matters of fact and law. I accept your oath of office. Thank you. Catherine Dodd, followed by Pat Bacallian. My name is Catherine Dodd. Good afternoon, Mayor and um, Schwendhelm, um, Vice Mayor Fleming and members, Sawyer, Olivares, and Tebbets. I live just outside the city borders in Wikiup, but I spend a lot of my time in the city proper as a local shopper, a library visitor, and caretaker of people with terminal illness who live in this beautiful city. I would like to start by saying thank you to you for the attention you paid to the well-being of our residents, uh, especially during the Tubbs fire and the Kincaid fire. I'll come back to that. I'm a registered nurse with a PhD in soci sociology with an emphasis in health policy. I've worked in the legislative and executive branch of government at the local and federal level for over 35 years. I greatly respect the commitment you bring to your position. In the 1980s, I, worked, I was working for a member of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors and a strange disease began to affect members of the gay community. It was the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, like many Perhaps here, I lost friends and colleagues. I thought that this would be the worst 
public health crisis I would experience in my lifetime. I was wrong. The health effects of wireless radio frequency radiation are an invisible threat growing in exposure to all of us every day. This is larger than lead, larger than asbestos, both of which we are still remediating. It's larger than pesticides like DDT, larger than smoking. All of these previous epidemics took seven to 10 years before the damage was detected. The standards you heard about <coughs> from Hammond and Edison have been disproved by countless articles of peer-reviewed science. You receive lots of factual science today and prior to this meeting by residents and by experts, much of which I would like to associate myself with those remarks. The FCC is a captured agency. It's made up of telecom executives. Their statements, in fact, disregard credible scientific evidence. They are the fox guarding the chicken house, and we are the chickens. I'm not gonna go into what's at risk. I'll hand you my um, testimony. 4G and 5G de densification of a, is an involuntary exposure. We are not volunteering to be exposed to this. People can't afford to move from their homes here to avoid being sickened by RFR, a serious constellation of symptoms recognized in the International Code of Diagnoses, or ICD-10. As our elected leaders, you must keep keep us safe and prevent major public health epidemic. I wanna add this last comment about RF emission checking, because that's what you're talking about. You need an independent staff person of the city to do unannounced random visits, and if they exceed two times in 12 months, they lose their permit. Thank you. Thank you. Pat Bacallian, followed by Gary Orr. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I am a resident of Santa Rosa, and I am here for my grandchildren and other young children who have no voice in their increasingly hazardous polluted environment. Wireless radio frequency radiation is a form of pollution and is becoming more of a threat to our children. The Environmental Health Trust says, children are not little adults, obvious. Uh, children's skull, skulls are thinner and tissues of a child's head, including the bone and marrow and the eye, absorb significantly more energy than those of an adult head. It is scientifically accepted that children are more vulnerable to biological effects of microwave exposure than adults. Children's stem cells are more affected by microwave radiation. No studies show that microwave radiation exposure is, in children is safe. In addition, the FCC guidelines, I believe, are inadequate. They are out of date. They, have been, they were set in 1996. Guidelines were based solely on preventing thermal effects like heating. No guidelines. The guidelines do not account for exposure of multiple sources and only consider 30 minutes of exposure from one device at a time. The guidelines do not consider research showing that current cell phones can produce hot spots in the brain. I have a um, handout that I'm gonna give you that shows that. Um, the guidelines were based on an adult male body, not children. Children's smaller bodies and brains are not considered in the metrics. The guidelines consider average exposure, not peak exposures. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that the United States government tighten wireless exposure limits and that the public reduce children's exposure to cell phones, phones and other devices that emanate radiation. The Academy also cautions cell phone that cell phone uh, that cell tower radiation is linked to headaches, sleep problems, and depression. I urge you to heed the advice of the experts. And um, I hope that you will join other cities in California around the U.S. in the pending court case against the FCC. Thank you for your consideration. Um, please think of the children while you're making your decisions. Thank you. Thank you. 
Gary Orr, followed by Janice Bradshaw. My name is Gary Orr. I'm a lifelong resident of Santa Rosa, and I'm in one of the areas where one of these poles is gonna be outfitted with, I suppose, the same small wireless uh, device, which has happened to be 20 feet off my bedroom and 35 feet from my neighbor's house. It's slated for the property next door to me, but it's right on the edge of my property and on my driveway are common neighbors in that regard, where the pole is. Uh, I assume that the city council has on the internet probably put out flyer or, you know, contact as far as when the meetings are gonna be in one thing or another. I don't know because I don't have internet. Uh, but what I would say is the the paper finally came out today and I was finally able to find out some information. I had another neighbor that called and had a hard time getting a hold of it. We finally did, he got a hold of me. Uh, but my concern is uh, I'm here because of my neighbors and, and some of them, most of them don't want to have this go in right where it's going. I mean, there's other places they could put it. Uh, I think the city council needs to find a way to combat some of these positions that uh, the internet companies are trying to push off on you. Uh, I guess the only way is probably to get a class action against PG&E and against Verizon. That's the only thing I can see that would do any good. I'm concerned for my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren I don't even want to have them come to my house if this thing goes in because I'm afraid it's going to bother them. And as for myself, I'm old enough that I guess it really doesn't matter at this point, but I think there should be some way of controlling the amount and the areas of where these things go. And I appreciate your listening to me today, and uh, I hope you carry on for the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you. Janice Bradshaw, followed by Moshe Shafru. Hello, thank you for your time. I attest and affirm that the following statements are true, accurate, and within my personal knowledge. My name is Janice Bradshaw. I'm a mother, grandmother, past elementary teacher, and resident of Santa Rosa. The polarized pulse modulated microwave radiation from wireless telecommunication facilities, WTFs, that the city wishes to allow without regulation would produce many harmful effects on the neurologic functioning of the people of Santa Rosa. It is well established in relevant peer-reviewed scientific studies that the highly Xenobiotic foreign to life type of radiation deployed by WTFs produces very serious adverse impacts on the neurological systems of humans and animals. The nervous system at the whole body level relies on precise electron flow to and from synapses as well as potential energy to function. The pulse modulated RF radiation that the WTFs deploy interferes with proper functioning of this delicate system. The addition of more WTFs emitting constant 24-7, 365 forever pulsed microwave radiation will lead to more neurologic problems, including without limitation demyelination of neurons, melatonin suppression, insomnia, fatigue, lack of productivity, learning and memory impairments, lowered IQ, attention deficit disorder, hyperactivity, early, early dementias, headache, anxiety, depression, violent behavior, and accelerated neurodegeneration. Let me be clear that by the physical nature of such microwave radiation action upon our delicate nervous system, every person is adversely affected. Our children are more affected than the adults. Since I am a mother and a grandmother, I'm very worried about our children and I was a past teacher. I also submit into the public record substantial evidence that is peer reviewed 
and as such, admissible under the Supreme Court Daubert rule, the evidence cannot lawfully be refused, ignored, or mischaracterized as mere concern. Indeed, I have expressed no concern or other non-substantive matter, but solely matters of fact and law. And I accept your oath of office. I am submitting to you, to each of you, my presentation along with, with links to studies. I ask that you please read the peer-reviewed studies yourself. Please read them yourself. Don't just rely on anybody else, what they're saying. And also, um, I have a whole bunch of Thank, Thank you, you. For your time. Moshe Shafrir, followed by Judith Monroy. Moshe Shafrir. I, I practice a licensed architect in the state of California. First is a question, a statement. We are the people, we own this building, and we own the voting machines. We are given only three minutes to talk here why the mercenary of the telecom industry give it unlimited time. And I am upset about it. What is missing here now, medical experts, researchers, independent researchers that tell you the dangers of these magnetic fields. In 1983, I attended a conference, a seminar, I was just a young beginning architect, about indoor pollution. We studied magnetic fields of 60 hertz from their home electricity and we learned how to make it safe for people. Today we're speaking of energies and fields millions of times folds and we're still d t talking about aesthetics like the man sitting in the middle of the room or engineer lying to us and telling us he's safe that he doesn't have a medical clue. In 1969, I served in the Israeli army. We used machines that omit electromagnetic signals to detect, detect motion, movement. The orders were to stand behind the machines when I turned off because of the toxic radiation. We were protected by our superiors. Looks like now no one is protected in this room. I feel constantly uncomfortable here because of the radiation here. Based on my experience, I never used Wi-Fi in my home, in my office. All hardwired and work well. 2015, I was hired by a company in Mill Valley. After being there for two weeks, I started being sick. Then I discovered that was a Wi-Fi router, the only wireless machine in the office. When I asked to turn it off, I was threatened to be fired. When I fireworked his comp, I was fired. Thou shall not bear false witness against the neighbor, Exodus 2013. The telecom company, industry publishes false statements, data, research, claiming that Wi-Fi and wireless are safe. They are not discredits independent researchers. And some of them are names that are telling us the truth because they do their own research. Dr. Dieter Klingharp, Dr. Sharon Goldberg, Dr. George Carlo, that were harassed and fired by them, Dr. Deborah Davis, and Dr. Martin Paul. The scientific fraud is larger than tobacco, mercury, chloride, and everything. Thank, Thank you, sir. Judith Monroy, followed by Tom Sawyer. Good afternoon. I have prayed to a higher power that you will hear us today. Look how many have come. In the middle of the week, in the afternoon, we have jobs, we have children to pick up, and yet these people are calling out to you as guardians of our well-being, of the quality of life in Santa Rosa. That's where you were brought here, not to represent the people at this table. I can tell you personally, I sat there biting my tongue listening to lie after lie after lie. I will tell you what really goes on and what happened to me. 
I bought a house at 721 Link Lane. And one morning, very early, between Christmas and New Year's, I heard a lot of noise going on outside. For several days, over a week from uh, Christmas through the New Year period, when city offices were closed and it was hard to get a hold of people, I saw these crews come in. They were in trucks that did not signify who was involved. There were blank trucks, Penske, um, rented trucks, anything but equipment that would not identify what was really going on and who sent these people. They started digging 20 feet from my living room, my favorite chair, which to me had been a sanctuary where I could sit and read in supposed safety. They went and filled a PG&E pole with all this ugly equipment and then they sunk at least a five by four foot, maybe larger of, of this uh, collection electric box and they stuck it in there. And when I went to them and I said, I live here, what's going on? They would not respond. And I had to knock on the doors all over these buildings to finally narrow down about this electrical wiring that was going to go in 20 feet from me. I protested. I finally was heard. The electric box was left, but all the equipment on the PG&E pole was left. They did not, I'm telling you, may, it was a fraud of going out to inform the community. Not one person in that neighborhood, except my next door neighbor. <laughs> Thank you, Judith. There's the lies. There's Ms. Rip. Tom Tom Sawyer, followed by Brian Powell. Hello. <laughs> there we go. My name is Tom Sawyer. I'm an electrical engineer and a lifetime member of IEEE. Um, I hope we can keep these away from schools and residential neighborhoods. Uh, one thing we haven't talked a lot about tonight is exposure time. Like if they're on signals, and you have people passing underneath them, they're very low exposure time for the most part. If they're in front of a resident, that's 24-7. Um, also, I'd like to point out that the FCC testing that was done in 1996, that was done, that was not done with pulse code modulation in mind, and that's, that's what we have today. And so a lot of energy can be put into a single spike over a given amount of time, and you can come up with the same amount of power, although that spike could have un, uh, consequences uh, that hasn't been included in that testing, although I think a lot of other institutions and uh, academic studies have shown that. Uh, that there is an issue there. Um, also, you know, occupational RF, there's, there's, uh, there's time limits on that. So I know that wasn't brought out today. And I also would like to point out that Mr. Hammond, who I know, uh, is uh, also a consultant to Verizon. So just thought I'd throw that out there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brian Powell, followed by Martha Glazer. So there's only a few things that can make people sick. Poor mental state, poor nutrition, and poor environment. We can give an individual the best food on the planet and teach them to vibrate and think better than anyone around, but if you stick them in a microwave and spray them with pesticide, they'll get sick anyway. We need to stop this madness. This equipment was designed in the past for a specific reason. It's still the reason why it's being used. This isn't my knowledge. This is what's, you go ahead and read back in history what this, stuff was used for. This is a weapon and we're under attack. My son's 12 years old and he won't see his future if we don't stand up and stop this madness. The individuals you see here are part of the problem. 
We need to come together and stop coming into these meetings and complaining about it with each other. We need to stand up and fight. We need to get every man and every woman that can stand and fight and get our town back and our country back. We've lost control. We've lost control of what's important, and it's time to get it back. It has nothing to do with cell phone towers. These devices have been making people sick since they put them in my neighborhood in the early 80s. I have so much information about what's been taking place. My family's been here for over 100 years. We didn't have this mess until we started putting these. We lost the bees, the butterflies, and they started saying, oh, the oak tree, sudden death oak. No, it's the same thing. All living things are affected by radiation. It's destroying everything at a cellular level. It makes you weak. It doesn't give you cancer. It makes you susceptible to any and everything. The young and the old and the compromised are the most susceptible. This is madness. We're under attack. These people are attacking us. They're allowing people to destroy our future, and we're standing and allowing it to happen. Enough of this madness. Time to stand up and stop this. Get all the people that you know around and stand up and take these goddamn things down. Stop the government destroying our sons, our children's future. We have no shot. If we don't stand up soon, we're going to be destroyed. These are weapons. This is what they were made for, and this is what they're being used for. It's never been any different. Go ahead and do your research, read in history. Go back to the Cold War, understand what you're talking about in here. Understand what it's been doing, understand the effects. You apparently don't, because no one on city council, we need to start learning to elect individuals that have qualifications, because we keep electing individuals to council that are qualified to govern our safety of our communities, because they don't know anything about what's going on. It's time for change. This is, this is who has nothing to do with cell phone towers. It's time to get our country back and start here with our community. We need to do this now. We have no time to waste. If we don't stand up soon, there's going to be no hope for our children's future. All right, thank you. Martha Glazier, followed by Deborah Gambrell. Heston affirmed that the following statements are true, accurate, and within my personal knowledge, my name is Martha Glazer. I am the mother of two teens at Quest Forward High School in Santa Rosa, a homeowner, landlord, and an adjunct instructor in the college skills department pool at the Santa Rosa Junior College. My family lived in California for generations, and for over 30 years, we've been in Santa Rosa. My parents were instrumental in creating a cultural community center, the Glazer Center. Barbara and Jules lived out a happy retirement in Santa Rosa for their last years and died and are buried here. Community is an important value in my family. I'm here today because I want to be able to continue to contribute to this community. Although speaking out now about my experience with electromagnetic sensitivity is very hard to do, this is my contribution to our community at this time. I am not alone with this condition. EMS is a common problem, one with an official medical code, ICD, 10 CM code W98XXA, also called exposure to other non-ionizing radiation initial encounter. Right now and for the last few hours, I can perceive the radio frequency microwave radiation herein. It's already been, it's been hard to be in here. I already live in a world that forces me to carry a radio frequency radiation meteor around to make sure I live in a safe place. I'm in a safe place to spend any significant amount of time in. The effect of my being in an environment like this for more than a few minutes makes me very unsettled with a fight or flight feeling like I'm in danger. This is the sound of the microwave radiation I perceive and react to. We're all in this right now. With prolonged exposure, I will more specifically feel head pain and ear, temple, and jaw pressure and will begin to feel anxiety and difficulty remembering what I'm trying to say, will struggle to follow my own train of thoughts, get words wrong and forget simple words, get dizzy, lose my balance, get nosebleeds. I'll feel heart palpitations and exhaustion in a microwave radiation ambient environment. I suffer with deep fatigue for which sleep does not revive me. What has convinced me that my symptoms are induced by RF microwave radiation is that when I am away from antennas and towers, spend time in homes with no cell towers or antennas nearby, use corded landlines, ethernet wired, high speed internet, no smart meters, no smart devices, no streaming routers. I feel no symptoms at all. All I need to be healthy is simply to be away from such radiation. Simple, or is it? It's getting harder and harder to be away from antennas and wireless devices. The saturation of highly unnatural radiation that the telecom industry is trying to force upon communities makes it impossible to just stay away from wireless devices and enjoy the quiet of our homes and streets. It breaks my heart to think that I won't be able to continue as part of this community. Uh, antennas and radiation pull pushing community members out are destructive of community. It's unhealthy for all to put profits over community values. I know that 
Santa Rosa will no longer be habitable by me with 112 more cell phone towers here, even with 10 more. What's already here is already devastating to my health, and others feel this too, as more people observe the impact of the radiation on their own bodies and those of their loved ones. Under the Telecom Act, you have the power to stop these companies, you from pushing through their agenda and chasing away many solid, rooted, community-minded people. You can avert harm, you, for those who remain. We have just learned this morning you're, you're going to get support. 100 mayors in Italy have just declared a moratorium on five. <laughs> many people in our community are now affecting the experience and the effects of these. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, Deborah Gombro, followed by Desayana Ianovi. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Deborah Gambrell. I am not a technology expert. Rather, I'm a triple board certified physician, and one of my roles is as a pediatric developmental specialist. One of the things I do is I go into classrooms and evaluate the development of our children as they are transitioning from kindergarten to first grade. And what I've seen, this is based on my experience, in my clinical experience, what I see is when we turn on these RF emitting devices with the smart fans and all the smart technology that we have in our classrooms, the children's behaviors change. Their ability to concentrate changes. Their perception of abdominal pain changes. Their complaint of headache changes. Their ability to move in their body changes. Now, I was an intern when the whole Merck Vioxx scandal came out, when I saw patients that came into the emergency room dying after being on Vioxx of heart attacks, and I was told by my attending, don't believe what you see. The Vioxx rep is here telling us this is impossible. What I teach in my facilities is to trust what you see. Trust what's happening in front of you. And what I see with these children developmentally is they are affected. I don't care what the research says. I see what's happening. Like I said, I'm a triple board certified physician. I'm not just falling to some fad. This is what I see clinically and it's significant. So I think despite what all the research says, I think we need to ask, what are we seeing? What's the truth out there? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Tassiana followed by Katia Miller. It's Daciana Yanku. I am an internal medicine physician and I'm also a resident of Santa Rosa. And I just want to add that I agree with everything Dr. Gambrell said and I have also seen that in my practice, especially with the children. Um, so today I attest and affirm that the following statements are true, accurate, and within my personal knowledge. The pulse-modulated microwave radiation from wireless telecommunications facilities is hazardous. It causes DNA damage to the mitochondria, the energy generators inside the cells. It also damages the membrane of red blood cells. When cells are removed from this RF radiation exposure after a limited amount of time, they can still recover. However, their DNA damage does not recover, and this gets passed on to our children. When cells are constantly exposed to microwave radiation, they're not able to recover. Studies have shown that one microwatt per square centimeter of radiation can cause decreased sperm viability. 2.5 microwatts can affect the calcium metabolism in the heart muscle. Six microwatts can cause DNA damage. Exposure produces cumulative effects over time. Current radiation exposures within cities without 5G have, can reach around 5,000 microwatts per square centimeter. 5G is expected to deploy concentrated, focused, and constant radiation in excess of 100 times the current levels. The cells most affected are those with rapid replication, like sperms, ova, and cells of, fetus, and cells of children, young children, and fetuses. This causes problems with infertility, birth defects, memory problems, learning disability, cancers. Adults can be affected as well, especially those with weaker constitutions and more stress. They can develop short-term neurologic and cardiac conditions, and in the longer term, chronic illnesses such as autoimmune disorders, cancer, memory problems, fatigue. 
The harmful effects of RF radiation have been documented by over 10,000 studies over the last century. Bioinitiative 2012, which is now updated, is a review put together by 29 scientists from multiple countries about the harmful effects of RF radiation on human health. The global fertility rate has decreased 3% just in the last year, and much of this is due to male infertility. Many studies have shown that sperm exposed to RF radiation loses its viability. Girls exposed to RF radiation while in utero can develop damaged DNA. When they become pregnant, this damaged DNA can cause birth defects in their offspring, including infertility in their female children. However, we will not know this for another generation. And these repercussions... Thank you, Doctor. Katya Miller, followed by Max Krohn. I'd like to thank you for having this study session. I attest and affirm that the following statements are true, accurate, and within my personal knowledge. My name is Katya Miller, and I'm a mother, a grandmother. I'm a resident of Oakmont, a co-founder of an organization called Sonoma County for Responsible Technology. I'm a researcher, author, with a fellowship at the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C. Our group submitted packets to you last week to the council members from our national organization called Americans for Responsible Technology, including this brochure, Wireless Radiation and Undeniable Risk to Human Health, which I hope you have a chance to read. And I'm gonna include um, a few extra for Gabe uh, Osborne, because I don't think I did that. Um, the current wireless telecommunication facilities, WTFs, misleadingly called small cells already, which are already undermining the cardiac function of people in Santa Rosa, and if not removed, will continue to do so. Research shows increases in heart rate, arrhythmias, dizziness, increase in blood pressure, and other disturbances in cardiovascular functioning following exposure to wireless radiation. Several studies reported changes in EEG after prolonged repeated exposure to radiofrequency radiation such as the WTCs deploy. And immediate and short-term effects were also common. The people of Santa Rosa are experiencing and will continue to experience increased autonomic nervous system sympathetic activity and decreased parasympathetic activity in response to WTF's highly unnatural pulsed modulation microwave radiation. Diminished health and productivity of Santa Rosans will result, leading to increased health care expenditures and early death. I submit herein onto the public record substantial evidence in the form of relevant peer-reviewed scientific studies which are admissible under Supreme Court Dobert rule. I have expressed no concern or any non-substantive matter, but solely matters of fact and law, and I accept your oath of office. Thank you. Thank you. Max Grone, followed by Deborah Tavares. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I attest and affirm that the following statements are true, accurate, and within my personal knowledge. My name is Maxwell Crone, and I live in the city of Santa Rosa. Consistent evidence from epidemiology, in vivo toxicology, and in vitro laboratory studies show that RF microwave radiation exposure is respectively associated with and causal to produce reduced sperm count, motility, and concentration as well as DNA damage in altered cell structures. Research also shows damage after wireless exposure to the ovaries of rats and mice, as well as to the eggs in, of flies and birds, uh, and overall degradation of fertility capacity over just a few generations. Decades of such studies have produced an enormous volume of data con con uh, constituting proof of harm to humans 
animals and plants, particular, particularly radiation, uh, where ra radiation is modulated for data carriage. Uh, and I have a packet here to submit to public records here um, that shows some of these studies. Uh, and I have expressed no concern or any other substantive matter, uh, but solely matters of fact and law. Uh, I accept your oath of office. Thank you. Thanks. Deborah Tavares, followed by Mark Sullivan. Deborah Tavares, and I run the website stopthecrime.net. I am a researcher, a journalist, an investigative reporter, and I'm on radio shows all over the world. On stopthecrime.net, we have much information about this 5G apocalypse, and that's what this is. This is a silent weapons system of death. Make no mistake, this is a genocide plan. We know that. We know that. We look at the Deagle.com website and we understand the percentage of reduction of population by 2025 in the United States. But I shan't, shan't digress because certainly we all must understand this is an illusion of public input right now. This is a corporation. Santa Rosa is a corporation. They are in lockstep with all of the executive orders that run this country, including the executive order on January 18th of 2018 requiring the expeditious rollout of broadband AK 5G throughout this country over Indian tribal lands to every corner of this country everywhere, everywhere. Also, the executive order of the expeditious rollout of AI. This is where we are heading, massive data collection and a digital reality. This is what this foundation is all about. We are heading towards a digital everything, the internet of things. Let's get now to the battery backups of the, um, of the grid. Battery backups are run on lithium ion batteries. They explode, they degrade rapidly, and they are like shrapnel. Did you know that? These are going to be our backup batteries throughout this city, everywhere actually. Solar as well, which is a weapon. But it's most important to understand that this is an illusion of representation because we are a corporate structure. The United States is a corporate network of agencies run by the United Nations, the international bankers, and the IMF. This is a silent weapons attack. And there is a document that all of you should read, if you haven't, called Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars. Have any of you heard about the smart nodes being deployed in Lancaster, California right now? If you haven't, you should. It's on the street lights. It's gonna come here, too. It is creating the internet of things where you walk out and you say Uber and it arrives without a cell phone in your hand. That's where we are going rapidly. Thank you, Mark Sullivan, followed by Peter Chernoff. Can you hear me now? Just kidding, just kidding. I'm a, I'm a second generation native Santa Rosan, Mark Austin Sullivan. Thank you, City Council and all of uh, all the members of the city itself for uh, pulling this together today. And everyone in uh, the audience here, give yourself uh, a, a high five for uh, feeling your your potential and being here. Don't ever forget, you got it. The 1996 was uh, mentioned as the uh, testing standards for uh, telecom industry is using which is uh, not good on the face of it, but uh, also the uh, uh, flawed aspect of that is they're using a thermal rating, much like your microwave is, is high temperature. Most of the uh, electronic communication isn't, doesn't get that high as far as thermal. So it's a deceiving number when they call it safe. The human body is basically a biologic, uh, a bioelectric uh, component, uh, uh, a biological thing. Every every living thing is. So the the uh, the uh, 
exposure to any, any radiation at all is definitely gonna have an effect. Babies especially, because they, their cell division happens so fast, that's why they grow fast. And if there's any uh, disruption of the uh, DNA or, or the my mitochondria, the, uh, the cells early on, that progresses very rapidly and can turn into who knows so many different uh, aspects of ill health for the children. Human technology um, is, is advanced really well, as we all know, but we tend to be um, not used too much wisdom when, when it gets going. And we look, but there's a lot of instances we can look back on now and say, we're, well, why didn't we see that coming? So it's a uh, precautionary principle now that glad to see the city's moving forward slowly. The, uh, the other aspect of uh, the uh, telecom industry, they have no um, insurance against lawsuits for uh, um, damage. So that in, in this position, the city might be opening itself up to tremendous lawsuits that will affect all of us down the road as we witness by the amount of damage we've uh, that is evident from this um, technology. So go forth and do well. Thank you. Peter Chernoff followed by Noah Davidson. I am Peter, I am here speaking truth, the power free of all fear. Deborah Tavares, StopTheCrime.net, it's worth looking at, she's telling the truth. And the young man that was in this spot earlier who said to, to take our country back was absolutely right, but the question is how do we do that? Well, first you gotta understand this. We're under martial law since the 1947 National Security Act, which basically says you all are slaves. And this guy down here, he's not asking them to do this, he's telling them to do this. He's like a, the head of a pedophile organization that comes to town that's gonna rape all your kids, but he's gonna ask them nicely to do it first. They do not have the power that you think they have, which is why I am commanding you to general strike this system into submission, starting now with a total economic strike. I tie prophecies together. Black Elk, prophecy of the power of the wind, when it's returned back to the people, will be in the midst of the greatest of changes. Ties into Ephesians, we fight not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and principalities of the air. That's what you're looking at. I trust a former Sheriff Watson from Alameda, who was an expert and brilliant and having authored a book on the very radionics and frequencies verifying that this technology is military application and it also has the ability to go to lethal force. And before this sheriff uh, uh, became a sheriff, he created the first radio dispatch technology for law enforcement. This was in the 1930s. His son put up all the 19 major radio towers on the mountaintops of California afterwards. I think he knew a little bit more than what we're being told. This military tech is an initial step to additional upgrades with satellite interfaces, all brought to you by the military industrial complex with the United Nations, Agenda 21, FEMA, and their cohorts, which rule over them. So how do we fight this? Well, you see the firefighters and the police department, they're kind of like in the middle of a satanic riddle and the answer is with us. So we shut down, by prophecy, the 40-day strike, shut down the entire West Coast for 40 days and 40 nights, and the U.S. Constitution is for the first time ever released out of the prison cell of Leonard Peltier, who's been down 44 years, now the whole world walks a true trial of tears, and the law enforcement works for us first time ever, and this kind of shit goes away immediately, and so, I am here speaking truth to power of fear. I am commanding you to join this strike. No labor, no schools, no longer they're fools. You're all off the fence, no mortgages, no rents, and get ready to put a party together to welcome home some of our most well-known political prisoners that have been in, that are known And that's Leonard Peltier. Noah, Noah Davidson, followed by Cheryl Healer. 
I attest and affirm that the following statements are true, accurate, and within my personal knowledge. I will also be providing you with an email to add to the public record documenting what I have stated today. My name is Noah Davidson. I live in Sacramento, California, one of the first 5G test cities in the world. In late December 2018, Verizon installed an omnidirectional 4G small cell antenna just 45 feet from my family's home at roughly the same height as our second story. 4G small cells form the backbone of the 5G infrastructure with multiple millimeter wave antennas installed around the 4G antennas. This is the same infrastructure that Verizon is trying to build in Santa Rosa. Shortly after the antenna was installed, my nieces began experiencing health problems, including immune system suppression manifested as persistent cold and flu symptoms, in addition to sleep disturbances, headaches, and chronic fatigue. These symptoms have since been documented by a practicing physician and attributed to the antenna outside our home. Our family also hired a local certified electromagnetic radiation specialist to take measurements in and around our home. He measured exposure as high as 460,000 microwatts per square meter, or 4.6% of the FCC limit inside my niece's bedroom. While this may sound low compared to the limit, it is actually hundreds of times higher than typical exposure from cell antennas, which the FCC defines as, quote, thousands of times below safety limits. This is the main problem with small cell technology. Although the antennas are slightly lower wattage, because they are being installed so much closer to the ground and so much closer to people's homes, exposure from small cells can be much higher than exposure from previous generation antennas. This is confirmed by a pilot study conducted by the city of Sacramento in which they hired Hammett and Edison to take measurements of 28 small cell antennas that have been installed in my small neighborhood. Greater exposure levels means greater threat to public health, period. There is no debate. In 2011, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, or IARC, part of the World Health Organization, labeled RF radiation as a possible carcinogen. Just this year, IARC has, has decided to reevaluate RF radiation based on research that has been conducted since 2011, and they have designated this action as a high priority. This is one of the world's leading authorities on health saying very clearly that RF radiation is potentially carcinogenic and needs to be reevaluated. The only parties saying RF radiation is definitely safe are the telecom industry, the FCC, that is in the pocket of the telecom industry, and engineering firms like Hammett and Edison, who is not a health organization. As the elected representatives of Santa Rosa, you have a sworn duty to protect the health, property, and rights of hey, you know, Cheryl Healer, followed by Harry Lehman. Is Cheryl here? Cheryl Healer? Nope. Okay, let's go with Harry Lehman, followed by Ian Wilker Wilkerson. I want to first engage, as others did earlier, in thanking you. I particularly want to address Mr. Tibbetts. Mr. Tibbetts was asking uh, questions earlier about frequencies, penetration levels between different wavelengths and frequencies. I have uh, submitted to you today, which has been submitted to you by email, um, a paper which I think you'll find, people talk about telling the truth here, I'll tell you that everything that's been said in this paper is well documented, well sourced, and easy to read and explanatory. So if you wanted one place that you could find out whether it was the truth or not by looking at it, the paper I put into you today, in addition to my own work, attaches the work of Dr. Gulum and thereby integrates approximately 370 peer-reviewed studies on this. She is a professor of medicine at the University of California School of Medicine, San Diego. Uh, points that I wanted to make on this, which are ones that I made recently also in Napa. First, there's an imper impermissible, and I say this to you particularly, sir, with great respect. I, I think you're a, secure, a, a sincere man, the, the assistant uh, uh, administrator down there that was speaking earlier. I think he's sincere. But you know, a lot of people were sincere believing in Vietnam. And a lot of people were sincere in believing in invading Iraq, for example, for just a couple of the things that we've gotten on the bandwagon for when we really weren't ready for them. This is one of them. One of the reasons is the whole theoretical basis 
for putting these small cells up close together is because the short wavelengths require that. But instead, they're putting 4G in, which penetrates much more deeply. This is very dangerous. It's a very dangerous thing to have 4G penetrating like that. That is discussed here. Of all the things that you could read, please read, and it's mentioned in here, it's sourced in here, you can find it electronically, The Nation magazine, How Big Wireless Convinced Us That Cell Phones Are Safe, which shows that Dr. Carlos' epidemiological studies in the late 90s showed the carcinogenic characteristics of this wavelength, these wavelengths collectively, which of course, by the way, here's the core point. Talking about Mr. Hammond, and I'll be happy to debate with Mr. Hammond anytime. The reality is, his entire dialogue, and that entire dialogue is based on a false premise, and that is that the thermal standard is the one that matters. How do we know that that's false? Because the National Institutes of Health, National Toxicology Program, on May 27, 2016, on March 18, 2018, and in its final report on November 2, 2018, stated that the mechanism of the cancer causation, specifically the formation of glioma cells, was non-ionic. It is occurring as a result of vibration, and in physics we call this acoustic. So I wish I had more time, but I promise everyone in this room, because this is now a public record, that the things that have been said here are well-researched and thorough, and I beg you to please do the job that you've been begged upon here by all of us to do, which is really please look at the science. Please stop this horrible thing. Thank you. Thank you. Ian Wilkerson, followed by Sidney Cox. Ian Wilkerson, not seeing an Ian. Sydney Cox, followed by Mary Dahl. Hello, my name is Sydney Cox. I live in Windsor, California. I have a letter that I've drafted to go to the Windsor School Board. Um, it's a bit of a personal story about radio frequencies. I would like to explain why I first became aware of the effects of radio frequencies. My husband, a retired physics professor, and I have a coronet electrosmog radio frequency meter. We've had it for about five years. Ever since his diabetes alerted us to the fact that his blood sugar levels were about 10% to 20% lower in a rural area on eastern Long Island where, there were, where the RF levels were very low. Cell phone reception was basically non-existent in the house. We stayed at this location three separate times in the winter and spring of 2013 while clearing out my aged mother's house and noticed this remarkable effect each time. Wondering what the reason was brought us to the possibility of RF's effect on my husband's blood sugar. That began my six year investigation into the effects of RFs, which includes smart meters, Wi-Fi, cordless phones, cell phones, and all manners of wireless devices. Now, I have been a volunteer in the Windsor schools for 10 years, spending time every week in the second grade classroom. I have always loved my time with the children. However, this year, the second grade classrooms have moved to Maddie Washburn, and most of the second grade portables have Wi-Fi emitters, which seem much more powerful than, ones I, than the ones I measured last year at Windsor Creek. I brought my meter in on several occasions, took some readings, and was alarmed. The readings range from 0.241 microwatts per centimeter squared to 0.0152 microwatts per centimeter squared, which studies show have been found to produce biological effects. Lest you think I'm simply an alarmist, I've attached some findings that corroborate my alarm. And I have them here. And here are the readings. These are the readings that I took, and these are all the listing of biological effects that happen to children. I still spend time in the classroom, but since I'm 67 years old and only there one morning a week, I'm not worried about myself. However, I am worried about the children. Biological effects include hyperactivity, disorganized thinking, agitation, headaches, and emotional behaviors, and I've noticed all these in the second grade classroom this year, because I've been there for 10 years, and I see such a change. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Dahl, followed by Megan Jerkovic. 
Hello, my name is Mary Dahl. I'm here to address the issues I have with a cell tower just feet from my home of 50 years. Since the cell tower was turned on approximately July 2018, my health has declined to the point that I can't be in many of my rooms without getting very sick. Several times I was so very close to calling 911. Think back to your worst flu bug. That's what I live with every single day. I am a prisoner in my own home. As a result of this, I have not been able to perform my normal daily activities like chores, cooking, cleaning, gardening, since the cell tower was put, turned on. Even my orange tree, just a few feet from the cell tower, normally produces much fruit. Now one side barely has any fruit. It is clear to my friends that my health has declined. I've learned a great deal about the harm radio frequency radiation affects one's health. The energy levels of radiation frequency radiation in my home, yard, and street are thousands of times higher than they were before the cell tower was turned on. I called Miss Karen McPherson first part of September, and she told me she'd look into my complaint and get back to me. She called me back several days later and told me that it would be looked into by an independent contractor, and when they get the report, they would go from there. September 20th, 2019, there were people from Velux Nexus Company working on the cell tower, and I asked what was going on. I was able to speak to the boss. He told me they came to turn the cell tower on. The city doesn't want the liability. I said, oh, no. It's been on for a year. I've been very sick since it's been on. He got his meter and measured outside, no readings. He measured in my home, no readings. I asked if his meter was turned on before he measured, and he answered yes. And after a friend approached him, he said the cell tower had been on the whole time. End of October, Ms. McPherson called me and gave me a brief report on the findings, something about noise level, a broken fan, and is now in compliance with the city ordinance. When I inquired about the radio frequency report, she said she can't share that with me. Why? I told her how I resent my Monteverde Drive address on the battery backup box. I want it changed immediately. It should be 439 Calistoga Road, as stated on the permit. They, no one had my permission to use my address. I asked for copies of said reports, and I received said reports, but it was for King Street, not Calistoga Road. Thank you, Mary. Megan Jerkovic, followed by Melissa Kianta. Is, Meg is Megan here? No, go ahead, Melissa, followed by Donna Davis. There's a little button on the side there if you wanna lower that. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. As a cancer survivor, I am extremely concerned about the health effects of EMFs. There is ample research that indicates that EMFs are hazardous to human health. Just ask the 240 scientists who have published peer-reviewed research, that's 2,000 papers and letters on the biologic and health effects of EMFs, and have consequently signed the International EMF Scientist Appeal. The statement says numerous research, recent scientific publications have shown that EMF affects living organisms at levels well below most international and national guidelines. Effects include increased cancer risk, cellular stress, increase in harmful free radicals, genetic damages, structural and functional changes of the reproductive system, learning and memory deficits and neurological disorders and negative impacts on general well-being in humans. Damage goes well beyond the human race as there is growing evidence of harmful effects to both plant and animal life. One of the researchers and signers of that document is Joel Moskowitz, PhD, the director of the Center for Family and Community Health in the School of Public Health at UC Berkeley. Dr. Moskowitz began translating and disseminating the research on the health effects of wireless radiation after he and his colleagues published a 2009 meta-analysis of research that found long-term cell phone users were at great risk 
greater risk of brain tumors. And we have no reason to believe 5G is safe, a piece published on Scientific American's website on October 29, 2019. Dr. Moskowitz weighs in on 5G. He states, 5G will, will employ millimeter waves for the first time in addition to microwaves that have been used in, in use for older cellular technologies. 2G through 4G. Given limited reach, 5G will require cell antennas every 100 to 200 meters, exposing many people to millimeter wave radiation. Millimeter waves are mostly absorbed within a few millimeters of human skin and in the surface layers of the cornea. Short-term exposure can have adverse physiological effects in the peripheral nervous system, the immune system, and the cardiovascular system. The research suggests that long-term exposure may pose health risks to the skin, as in melanoma, the eyes, as in ocular melanoma, and the test as in sterility. One of the defining experiences of going through cancer is feeling completely out of control. It's a sense that echoes through the days and if one is lucky, years that follow surviving it. For me, that echo raises to a roar when I read the research about the ill effects of 5G and know that major corporations are making decisions that it could affect me and the other cancer patients at Sonoma County. I demand that the Santa Rosa City Council not give those corporations that control. Please listen to the science and give the power back to the people where it belongs. Thank you. Donna Davis, followed by Richard Canini. Good evening, Council. My name is Donna Davis. I'm with AT&T External Affairs. I would like to thank the staff for allowing us to collaborate as we look forward to solutions for the network demand that we have here. Um, between 2007 and 2016, we saw a 250,000 percent increase in data traffic on our network. This isn't just from us as individual users, but also our small businesses, which now more than ever depend on wireless services to support their day-to-day -day operations. And probably, most importantly, here in Sonoma County, um, you know, we, we look at emergency and first responder support and the use of the wireless network to do that. We heard from Assistant Fire Marshal Lowenthal speaking about emergency alert systems, which depend on an effective wireless network. 2018, we began the rollout of FirstNet, which is our nation's first unified communication platform dedicated to first responders. With that kind of network and the technology that we have, it's allowing for our first responders to have video, live video feeds during an event for situational awareness, something we didn't have you know, prior to uh, what happened in 9-11. So you know, with all of this increased demand, how is Santa Rosa faring with network performance? And you may recall in 2016, your press Democrat um, cited a root metrics report which rated Santa Rosa 122 out of 125 metropolitan areas with respect to mobile network performance. 2018, that dropped to 125 of 125 metropolitan areas. So, you know, how do we solve for this? We heard about the small cells and addressing network performance um, with respect to coverage. And really, we're also talking about capacity. So while you might have bars where you are, the service might not work when it's needed during those high capacity moments. If you think about it like 101, that's the bandwidth, that's the pathway to get around in the North Bay. But when it's high peak or high traffic, it becomes slow or maybe it comes to a complete stop. So if I'm using my travel app, it'll take me and it'll divert me to a surface street so that I can get to where I'm going without being stuck in the traffic. So these small cells will offload some of that capacity um, demand on the network. So. I just wanted to again thank the city for the opportunity to collaborate on this. I know it's important for the community feedback and, and we look forward to continued work on this solution for you. Thank you. Richard Canini followed by Stephen Hollis. Excuse me. Federal government has established standards. We should be reassured because the federal government has established standards. I do not trust the government. The government lies. The federal government is practically a wholly owned subsidiary of Wall Street. Wall Street's interest is money, not people. Wall Street writes the legislation the Congress passes. There are higher standards for the safety of people involving these uh, cell thingies. The European Union, which has greater, demonstrated a greater concern for its citizens than our government has ever demonstrated for us, the European Union has higher standards. 
To give you one example, M&Ms. The M&Ms sold in this country may not be sold in Europe. You can get colored M&Ms in Europe, but not the colored M&Ms in the United States. Colored M&Ms in Europe are made with vegetable coloring. The colored M&Ms in these United States are made with paint. That's not allowed in Europe. Europe has much higher standards for food and regulations on emissions such as this. That's one place we could look. Maybe it's time we petition our government for redress. Sometimes if you get their attention, if they hear from enough people, enough voters, they'll act. They won't just take the money from Wall Street because they know Wall Street can give them millions of dollars, but they, Wall Street has no more votes than we do. We each have one vote and that's our power and we haven't been using it properly. But we need to contact our Congress people, in my opinion, and get them to raise these standards or abolish these things or find a better method. Let them know directly, and if they don't, vote them out. That's the only power we have. And if that ain't gonna work, and I ask you to take the lead in this petition of redress, you are city leaders. If you care about the people and you've heard enough tonight, you could take this lead and we could join you, but you'll be much more effective than we will be. And if not that, the only other thing government understands is lawsuits. That's one thing that'll get their attention and they'll get these corporations' attentions. And this should go on record because when these problems occur, we can prove that they knew about it and still acted egregiously and criminally. Thank you very much. To the barricades. Thank you. Stephen Hollis followed by Rob Hansen. Is Stephen Hollis not seeing him? Bob Hansen, followed by Chris Villegas. Go ahead, Bob, please, Pierre. Bob Hansen. Going on two years ago, I gave the city council documentation documentation which stated the majority of the world's scientific and medical communities have deemed communications transmitters placed within city proper a global medical crisis. You don't get any much more blunt than that. When the majority of the world's scientific and, science and medical communities call this a global medical crisis, you gotta listen. Like Roundup and the city council meetings with the public saying, we do not want this in our city. It took multi-million dollar settlements against Roundup for this city council to act. It's time our city council realizes you do not work for the corporation of the city of Santa Rosa, you work for the public. You work for everybody here that voted you onto that seat. And when the public says, we do not want this in our community, you gotta listen. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Villegas. Mayor and council members, my name is Chris Villegas and I'm the community outreach representative for the North Bay for Verizon Wireless. At Verizon, we are hopeful and excited to move forward with providing better coverage and capacity solutions to residents and businesses of Santa Rosa. Through the past two years, we have worked closely with city staff and support the request city staff has made to move forward with small cell deployments with, with the industry. Verizon Wireless is happy to be a resource to the city as we have done many small cell deployments within the country and locally in Northern California. Again, my name is Chris Villegas and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Those are all the cards we have here. We'll bring it back to council. Uh, give you want to put that next steps slide 32 up to frame the conversation. Okay, uh, 
Let me first start with council. Based on any of the comments that we heard from members of the public, did you have any additional questions you'd like to ask any of the presenters? Seeing none, let's start with you, Mr. Tibbetts, for any feedback. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, at first, I'd like to thank the gentleman who, who came. I'm sorry, sir, I'm missing your name, but thank you for coming and providing those insights. And, um, and I, of course, appreciate the input from the public. You know, for me, this one, and Gabe, I had mentioned to you the other day, the hard thing for me here is, you know, not even necessarily trying to determine or speaking of the health benefits. It seems that there seems to be a study for either side of this argument. Um, where I struggle with it is it just comes down to a citizen's ability to, you know, feel safe in Santa Rosa. And um, I, I think it very well could be that in 20 years this, this proves to be a non-issue. But I don't like the idea that somebody who something is as sacred to them as their health feels threatened, uh, especially when they're in their home. So I am, you know, I like the, what you've got here. I like that we are looking at commercial zones, keeping it out of residential neighborhoods. Um, and I, but I want to really make sure that we truly create a system that, that does that and also has enforcement capability. Um, I think I mentioned to you, but I really want to see us, if we're going down this road, come up with a policy uh, that allows us to also have some degree of control over the CPU C polls. And to me, that policy has to move hand in glove with this policy that we're talking about here tonight. Uh, I'd also, it wasn't really discussed, but I, I think it was, it was kind of brought up, a common theme that I was hearing was that, that residents want some degree of control. And, and I was thinking about that. What could control look like for a resident? Let's say it does, even though it's in a commercial zone, let's use the example of the junior college that you mentioned, uh, but it's within 200 feet of, of homes there. Um, would it be plausible to, uh, you know, essentially take a compass, draw a circle 500 feet around that point or whatever the range, effective range is of these towers and notify those residents before it comes in, much like we would for a planning hearing or something like that. But not just say to the residents, hey, come on down to this, this hearing or come on down to the planning department and voice your opposition. But actually, if, if they gather more than 51% of signatures of people in that neighborhood saying no, could a process like that be instituted to truly give residents control over this process? Yes, that's definitely more of the discretionary process you're describing. Um, in a lot of these review cases, especially with macro sites, it's reviewed against design guidelines, and if it meets the design guidelines, it moves forward, which to some extent does, it creates a challenging atmosphere for the resident because they have valid concerns about the site, and we turn around and open up a public process really to check some boxes on design criteria. So what we'll look at is we'll definitely take a radius, so it'll probably be a bit more aggressive than the impacts of that site, just so we can incorporate the community's concern when we do the limited deployments. And in this situation, since we're trying some things out, out, um, we can definitely look at other sites if we get those types of concerns. So when we get into more policy development, there's a big difference between ministerial and discretionary. And even sure. in the discretionary realm, what are we reviewing it against? Uh, just from a staffing standpoint and the ability to process that application. But we can definitely look at those pieces to say that we're, if we're seeing those concerns that we really can't control from a current policy, mm -hmm. how can we get creative on ways in which we can address that feedback and incorporate it into the decision-making process? So definitely on the limit deployment and is definitely some impact uh, input we can factor into our overall code change. Yeah, I'd, I'd be really interested in that and I want to be clear, I'm not asking you to bog down the design review board or the uh, planning commission. I think they're bogged down enough. I think it would actually be a ministerial process, but something as simple as a certain period of time that people have to petition to not have it in the neighborhood and if they collect the 51% of, of signatures of property owners in that zone, then it's not going in. Um, that's something I'd be curious about. Uh, on to the, you know, I'm trying to address your questions too that you had in the study session, Gabe, so if I miss one, please let me know. But the other one would be is uh, the battery backup boxes for, for the ones that do go into the commercial zones. Um, I think it's, it makes absolute sense to have a battery box. Um, if we're gonna have these things at all, they might as well work in the event of an emergency. Um, when, it, when it comes to the testing, so I think this is, 
this is important, but I also want it to be effective. I don't want it to be just doing something for the sake of doing it. You know, somebody mentioned that in San Francisco, it's checked twice a year. Do we even know if that's if that's sufficient? I mean, if the hard part here is what's what's enough? And I do agree with your idea of having the the leaseholder, or excuse me, not the leaseholder, but the uh, the tenant, if you will, on the polls uh, pay for that that service. But how would that? How do you envision that that system working? Well, what we can look at, and, and there was public comment points addressing this too, is some of the concern is when they're up and running, how does the RF, how is it handled a year after that? And I think San Francisco has took that two-year mark. We can do some research just to see how effective that is. Uh, there's the other pieces we can track with, which are any activities on just from a permitting standpoint, mm -hmm. changes are made to the facility and we can retest. But I think the more important point is how can we address the community's concerns when they yeah. feel as if just on a regular day-to-day -day basis there's experiencing problems? How do we provide those internal services to be able to test in that situation? That would still have to be built into a cost recovery model, but we can definitely explore that along those lines of we receive a request from the community member to go out and test, how can we handle that? Mm -hmm. I, again, I recognize that's probably gonna create a headache for whoever's doing that job or whatever department is managing that person. And, and I, you said something that, that I'm glad to hear you say, which is that that should be an internal person. That person should be independent of carriers and, and things like that. Um, but. Uh, Again, I, what, I, what we do is I think it's going to be important that for that person that, again, feels unsafe and for me to, to support an eventual policy like this, uh, it just comes down to how that person's feeling in their home for me, and I think that might, might help. Um, I think, oh, and um, yeah, I think that's it for me from now. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Gabe. Thank you. Mr. Olivares? Okay, thank you for uh, the work that you put into this and, and uh, all, all the effort to and, and developing some of these solutions that I think are viable here. Uh, I am in support of moving forward with those things that we, we can do within the, our legal restrictions uh, with the uh, limited release of city polls. Uh, and what can we do as it relates to the utility boxes of the battery backups? I am supportive of eventually having some kind of an art thing associated with that if it's, if it's feasible. Again, all of this recognizing the uh, so many other uh, responsibilities that you have going on with your, your department now. Uh, so how do we time this out to roll it out? Uh, and also looking at uh, potentially what policy changes can we be making of our own policy down the, down the road to meet our current issues and future issues as well. Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. I, I do have one question. Um, given given the changing landscape of legislation around this issue not only in california but across the country is have you heard anything about um the retroactivity that could be in place if if legislation changes and allows us and which would probably follow um, other studies i mean one can always find you when whenever someone uses the word studies show um i know that there's always going to be someone on the other side that's going to be showing another study that that perhaps counters that and it does it creates a it puts us in a difficult position of course and um but I, I have a, a sense that, the, um, that there will be more information that will come to bear around this technology um, one way or another. And um, so I'm, if, if there is a um, retroactivity that is attached to some legislation that changes, I'd be interested in hearing about that. Um, I, I agree with Councilmember Oliveras that, uh, that w within our legal, whatever legal restraints that we do actually have, um, that anything that gives us more discretion in our decision making about where these um, antennas are located. Um, I know that, uh, Gabe, you, you mentioned in our meeting that um, prior to this evening that you were dedicated to um, making sure that w whenever possible that these were not located in residential areas and that there, if, if something did uh, occur where there was a potential for that, that there would be a great deal of, of community outreach. So I, I'm, I know you're dedicated to that and I um, know that that would be, that would be happening but I, again, it is discretion in, the, in our decision making that, that I think um, it's, it's never it's never very comfortable when um, the federal government says um, you can't say no, and 
makes me feel very uncomfortable, and it, we, it's, this is not the only area where we are uh, in that position, um, but I expect in some ways that may change, but, uh, but that discretion in the decision making is something that's very important to me, I think, the, um, and, the, and the entire council, and clearly uh, to the community that was here this evening. Thank you. Ms. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to everybody who came out and expressed um, the information that they did, as well as the hard work of our team. I, I'm with my council members in that with our, within our limited scope of authority, I believe that we should move forward so that we can exercise as much local control as possible. And to that end, a couple of my thoughts are that uh, I do believe that in as much as this is one aspect of this is about public safety, that we can't move forward without battery backups, but that Santa Rosa historically has moved forward um, in favor of development without aesthetics, and we have paid dearly for that. And so I, I, I believe that both have to go forward with equal importance and urgency. Uh, the second thing that bothers me is the idea of having a less than 300-foot setback in doing outreach to neighbors. I think that uh, that maybe in the Mendocino corridor, the residents that, that, I'm, that I serve are very engaged and will come out and tell you exactly what they think. But in lower income neighborhoods where people have two or three jobs and more, less bandwidth, I don't think that that's um, reasonable to expect that they're gonna be able to express themselves at the same rate and so that that will disadvantage uh, lower income communities and I'm not in support of that. Let's see. I, I definitely support the idea of having a city um, review process uh, and um, figuring out a way to uh, fund that through through the utilities. And let's see, did I miss anything else? Did I? Is there anything else that you'd like some feedback on that I missed? I think that covers it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thanks for the uh, presentation, a variety of different perspectives here. And um, I, I really appreciate the one thing you said, the limited deployment in non-residential areas, because really the, uh, the deployment of these cell towers in residential areas, as we talked earlier, I mean, it greatly concerns me. And, and I would be interested in this may be more of your item two deployments allowed under council policy 300-4. When that does come back, could we have a medical professional talk about the safety of these devices? And I'll do respect to our engineer, it's a different filter to be looking at this issue because I, I, I can't, uh, all of us on council have received um, much information about the different studies and it seems like there, there, there's a missing point here. So again, I do appreciate um, the engineer's perspective, but FCC dealing with medical issues concerns me. It just seems that that's out of their ball, ballpark. So. Um, one of the other questions that um, I was interested with our current policy, what is our standard with, I know that there had been no cell towers around firehouses and schools. Can you just update me about what institutions um, are, cell towers are allowed to be away from? Are there any? So as it stands now, there are not. So as we incorporate that, there is a lot of sensitivity around schools, as been mentioned. Um, I'll let Mr. Lowenthal talk a little bit about some of the input that's brought into the fire station discussion. Uh, but these are all pieces that are really great feedback. So if there's those critical facilities or there's high level of concern about some of those locations that would then govern the radius in which these can go in, that's excellent feedback now and then as we roll this forward. Because yeah, obviously that concerns me. And I thought with one of our last uh, previous study sessions, there's something about firehouses, there was some legislation that forbid them from going close to them. Can you no, I don't know necessarily, I can't speak necessarily to them going close to them, but I think one of the concerns was them being placed on top of them because historically fire stations are looked at as commercial buildings um, and that's why you'll typically see a lot of cell towers going in in uh, fire district uh, station locations uh, commonly around the state because it's also a source of income for a lot of those smaller districts. Um, but I know, I think one of the things you're reference, referencing is IFF uh, requesting that they not go on top of the fire stations because they are um, uh, looked at as homes because that's where the firefighters are sleeping. So the concern is is that um, work that has to be done them on off hours, uh, things of that nature could be disruptive to the crews that are in there. Um, but as far as specifically uh, within close proximity of it, uh, not to my knowledge. So that was more about, and you're understanding, I, I apologize for not sharing this with you earlier, but what I just heard you say is more about the construction of it, not the actual 
what, what, what comes off the device was the bigger concern for the IFF? There's, there's a couple different points. There was the point for disruption to the crew, but is some of the issues I've heard, not just from IFF, but other uh, departments around the state. Um, but yes, also uh, potential limitations to any um, uh, exposures. The IFF is always very proactive to reducing any risk, whether it's sound, whether it's carcinogens. So anything that can be done to limit um, different types, uh, different types of exposures, is what I believe the IFF was referring to back in 2004. So again, for, for me, Gabe, coming back with policy, a comprehensive policy. So if there are exceptions like schools, firehouse, whatever, whatever the reasoning that those entities were excluded. I would like to, it, for it to be consistent because, again, if it's not good for the firefighters, the school kids, same thing with the neighborhood. So let's just try to be, please. Alex, you've been here enough. Please give us the respect. I didn't interrupt you. Thank you. Um, so anyway, those are things that I think once we get more into item number two here, let's be a little bit more specific. Um, when we get to the potential uh, backup batteries, you know, I, I like the art thing in commercial areas, something that's going to be aesthetically sound because I do see the need uh, that is a valuable resource for our community and um, getting feedback from the community about what that looks like I think would be a good step in the right direction. So did you get the information? to move forward for your next steps, or is there any other feedback you need from the council? I think we have enough. I appreciate the feedback, and um, as soon as we really know timelines of that second phase, so we'll move forward in the first go around with the rollout, very sensitive about the radius. We'll expand it out above the 300 feet um, as we get into that pilot program, and then we'll incorporate the feedback we heard as we bring that back to council to determine that bigger code change. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, council is going to take a brief 10 minute break. We'll reconvene at 5.30.
Okay, welcome back to the city council meeting. Madam city clerk, can we get an announcement of the roll call? Let the record show that all members of the council are present. Thank you. Uh, we just had our study session. Madam city attorney, would you like to report on the closed session items? Uh, yes, the uh, council uh, held discussion on two uh, closed session items, 2.1 and 2.2, and on uh, each of those uh, gave direction to staff. Great, thank you. We have no proclamations. Mr. Goon, do we have a fire recovery and rebuild update? We do, item 7.1 is a fire recovery and rebuild update, and Megan Bassinger, our housing community service manager, will give the update. Good evening, I'd like to provide you with a brief update on the status of the Cal Home Disaster Assistance Program. As you may recall, in the fall of 2018, the Housing Authority was awarded $1.2 million in Cal Home Disaster Assistance, and this is funding to provide eligible homeowners um, gap financing up to $100,000 for the reconstruction of their destroyed residences. Uh, HCD, which is the California Department of Housing and Community Development, has made amendments to state legislation. So the program is now available to households up to 120% of AMI, which is for a family of $411,000 a year. We are, we being the Housing Authority, is in the process of amending our guidelines with HCD. So we'll have a rollout of the program in early January. We are also seeking to modify the Cal Home program to allow gap financing assistance for owners of manufactured homes. Um, some of the other parameters of the program is that the post rehab or reconstruction value of the house cannot exceed $660,000. So that is one of the limitations that has been um, an impediment to the process. That is not going away, but we can now assist households up to 120% of area median income. And interested homeowners can look on our website. We'll have further information rolling out in January, um, and they can contact staff with any questions. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. So what website, just the city website, or do they have Correct. to go to? srcity.org, and if you hit the recovery button, there is a link to the program recovery. there. Great, thank you. Council, any questions on that? Thank you so much, Megan. Oh, I do have oh, stand by, there may be a question. Yeah, I'm curious to know if that number, the total value, if that is something that is assessed when the construction is completed or at the outset. And I ask because I do see prices starting to come down and I'm wondering if that might be one of the upsides of a softening real estate market. So unfortunately, the, um, the value does track the real estate market and it's updated monthly based on data from the California Association of Realtors and that's available on the state's website. It's by county and it is an appraisal that needs to be prepared prior to the uh, execution of loan documents. So we need to have a, a good understanding of what the estimated value is prior to construction of the residence. But it's about when it's the completed value, and the completed value, if the trend lines are going down, it, it would be what, if it were completed today, what the value would be today? So it would be the estimated value prior to beginning construction. So if we're able to estimate that the value of the house is going to be 650 when you start construction, and that's what the state is currently trending, then we would accept that. We don't go back and reassess it at completion. Is there any discretion with that? That it's pursuant to state regulations, so no. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you, Megan. Any additional items to report on that item? That's the end of that item. Okay, great. Uh, Mr. Assistant City Manager, do you have a report for us this evening? I have two items, uh, both from Santa Rosa Water. Uh, in October, Santa Rosa Water was honored by the American Council of Engineering Companies, uh, North Coast Chapter, as the 2019 Infrastructure Public Owner of the Year Award for the work they did on restoring the water system um, in the fire damaged area of uh, neighborhoods of Fountain Grove. So in, that was back in 2017 in the Tubbs Fire. Um, as, also as part of that, they've got, they received a special recognition from Congressman Huffman, Congressman Thompson, as well as uh, from the State Assembly. Um, I, I do want to acknowledge though a few people, Jennifer Burke, Emma Walton, and Joe Schiavone and their teams. Um, they did act very quickly, uh, found creative solutions for that, and got that system addressed very quickly. So um, applaud to them. They also are sharing their information and knowledge uh, to other areas that are affected by similar disasters, which is a good thing to pass that along. Um, secondly, um, due to the, the most recent fire, the Kincaid fire, uh, we I think we told the council eight of Calpine's power poles that provide power to the 
pump stations that provide recycled water up to the geysers from our system. Uh, they were damaged. Um, those have been offline since mid-October. So it's been a while since the power's been off, and what that means is water can't be pumped up to the geysers for energy generation. Uh, so they, the good news is that, that, that uh, those repairs have been done. The water's been resumed to pump back up to the geysers, which is really important because during that six-week time frame when the power shut off, uh, the, the city had to store that additional water, which was about 400 million gallons. Um, to put it in perspective, that's about, uh, about uh, 60% of the storage, I'm sorry, 40% of the storage that we have that we reserve for um, future rain, rain events. So uh, the, the water department's gonna be watching that very closely to make sure that if additional rain events come over the next few months, uh, that's gonna be a, a trigger to determine if we need to discharge, um, and there's protocols in place to make sure that we discharge appropriate per our, our uh, agreement with the state board. So, and we'll give it more update, and if anything does move forward on that, we'll, we'll make sure to update the council. Okay. Um, City Attorney, do you have a report? I do not, thanks. Okay, let's go back. I do have one card on item 7.1. Uh, Peter Chernoff. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I am Peter, and I'm a bit of a spiritual arsonist. And as I tried to make it clear in the other meeting that uh, uh, the city council, for all their good intentions, can only do so much because they are under United Nations Agenda 21, which can be verified a number of ways. So they wanna do good things, but they're hampered. They're hampered because uh, they do not have the political will that they could usually have. And the people that wanna make things happen somehow are lacking the spiritual will to make things happen. I wanted to bring up the fact that, uh, you know, there's gonna be, the earthquakes are coming, you got all these fires and waters. Does the city have a couple thousand gallons of water, clean drinking water put aside, or are we gonna re rely on, on the big stores charging $10 a gallon when all these things happen beginning this week with the earthquakes? And when I hear discussions about manufactured homes and I see all these people homeless on the streets and there's a lot of people that are struggling that had homes and they're also in the streets or in campers, why, why, are we, uh, why is not somebody putting something together uh, on some fairgrounds using teepees? Teepees worked for a long time. They work great, they're perfect. And so I want to finish by sharing the fact that, um, you know, if we all got off the fence, stopped paying mortgages and rents for two months, and then decided to pay 25% of what it was before, then all of a sudden we eliminate the bankers and the lawyers in this game, and a 40-day strike empowers law enforcement with the U.S. Constitution first time, and we change the entire equation. It cannot be done within the system by the system's rules. It's the United Nations, it's the usurious bankers running this whole show. These are people that wanna do the right thing and you have the power to let them do the right thing, but you have to disengage financially from the system for the 40 days which the prophecy calls for that sets the entire world free. I've been sharing this for 30 years. The world's walking a true trial of tears. Martin Luther King says you can't uh, uh, if one person is wrongfully incarcerated, so are we all. Leonard Peltier's been down 44 years. Jamal, 39. McDonald, 47. And we're sitting there worrying about ourselves. So as those that seek to save their lives shall lose them. You have to do for others first. And what's first is first is these people that have been down that are our champions, our Jedi warrior knights that did things on behalf of many of us before we were a twinkle in anybody's eye. So the power is with only the powers with the strike. The 40-day economic strike that disengages the bankers and the United Nations off their back so that they can then do what you ask. But as you've seen for the last 10 years, they cannot do what you ask when it comes to serious issues, even though they want to. It's the same thing with law and police. They're in the middle of a satan. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Council, any statements of abstention on anything on tonight's agenda? Mr. Rogers? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will be abstaining from item 14.1. Any others? Seeing them, great. Uh, council and mayor reports. Anyone have anything they'd like to report? Mr. Olivares. Thank you, Mayor. We had our um, monthly downtown subcommittee meeting last Thursday. Uh, not a high attendance because a lot of controversy has been resolved for us, which is good. Uh, the uh, members that attended, I mean, the, the downtown folks that attended were very appreciative, though, 
of the efforts, our efforts in uh, moving forward with, re with rolling back our parking hours. Uh, they did talk about some of the difficulties they've had downtown this season. I think we saw that in the paper as well. But more importantly, they were really surprised and expressed gratitude for the speed in which that was done. I believe that changeover was done within two hours, I mean, I'm sorry, two days uh, with the help of various volunteers and getting those labels on those parking meters. So they wanted to extend that appreciation. Hey, thank you. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So three primary things. Uh, first, I had a chance uh, last week to join the League of California Cities uh, for a discussion on league priorities. I, I think I've reported back to this body uh, that I was appointed by the president of the League of Cities as the vice chair for the Environmental Quality Committee. Uh, and we were successful in making sure that resiliency uh, and recovery made it as a top three issue for the League of Cities, primarily around for other uh, jurisdictions, how to prepare for disaster, for fire, uh, and learning from the lessons that we've learned as well. So that'll be moving forward. Uh, there is going to be a ribbon cutting this coming Friday for SMART uh, for the Larkspur extension at one o'clock. Uh, everybody is welcome to attend, but around that, SMART is doing two specific programs to try to get folks used to using the rail line in conjunction with the ferry down in Larkspur. Uh, so first is for the months of January and February, uh, free rides uh, on the weekends, so take advantage of that. And then the other is during the week uh, at the non-peak times, uh, and they have it on their website, what the peak times actually are, they will be doing what's called a rail and sail pass, where if you are a user of the smart train, if you pay your fare to go down, you then can ride the ferry for free. And if you're coming up into Marin and Sonoma from San Francisco taking the ferry, you pay for the ferry and then you can ride the smart train for free. So it's going to be cross-marketed between the jurisdictions to try to bring folks in Sonoma County uh, down along the rail line to check that out and then to bring up from San Francisco people to shop in our downtowns and to see what Sonoma and Marin counties have to offer. And that'll be running uh, for the next six months uh, as well. Uh, third and, and final, I uh, attended the Sonoma County Transportation Authority monthly meeting yesterday. Uh, there was a very interesting study that they have been working on around vehicle miles traveled uh, to try to judge where transportation funding should go. Uh, they used over 25 million data points uh, through 2017 and 2018. And they found that actually uh, almost all of the trips that are generated in Sonoma County also stay in Sonoma County. There was very little crossover into other jurisdictions uh, and Santa Rosa actually, not surprisingly, did the best. So 89% of all uh, trips in Sonoma County that started here, finished here for Santa Rosa, 76% of all trips that started in Santa Rosa finished in Sonoma County. We had 84% of our total trips in Santa Rosa that were under 10 miles total. And we had 61% of all of the trips in Santa Rosa that were under five miles. So our folks, uh, particularly in our downtown, don't tend to move a whole lot. Um, we were 44% of the trips that were generated over that time span and only 36% of the vehicle miles traveled. And then finally, uh, they did a cross-reference, and all of this is available on the Sonoma County Transportation Authority's website. They did a cross-reference to see which plots of land in Sonoma County generated the highest density of travel. The answers were Santa Rosa Marketplace, which is Costco and Best Buy and Target, was number one. Downtown Santa Rosa, including the mall, was number two. Downtown Petaluma was number three, and then the Santa Rosa Kaiser was the highest, the fourth highest density of travel uh, per acre in the county. So some really interesting data there to take a look at, particularly as we move forward with talking about Measure M and the reauthorization of Measure M and how to best spend those transportation dollars. Great, thanks so much for that report. Any other reports? Seeing none, uh, approval minutes. Did anyone see anything to add, delete, or adjust from the minutes of November 19th? Seeing nothing, we will accept those. Uh, Mr. Gowen, consent calendar. All right, the cons consent calendar item 12.1 is a motion, contract award, fire damage, street lights, replacement, and fountain grove. Item 12.2 is a motion, contract award, fire damage, street lights, replacement, and coffee park. 
Item 12.3 is a resolution resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa approving amendment number one to the communication systems and service agreements with Motorola Solutions Inc. San Diego, California, not to exceed $5,303,200 to purchase and install a digital P25 trunked radio system solution, approval of equipment leased purchased agreement, and appropriation of $145,000 from federal state federal asset forfeitures fund, $100,000 from the state asset forfeiture fund, and and $3,772,000 from the general fund reserves to the radio project key 95860. Item 12.4 is a resolution, speed limits on Piner Road, Sebastopol Road, and Summerfield Road. Item 12.5 is a resolution, Volkswagen Environmental Mitigation Trust Fund application. And item 12.6 is an ordinance adoption second reading, ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa increasing the compensation of the city attorney by providing effective May 12th, 2019, one, a 7.5 merit increase, and two, a 2.5 increase in deferred compensation for a total contribution of 5% of base pay, and effective July 7th, 2019, one, a 2.5 cost of living salary adjustment, and two, an increase in con contribution by the city for the 2019-2020 fiscal year equal to 0.25% of base wage to the city attorney's retire health, retiree health savings plan for a total comp contribution of 0.75% of base wage. Thank you, council, any questions? Do we have any cards on the consent calendar? Ms. Vice Mayor. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move items 12.1 through 12.2. Six and wait for the reading of the text. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any additional comments? Your votes, please. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. Do we have cards for non agenda public comment? Okay, these are for items not on the agenda. First up, Alan Thomas, followed by Lisa Landers. Not on yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Alan Thomas, 306 Boy Street. Uh, I'd sent you an email this afternoon or this morning um, regarding 9th Street and um, as you know, I live over in the West End neighborhood, and our kids go to school um, up 9th Street, uh, West 9th, and then they go over to 9th Street, and then they go to high school. So these are school children that have to walk um, in the gutters filled with beer cans and garbage because uh, folks have decided that that's where they're going to live. Um, and I said in, in the email to you folks that to me that's a taking, that, that's, an, that's a adverse taking, so your legal department can describe what a taking is to you, but that's when you take something and you don't, you don't, you don't mitigate it. You don't mitigate it when, with money or services and things like that. You just take it from somebody and, and you're taking our public property um, away and giving it to someone else for their use. Whatever their use is, it doesn't really matter. Um, the nobleness of the use, uh, you're basically taking it. So do the ends justify the means to those kids that have to walk in the gutter and the garbage to go to high school? You folks are all about high school and school safety and all that kind of stuff, but yet you sit quietly and there's people underneath Highway 101, probably right now, that are camping and then tomorrow morning, those kids are probably doing their school work. Some of them, I see kids down here um, from the Boy Scouts or whatever group they're with and they're, they may or may not walk to school, but our kids do walk to school. And so I'm asking, again, like I asked in the email, to put your emergency homeless item that you keep extending for years on the agenda so the public can come and comment. So you can make a decision as to how you're gonna 
deal with this situation. And working with the county and sending, you know, letters back and forth and working with Shirley Zane or Linda Hawkins, it really doesn't matter to those kids that have to work to go to school, they have to basically walk in, in the street. So again, I'm just asking for your cooperation to look at all sides of this issue. And there isn't a, protect, a more protected class, of my opinion, than school children. But yet, for whatever reason, we're okay with having them walk in the gutters. It's not acceptable and you can do better. I know you can. So again, thank you for your time and please put that, this on your agenda as soon as possible. Thank you, Lisa Landris, followed by Valerie Slavke. Lisa Landris, I got three quick things for you. Um, one is it's come to my attention that clerical support would really benefit our city council in efficacy. Uh, a lot of them have full-time jobs. This is an afterthought job that has to be crammed into a very, very big format with lots of paperwork. So I think, I don't know if it needs to be an agenda item or what, but I don't want our police without guns and tear gas and all that, and I don't want our city council without clerical support. So if they could share one clerical support person between them and get more work done, that would be beautiful. Okay, my second item. Uh, we have put together a community listening session. We have finally got all parties to the table. Santa Rosa Police Department, Sonoma County Animal Control, Sonoma County Board of Supervisors, Susan Gorin. Uh, we have Mayor Tom, we have Chris Rogers from City Council. Did I forget anybody? So there's a multi-layered thing that happens with animal control. We have our own legislation here. They're the legislative body. We also have enforcement that comes a little bit from Santa Rosa Police Department. And then we have Sonoma County Animal Control that has to be brought in. And then they are governed by Board of Supervisors. So it's a very complicated thing, hard to get traction on. We got everybody coming to a listening session. It's gonna happen sometime in the first week of February. So if you are a walker, a bicyclist, um, a runner, someone who likes to go to parks and you have been annoyed as almost every person I know has now been by off-leash dogs, particularly by homeless people. Um, it seems to be more prevalent as that crowd rises, the incidence is going up. Uh, now you're gonna have a place to voice your concerns on that. And maybe we won't have to have any more vicious attacks because maybe everybody will come together and find better solutions for it and make headway on it. Okay, my third thing is needles. I've been a creek steward for many, many years. I don't even go just with the big troop, I go on my own and I do it hours and hours every week of volunteer service. I am finding so many needles on every path, every parkway I go to. I use coffee containers that have been donated by people and then I label them and I hand them off to Parks and Rec. I got this in my um, recology thing and it's about the sharps containers, but unfortunately when you call the number to get one, they have been out for over a year. So I then called the eco desk, they didn't have any way to get them to me. So I called Alistair from the creeks, he's going to supply them. So if you are a trash picker upper, a needle disposer of person, talk to, talk to the creek stewardship program, Alistair, and he will get you one of those containers. Thank you. Thank you. Valerie Schlafke, followed by Peter Cherniff. Is Valerie here? Valerie, apparently not. Uh, Peter Cherniff, followed by Andrew Roth. So here we are on the eve of a full moon and not a thing has been accomplished yet, but it's gonna be very exciting right now we get the homeless, we get the forced vaccines, we get the 5G military programs. <clears throat> we have a bunch of high school kids here that could probably list about five or six other things. We have a few adults that actually do work and try to make a difference, but we're still on our knees to uh, corruption and the, and, and, and the God mammon of greed, for we still maintain the slaughterhouse of the animals and the slaughterhouse of the oil, uh, which is the blood of the earth. Ghosts abound, make not a sound as spectators. Warriors arise free of compromise, overcome as liberators. Rainbow spirit warrior students walk out of school, lead the way till you spectator adults abide courage to join them to play. Shade, shade, Adonai, shade. Arise together as one and shine as the sun's ray. I am Peter, I am servant commanding. 
the ongoing fires and earthquakes till every knee hits the earth remanding. No labor, no school, no longer their fools, no mortgages, no rents. We're all off the fence. I am commanding the student strike on this full moon, like Jedi Knights to finish the fight of all fights. This be their high noon. As above, so too below. Now revealed, so long concealed behind the golden mask, the cap now off contents revealed of this ancient Egyptian mask. A mystical cobra released proceeds with its task. Already arrived this full moon as a matter of course, uniting in power this moment, this hour, with the warriors of Crazy Horse. With the fiercest warriors, both bidden and unseen, they be an almighty force, all gathered from past and future, all heartbreaks, they be here to suture in present time. It won't be nice, it won't be pretty, not in any corrupt city that be filled with crime. Crime against what has been given for the promised lands living as this magical rhyme. Political religious deceivers are no more than riffraff like ancient Jews who pervert true news while dancing about the golden calf as thunder and lightning comes forth more than frightening as to sever them in half. Almighty power as a promised shower unseats abusers from their perch, the serpent seed selling blood and greed, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. Almighty's love from beyond and above collects safely the innocents by search. Lord Almighty, your spirit be my home. The doors open for all your children from whence they roam. The last now be first as we cease all the curse by the power of this poem. As the fires be commanded, now the earth shakes. So all remanded their knees to the earth and laying down the sword by authority's living Lord, we see the promised birth releasing our spirit. The power of the Andrew wind has Roth, returned. Followed by Craig Murphy. Andrew, Peter, could you let Andrew up, please? Uh, I'm on. You're on now. Thanks. Uh, I've got a few comments about uh, the recent police shooting uh, the other day at the uh, corner of uh, Guerneville and Fulton or in that neighborhood, and also about uh, police firearm discipline and, and command discipline in general. Uh, I was a Boy Scout, and if we, we went to um, shooting ranges at scout camps in Pennsylvania and Maryland on a number of occasions, any of us who had used the level of ill discipline that uh, was reported in this incident at Guerneville and Fulton would have been ejected from the range immediately and given the lecture of our lives, not allowed to return uh, probably for the duration of camp. Um, it strikes me that you know, a private citizen opening fire under the same circumstances, this man was wielding an umbrella, uh, would likely face felony charges, uh, might be barred upon conviction from ever possessing a, well, legally possessing a firearm again. Um, you know, the range discipline that I mentioned has to do with, in particular, with sighting and uh, identifying the target that you don't just open fire blind onto something you haven't identified and sighted. And uh, you know, I don't really see how I would misidentify, mistake a, um, an umbrella for a long gun, uh, especially in broad daylight. This incident happened, I believe, about 12.30 p.m. Uh, I, I can see how, you know, if 911 caller might misidentify it, but we would, should certainly hope that a police officer would cite it and identify it before opening fire. Um, it seems like there's, you know, this feeds into a general sense of, of police privilege that once officers are through probation, there really are, there are very few restrictions on what they're allowed to do on duty, uh, very little accountability. Um, and I, uh, another um, related comment I have is that we there's a, an even worse problem with, uh, with tasers, maybe not so much in the Santa Rosa Police Department specifically, but police forces in general, they've got the same grip and design as, uh, as sidearms. And as we saw in the uh, Oscar Grant shooting in Oakland, that is a, very clearly an incident where, uh, where the officer involved 
uh, mistook it for his gun. He immediately reacted with shock when he, he discovered he shot Oscar Grant. And uh, I think that you know, just in general, that, that uh, there were other incidents like that. Uh, it, really, tasers should be uh, removed from police officers. Thank you. Thank you. Greg Murphy. Oh, thank you, council members. Craig Murphy, Santa Rosa. Um, wanted to start by reporting out uh, Citizens for Action Now is a group that, that I'm in. And um, recently we uh, were successful at clearing a homeless encampment that was behind Montgomery High School. Um, but that wasn't the end of it. There was, there was still uh, work to be done because there was nothing preventing the folks from moving back in or future people moving back in. Uh, so uh, we had Caltrans involved through a series of conversations with CHP and Caltrans. They cleared the site of all brush and trees, and then just this morning they installed signs uh, stating no trespassing. And that's a big deal because that gives the police and the CHP authority to go in and arrest people who do camp there in the future. So um, Citizens for Action Now was instrumental in making that happen, and uh, so that's a good thing. We are making a difference. Um, the, the topic that I want to talk about briefly tonight, though, is about needles that are in parks, drug paraphernalia. This Sunday, a woman was playing with her child at Howarth Park, and a lot of people might recognize this uh, in this picture here. There's a playground that has some structures that look like uh, a little storefront area. Uh, she photographed needles and a torch and a butane canister, so tools for cooking heroin or meth. Uh, somebody left them behind as they were shooting up probably the night before. Literally, they left them on the play structure without the protective caps on the needles. And this, this lady's child was crawling around on the area and she saw something over there and she went over and stopped her child before the child got to the needles. So this is, this brings the question about why are we not enforcing the laws? Why, why are the, and I know it's, it, it's homeless because there's homeless campers that are at Howarth Park. There's homeless campers that live up above the Camp Watam uh, sleeping area and others that periodically camp near the baseball diamond and then others that live up in, in, uh, um, in Annadale Park. So, and primarily the users of drugs are the homeless population. So it's pretty safe to say it's likely homeless people. Why are we not, why are we holding them to a different standard than we're holding ourselves? What if that was somebody's child and they, they got infected with HIV or, or another disease from a dirty needle? Um, I've emailed Chief Navarro. I asked him to up the, uh, the patrols of the parks. Um, my own kids have walked by needles, dirty needles, uh, and somebody that was strung out. Um, and I would also finally finish with, if we're not gonna enforce the laws, let's put up signs like we have at the Joe Rodota Trail that warn people to stay out. Let's warn people to stay out of Spring Lake Park and Howarth Park and Annadale. Thank you. 14.1, uh, Mr. Gulen. Item 14.1 is a report, the fiscal year 2018-19 Measure O annual report, and presenting will be Chuck McBride, Assistant City Manager and CFO. And team. Someone? Fire Chief, uh, Fire Chief is going to kick it off. Actually, oh, thank the, the, our thank CFO is going to. So we'll, we'll fire it. department will start, and we'll move it to police, and then uh, violence prevention. So, uh, Mayor Schwedhelm, Vice Mayor Fleming, Council Members, thank you for having us. Uh, this is our annual report on the Major O uh, for the city. And as the agenda says, uh, fire department will kick it off. To my right is uh, Jim Moran, he's the ASO for the fire department. He'll deal with the financials uh, and we'll get going right now. Okay, to start out, um, 
for um, for the fire department on slide four, you'll see that uh, our sales taxes were four million dollars. That was up nine point nine seven percent over the year before. Our expenditures were up 9.7%, so we had a net gain in our fund balance of $424,000 um, to bring us from the 2.6 million up to 3.1 million as of the end of the year. Slide five goes into the expenditures. Um, a quick synopsis at the top, you'll see that 84% of our expenditures through Measure O are on salaries and benefits, so we're mostly staff. 10% um, was spelt on debt service for one of the fire stations, and another 6% on administration and service and supplies. Um, we increased overall our expenditures by 330,000, but like I said before, our revenues were up higher than that, so we ended up actually coming out ahead. Um, Going to slide six, you'll see the differences where they lay out the revenues and the expenditures. And the green is the revenue, and you'll see over the past several years, we've had a gap in between, and that's kind of what you want to see. That means we're building up fund balance at that point, and that's a, a des, by design that we're doing that. Um, and a, the chief will address that on some of our future concerns. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Chief. Yep, so for Major O, it's, Major O's been really great for the City of Santa Rosa and the Fire Department. So for Major O, it provides 10 additional people for the Fire Department. Uh, nine people are on an engine, and then we have one training captain. So with the fire engine comes three captains, three engineers, uh, and three firefighters. We also get to enjoy a 25% uh, pay for a, used to be a quarter quarter-time EMS battalion chief. We have since moved that to a full-time EMS battalion chief of Major O picks up 25%, just like they did on day one. Also, a couple years back, we added paramedics to all of our truck companies. So Major O picks up the incentive for uh, those six uh, paramedics. Uh, the impact, so with the nine firefighters and the training captain, I will tell you that this year we're gonna, we've already run over 30,000 calls for service. Our training program is very, very stout, uh, meaning it's year to year, it's 25 to 30,000 hours of training that we, we perform annually, uh, department-wide. Uh, so Major O gives us the ability to really, really put uh, some really good training in the works for the fire department. I, and one of the training is one of the one aspects that I really, really have a hard time uh, shorthanding, uh, meaning I don't want to cut any training because that's what makes us uh, as good as we can be. And the, low, the less staff we have, the more training that we need. Um, what this does is it has allowed us to fund two stations, so Station 5 up on Newgate, which we are in the process of uh, working through FEMA and rebuilding, or at least that's where we're heading. We, ha we aren't there yet. Uh, and Station 11 on Lewis Road. Those two engines, especially Engine 11, took up a huge call volume uh, that Engine 1, and Engine 3, and Engine 5 shared. So uh, Engine 11 is one of our busiest station. Uh, engine 1 is our busiest station. I will tell you that uh, when you're running 30,000 calls with 10 fire engines, uh, the system is very busy. So on the Major O side, having those extra additional engines and equipment that we're able to purchase with Major O is very, very helpful. Uh, these are the stations. So Station 10 it helped the construction off uh, Circadian Way. Station 11, again, is on Lewis Road. And Station 5 was on Newgate. And these are just some of the uh, pieces of equipment. So a Type 1 engine, we had two Type 1 engines that Major L funded. The Type 3 engine, which is a wildland, four command vehicles, one swift rescue trailer. All these uh, pieces of equipment are used um, quite often. Uh, even the swift water rescue trailer, that's hooked up every winter. And it was very useful last year, many times throughout the floods around the city of Santa Rosa. While we did not typically have too many issues with flooding, there was a lot of flooding around us and we provide mutual aid to everyone around us. So um, looking ahead, so with our addition of our what we've done is we've completed a strategic plan. It's three years in. We've done a standards of coverage, which you guys are aware of. And then on January 14th, we'll be presenting a staffing study for the fire department. So all Major O is, is trying to help uh, push these items forward. 
Uh, we have funding for future uh, location and construction of Station 8. We have plans to move that down towards North, North Dutton and Hearn Avenue area. Um, not North Dutton, but Dutton and, and uh, uh, Hearn Avenue. Uh, and then we have to rebuild Station 9. Station 9, um, or we have to build Station 9. That's the southeast side and then Station 11. So Station 11 is a station that we have. It's a triple wide building that was meant to be seven to 10 years. It's been in service for 10 years. And we're not gonna have enough money in Majora, but we're doing everything we can to make sure that, that we are using that money and saving it for those types of infrastructure projects. And with that, we'll entertain any questions. Thank you, Chief. I have a quick question just on Station 8. Do we have a location for that? Because I know I, I, I get the response time yeah. thing, but do we have a location where that's in? We end? don't. We have the general location. Right now we're focusing on, on purchasing property for Station 5 and getting that going. And uh, Station 8 has been put on hold in terms of property acquisition until we get Station 5 okay, forward. Great. Council, any questions on the for the fire department? Ms. Weissmeyer? This is totally out of order, but I just want to say that that engine number one is Evie's favorite. So good work. That was my favorite too. Okay. So many comments not to say. Anything else? Thank you, Chief. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Up next is the police department and Chief Navarro. Good evening, Mayor Schwedholm, Vice, uh, Vice Mayor Fleming, and City Council. Ray Navarro, Chief of Police. And before I get started, uh, Engine One, I think, is my favorite too. So, uh, so I'm here to provide an update on the Police Department's use of Measure Measure O funds. Here we go. Uh, so as you see from this slide, uh, we had um, approximately 5.4 million um, at the beginning of this fiscal year. Uh, that includes the beginning balance of uh, 1.3 and the uh, tax revenues over the, over the year of 18-19. Uh, that was about $4 million. The, uh, the bulk of the uh, expenditures that uh, we'll, we'll go into a little bit later here, includes a special project regarding the radio project and also uh, increased spending uh, that uh, has to do with personnel costs. Uh, in this slide here, uh, you can see that about 85% of our, our uh, Measure O funds are allocated to salaries and benefits for our staff. Uh, there's about 3% that uh, goes to services and supplies, which includes a, a downtown enforcement team office uh, that's over by the Santa Rosa Transit Mall. Uh, you can also see about, uh, it was about 390,000 that was uh, transferred out. Uh, that transfer allowed us to uh, do work on the radio infrastructure, which uh, just a little bit earlier before during consent, uh, you uh, approved uh, uh, funding for the second phase of that project, and so uh, what the first, what the 390,000 did would allow it allowed us to upgrade our dispatch center for improved emergency response communication and laid the foundation for this next phase of the radio project. So we're really excited about that uh, moving forward. This slide here uh, provides a, uh, an example of uh, what our trend is. Uh, as you can see that uh, our expenditures are actually increasing greater than our revenue. Uh, early on we had, uh, uh, early on during the Measure O, we had uh, opportunities to uh, prevent layoffs because of Measure O, it was very important to us. Uh, but as we've moved through the years, what we're seeing is that uh, we are experiencing an increase in salaries and benefits that um, has, uh, that makes us uh, dip into the Measure O reserves right now to address uh, the increasing costs of staff. Uh, as a staffing model right now, our Measure O, again, it's very vital to us. Uh, we we, we uh, gain a lot out of uh, the Measure O funds that was voted by, um, voted in by the uh, 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 by the community. Uh, we currently have 19 positions that are staffed through Measure O. Uh, as you can see, we have a lieutenant. Uh, that lieutenant is uh, oversees our special 
our special uh, events program and our traffic our traffic bureau. Uh, the special events program, uh, that has become vital right now, uh, especially with all of the things that are going on. We have uh, Ironman, uh, Sonoma County Fair, the Wednesday Night Market, and all of the other special events that go on throughout the year. And our lieutenant um, is the, uh, the point person when we are working with the other city departments to put those together uh, to make sure that we are doing it in a uh, safe and efficient manner. Uh, the sergeant is uh, currently oversees our downtown enforcement team and we have a couple of officers within our downtown enforcement team. I apologize. Um, we also have uh, officers that are, that are assigned to traffic and, um, and then we have two field evidence technicians and a community service officer. Those are important. We're, we're actually using funds in non-sworn positions, civilian positions, uh, to provide uh, a greater efficiency for our funds and using uh, civilian personnel out on the street to, to provide direct resources to the community. Again, we have, um, from a measurable impacts, uh, we can attribute 611 arrests and uh, 412 citations to our Measure O staff. Uh, even though we have experienced some staffing issues in the past, we've been able to, um, and some of those, some of those staffing uh, issues that uh, we've dealt with, we've had to pull uh, back to patrol uh, from sp some of our special assignments, but Measure O has uh, allowed us to maintain uh, motor officers within the motor, um, uh, the motor team to address traffic, uh, traffic issues and complaints throughout the city. Uh, we've increased, uh, been able to increase our customer service. Uh, again, we have uh, the measure real funds has allowed us to uh, lay the foundation for the radio infrastructure that we have uh, going right now and for the next phase. Uh, we've also uh, uh, used it within our downtown enforcement team. Uh, our host, our downtown enforcement team is the major uh, component for our patrol down in the uh, downtown area. Uh, they represent the liaison with our host team and several of our nonprofit providers and uh, the, uh, the Measure O has supported police operations related to uh, uh, homelessness and quality, quality of life issues. Again, um, you know, looking ahead uh, with uh, Measure O, some of the things that we're going to be doing is we have to prioritize and we will be prioritizing the needs of the department. Uh, we're going to continue to evaluate the most effective use of Measure O funds uh, to enhance services to the public. Uh, this basically means that we are going to be looking at uh, how we use Measure O funds as it relates to staffing um, and also staffing uh, specialized teams and also equipment that actually enhances our core function. Uh, our, our vision for the police department is to be the standard of excellence in policing, and we believe we, the Measure O is helping us uh, uh, reach that vision. Um, and in the future, we're going to be, we have to address uh, infrastructure needs. Uh, we're going to evaluate how we can use Measure O funds from an emergency response standpoint. Uh, that includes uh, addressing and assessing uh, what we need to be doing in active shooter scenarios, uh, rescues, natural disasters. Uh, collaboration with other public safety entities and uh, public communication. Uh, it's, uh, we've, we have learned over the last several years that communication with the public is vital and, uh, and, and necessary. And so uh, we are going to be assessing how we can use funds uh, within Measure O to help us out with that. Uh, and then we're also going to be looking at uh, technology in the future. Uh, technology uh, has become an industry standard and technology is becoming more advanced and more expensive. And so uh, it'll be important for us to be leveraging Measure O funds to assist us as we move forward in technology. Uh, and we'll also be uh, evaluating how we uh, assess and, and work uh, within the quality of life issues, including homelessness and mental illness, and uh, our services to youth and our local schools uh, as we are uh, currently have, uh, I, if we came here uh, a few months ago uh, in front of you and the school board and uh, talked about how important our school resource officers are. Uh, we currently have five and we have, uh, you know, with the annexation of Roseland, uh, we've added high schools. And so uh, it'll be important as we move forward, uh, looking how we can leverage some of these funds to address some of those staffing issues. Uh, with that, 
I am uh, open to any questions or comments. I also have my uh, acting uh, ASO, uh, Pam Lawrence, here with me in case you uh, um, have any questions for her. Thanks for your presentation, Chief. Council, any questions of Chief Navarro? Ms. Vice Mayor. Yeah, um, thank you for your presentation and your good work. I was curious about slide 16. You mentioned that that uh, benefits and salaries have gone up. I'm just wondering if part of that is, has to do more with our PERS liabilities or if it has to do with budgeting and planning that's something that is more under our control. So uh, it, it, PERS does play a part in it. Um, we do have, um, it, it's, the, basically the the fund is uh, is going to run out at some point, and so um, if you know Measure O is is very important to us. If uh, if if it does uh, sunset, uh, then uh, the the funds begin to dwindle and disappear, and so um, the the Measure O funds just can't compete and keep up with with the current uh, the current funding that we have. Thank you. Do you have a plan to have the uh, the green line be higher than the blue line going forward? We, we are currently working on that. Uh, we are evaluating what we need to do from a staffing level and how we um, um, how we can address that with a, uh, within uh, Measure O and our general fund. Uh, but uh, uh, so we're working closely with the uh, uh, with our finance uh, finance team, including uh, uh, Chuck McBride and our ASO, as we uh, as we look into uh, the future to see what we can do. Thank you. I appreciate it. Any other questions? Thank you, Chief. Great. The next section is violence prevention, and kicking off this part of the presentation is Interim Director Carter. Mayor Schwedhelm, uh, Vice Mayor Fleming, Jason Carter with Community Programs and Engagement. Uh, with me I have Kelly Magnuson, uh, Deputy Director of Recreation, and Jason Parrish, the ASO for Community Programs and Engagement. Before I hand it over to Jason, I'd also like to uh, give a shout out to Yvette Miner. She's the Vice Chair for the Measure of Citizens Oversight Committee, so feel free to pass along any compliments as far as Measure of Funding goes. So with that, Jason Parrish will start us off. All right, in the first slide here, as you see, uh, our ending fund balance of just short of $1.5 million is, or $1.1 $1 .1 million is roughly $100,000 more than what the City Council saw from the 10-year plan in spring. That money will be reconsidered uh, as part of the next budget process and how to continue to sustainably fund our programs. And overall in the funding scheme, as you could see, the choice grants, as the ordinance requires, uh, is 35% of the violence prevention program. The rest, vast majority of the uh, rest of the money is split between the staffing to provide either direct services within the neighborhood service sites in recreation or the community outreach and grant management program within the Office of Community Engagement. And as you can see, we have been working very hard to ensure that for the long-term health of the program through the end of the Measure O, that our expenditures and revenues are able to uh, uh, be sustainable through that period. So the partnership has continued alignment with local and state initiatives, uh, such as Health Actions, Cradle to Career. We have Sonoma County Probations, Keeping Kids in School initiatives as well. Um, and also the Sonoma County Upstream Investments Policy Team. And of course, our regularly occurring uh, internal cohorts, the policy team and the operational team. Uh, we currently have 43 members of the policy team and 64 members of the operational team representing over 50 organizations. In September 2018, we had our first annual Gang Prevention Awareness Month after a successful nine years of Gang Prevention Awareness Week. Uh, we kicked it off with a seminar uh, focusing on trauma-informed toolkits for over 125 direct service providers. We also had our first annual Youth September Madness Basketball Tournament with Recreations Division. We had over 300 in attendance, and also our first ever Roseland Unity Run, uh, in addition to continuing events such as the South Park Day Night Festival. 
for our third annual Parent Engagement Month. Uh, that's a series of trainings for um, parents of at-risk youth to identify early at-risk behaviors and also community resources that are available uh, through nonprofits and various organizations. We did a little twist this time. Instead of asking our parents to come to us, we actually went to them. So we went to Cook Middle School's uh, ELAC meeting, which is the English Learners Advisory Committee. Uh, we also went to Santa Rosa City Schools district-wide uh, DLAC meeting as well. And we partnered with the Roseland CBI group uh, for a parent engagement dinner in partnership with the police department. I think this was a win-win because not only was it <clears throat> an opportunity for our parents to be educated on some of the resources out there, but it also gave an opportunity for our police department to initiate some of our uh, community policing dialogues. We are currently still administering our choice grant program. We're wrapping up cycle nine, and we will be here next week to discuss uh, the grant review teams, is there, are we safe? The grant review team's recommendations for cycle 10. And uh, our guiding people successfully program, I'll discuss on a future slide. So you can see with cycle nine, we funded um, nine organizations with 736,000. Some of that data, we served over 3,400 youth participants, uh, almost 1,400 events and workshops with a total of 6,100 attendees. Uh, something that I, I'd like to recognize, this was the first grant cycle after releasing the Community Safety Scorecard. Um, it's, the Community Safety Scorecard had 10 strategic recommendations and during the strategic planning process, we narrowed it down to four. Uh, student, excuse, excuse me, school readiness, truancy prevention, workforce development, and street outreach. And, and this shift was definitely noticeable in this grant cycle in particular. Um, services from early childhood education, pro-social activities, parent education, crisis intervention, and of course, uh, reentry services for, um, for youth that are, that are reentering into the community. So our <clears throat> Guiding People Successfully program is our referral component. Uh, with state funding, we are able to have a wraparound coordinator take referrals in for high-risk youth from probation, from schools, from different organizations, um, and she takes that information and does a case review at an MDART, which is a multidisciplinary assessment and referral team, which consists of all of our choice-funded agencies plus different uh, entities, uh, such as different law enforcement entities, and also a couple more state-funded nonprofits. And although GPS is not specifically funded by Measuro, we did leverage local Measuro dollars to apply for the grant, and in turn, we've received multiple rounds of state funding. Uh, in this past fiscal year, some of the data points from GPS specifically, 96 high-risk unduplicated youth and 51 of their family members received case management, mental health support, and workforce development. And with that, I will turn it over to Kelly Magnuson. Good afternoon, Kelly Magnuson with Recreation Division and um, the Neighborhood Services section of the Recreation and Parks Department serves at risk underserved areas of Santa Rosa. So our focus is on direct service for youth, primarily school age youth, but we also serve middle aged school kids and then we also hire older teens and college students. So we've got quite a range of ages that we're serving. Um, we have a very robust sports program. It's very popular, uh, serving about 1,300 youth a year at 10 sites. Um, our most popular program is our Junior Warriors basketball. We have it in the fall and the spring, and it is always full and very popular. And then this past summer, we added on um, a softball component to our Junior Giants program, and that, that served over 350 youth. Uh, with a lot of the people uh, participating were volunteer parents and then uh, volunteer coaches. So that was, a, that was a very popular program over the summer. And then during the school year, we have our community after school programs at uh, different sites throughout the city, primarily in the Northwest and the Southwest. However, this past um, year, we added on the Lark Field sites, if you'll remember, and they were fully funded by Burbank uh, Housing. And so those other seven, six sites are also co-funded 
by Burbank Housing with Measure O dollars and some general fund dollars. But they can, Burbank Housing continues to want us to add on sites in their rec rooms at their housing facilities, and so we're working with them on the highest needs neighborhoods as well. So those programs are going really well. They have a homework component, arts and crafts, uh, recreation activities, sports, field trips. We bring in guest speakers, and we also have several large special events throughout the year. And then during the summer, we have uh, the full the full day programs. We call that Recreation Sensation. They're for seven weeks during the summer. They're very popular. They're at school sites, and so we partner with um, Santa Rosa City Schools and Roseland School District. And last year, we were at Bellevue. Bellevue School District as well. And then during that summer season, we have a program called Work Experience where we have middle age, middle school age kids participate on a voluntary basis, and that's become real popular as well. There's about 40 middle, middle school kids that help out in those programs, and that's like a training ground for them to eventually apply for the paid job. So we really like to take the kids from our programs as youth into the middle school program, into the volunteer program, and then hopefully we're hiring them to come back and work in our programs. So also during the summer, we have our teen basketball camp. That's, that's very popular, 50, 60 teens participate in that. Um, we've been working really hard the last couple years to involve the parents and the families more. Uh, the staff are doing orientation nights uh, so they get to meet the whole family. They're doing more s barbecues at each site, special events. Um, so the whole goal is to keep the family involved with the youth and their programs. And we hope to see them program after program, year after year, trying to keep them involved in healthy activities. So lastly, I'd just like to uh, note that about 30% of our temporary seasonal staff that work in our programs are from the high needs areas that we serve. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, while we have uh, the vice chair, would you like to make some comments on uh, conversations you had with the oversight committee? Good evening, everyone, and thank you for giving us an opportunity to speak. I just wanted to reiterate the importance of this uh, Measure O. I've seen many students and many people in the community as you're out and about and you hear people talking about the different programs that is served by Measure O. I just want to reiterate to you all that you continue to keep this in mind as we're moving forward and that the sunset time is coming up. So please take that in consideration. Uh, many of these activities that we have, I would like to see as as a Measure O person, like to see more bumper stickers and things, no, letting people know what exactly Measure O is funding. All out here in the community is fire police. That's not all that Measure O does. So it's very important that we get the word out about what it offers the city. So as you're moving forward and as we're all moving forward, I would like to see more documentation pointing out what Measure O funds is actually taken care of out in the community because it does do serve a great purpose and it helps keep people, kids, families together and try to keep them together in the sense of being able to have that family time and spend more time together. So please, as you're moving forward with this, with these decisions that we have to make, continue to keep us in mind and continue to move forward with the funding. Great, thanks Yvette. Council, questions? <laughs> Ms. Vice Mayor. Thank you for uh, all the great work you do. I'm curious to know, it's, you serve a ton of, of, of young people. I'm wondering if there's demographic information that you collect on our young people beyond that, that some of them are at risk. I'm asking basically, are, are we serving equal proportions of, of male and female children? Can you say that last part again? Yeah, are we serving equal amounts of male and female children? equal amounts. Are, are girls getting the services? There's a lot of emphasis on sports in this, and I'm curious oh, to know if girls are getting services at the same rate that, that I, boys are. And, and the reason I'm asking is because you do have a, an awesome pipeline for jobs, but only a third of city employees are female, so I'm curious to know if we're doing something about that at this level. I think we're doing a great job of that. Our, all of our sports are co-ed. 
So um, we and we have a lot of girls playing in, in the leagues, um, and then our after-school programs, I would say, are equal as well. That's fantastic so, to hear. Yeah. So Thank it's you. going really well. We try specifically to get the girls to play all the sports as well. Wonderful. Any other questions, Mr. Alves? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, our, our current plan, our current efforts are tied to the uh, community safety scorecard that was developed, I believe, 2016. So and I think it's guiding the current plan. So how do, how do they tie in? It's been four years. So at what point do we start measuring and looking at uh, comparisons as to what has changed with, uh, I think, probably over 15 different domains that are included in that? So this upcoming fiscal year, we'll have an update to the community safety scorecard that we'll be initiating. We're also working with the Sonoma County Human Services Department uh, upstream investments team that not only released the portrait of Sonoma, but also the, the recent Latino scorecard that was released at the State of the Latino Community event uh, by LOCN. And so we, we really want to look at those 10 original recommendations and how the strategic plan narrowed it down to four, but then from that, gather the data with those four and then see if there's a potential change in, in how we're gathering the data, who we're funding, who's at the table. I think we made a big statement with uh, the school readiness component. It, as you know, Council Member Olivera is from the beginning, it's, it's mainly the intervention piece and over the years it's evolved and matured into very much of a public health approach at violence prevention and now I'm, I'm proud to say that category of school readiness is our most is our highest funded category and, that, and that's a big statement to us and so I, I, I think for us we're constantly evolving and, and we look forward to seeing what the data shows but not only that utilizing that to uh, implement in, and then release a new update to the scorecard I'm sorry so so we are collecting data as time passes since the implementation of the scorecard and the current uh, strategic plan correct okay thank you any other questions? Do we have any cards on this item? All right, Mr. Sawyer, you have this item. Thank you, Mayor, and before I um, introduce the motion, I wanna say thank you as well. And I know that the police department and the fire department and the uh, violence prevention partnership all benefit a great deal from the funds that were that were approved and voted on by the city by the residents of the city of Santa Rosa. So thank you to those residents. And one of these days we will be looking at reauthorizing. Um, a, I would think reauthorizing Measure O. Um, it, it happens fast. It, it's um, it's something that seemed far away um, not that long ago. And so I agree that, that as much promotion as we can uh, to get the word out about these, the enhancements to our police and fire departments and the programs that are provided by the Violence Prevention Partnership, um, getting those word, getting that word out, the better off we'll be. So with that, I will introduce a motion to accept the Measure O annual report for fiscal year 2018-2019 um, and wait for the reading. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any additional comments? I just also want to reiterate, you know, my thanks for the work that's being done. And Ms. Miner, your points about whether we're marketing it, Rec and Park does a great job of marketing all the uh, activities there. Uh, but the one thing that's missing is like how much is tied into Measure O. Pe people I think are getting the benefit of it and not realizing that's the source of it, the voters of Santa Rosa. So I think it is something I know in the next couple of years we'll be working on as the measure is due to sunset. and this body will make a decision if we move forward on with it because the work is um, incredible. So I appreciate all your efforts. All right, with that, your votes please. And that passes with five eyes. Thank you very much. Mr. Gruen, item 14.2. Item 14.2 is a report on potential termination of the city's temporary prohibition on rental housing price gouging through repeal of chapter 10-44 of the city code. Reporting is Sue Gallagher, city attorney. Good evening, um, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Um, this is a 
opportunity for the council to consider uh, whether to continue or terminate um, the city's temporary prohibition on rental house price gouging. Uh, that prohibition was uh, put in place shortly after the 2017 fires and has been continuing since that time. So as I said, this is a scheduled um, review. In the immediate aftermath of the 2017 fires, the council adopted the temporary prohibition on rental house uh, price gouging. And last year, last November of 2018, uh, the council uh, considered whether to continue that prohibition in place and uh, determined yes to continue it and extended the price gouging ordinance to, and I quote, at least October 9th, 2019, at which time it shall be subject to review by the city council at a regularly scheduled council meeting. So this is that opportunity for review. Um, the background, we're all very familiar with the background um, of this ordinance, um, came out of the October 2017 wildfires when those wildfires destroyed uh, approximately 3,000 homes in Santa Rosa alone, uh, but in addition, several thousand more in the surrounding area. Uh, that destruction uh, made, uh, exacerbated, made significantly worse an already very severe shortage of rental housing. And it uh, was almost immediately after the fires that we did begin uh, receiving um, um, allegations of potential price gouging in the city's rental housing market. Um, those uh, allegations and complaints were received both by council members and by our staff. So just uh, about two weeks uh, after the fires, the uh, council did adopt an urgency ordinance adding chapter uh, 1044 to the city code. Uh, chapter 1044 prohibits any landlord from increasing residential rents to more than 10% above the price charged immediately prior to October 9th. Uh, October 9th, of course, was the date on which the city proclaimed a state of uh, local emergency uh, due, to the, um, due to the fires that were still underway at that time. Chapter 1044 also prohibits any landlord from evicting an existing tenant or terminating an existing lease and subsequently renting the same unit for more than 10% above the price that had been charged in the 30 days immediately preceding October 9th, 2017. Um, these prohibitions um, apply to all residential units in Santa Rosa, uh, residential units of any kind, and it includes also hotels, motels, and vacation rentals. Um, there are some exceptions um, that are uh, built into the ordinance uh, that allow landlords uh, to increase rents uh, when certain types of repairs are needed to the unit. Um, the ordinance is enforced through code enforcement. I will say that we believe it has had um, a significant deterrent effect, um, and certainly we've had uh, many uh, conversations with both landlords uh, and tenants, um, but uh, there have been no formal proceedings, enforcement proceedings uh, instituted under the ordinance. The ordinance uh, generally mirrored state law in Penal Code Section 396. Um, Section 396 is triggered uh, in the event of an emergency declared um, by uh, either at the federal, state, or local level. And uh, in the event of an emergency, Section uh, 396 prohibits landlords, very similar to our own chapter, from increasing residential rents more than 10 percent and it begins just during the first 30 days after the declaration of an emergency, but then it also continues for any period in which the de declaration of emergency is extended. Uh, the governor has specific authority also to extend the operation of 396 uh, as he deems appropriate. Um, Section uh, 396 also prohibits landlords from evicting an existing tenant or terminating an existing lease and renting the same unit to another person at a price greater uh, than the uh, than, than allowed under the statute, that would be above the 10%. Um, 
based on the date of the uh, declaration of emergency. Um, the state statute applies only to those units with an initial lease term of one year or less. So it is slightly more narrow than our local ordinance, uh, which applies to all rental units of all kinds. Uh, in Sonoma County, the section 396 is enforced by the Sonoma County District Attorney and uh, that office does have a very strong and effective program of enforcement. And particularly in the um, um, immediate months after the 2017 fires, um, the District Attorney's office did uh, handle uh, quite a few complaints and did pursue a number of, um, of criminal actions. So initially, Chapter 1044, when this council first adopted it, um, was to remain in effect until April 18, uh, 2018. Um, that followed um, the governor's extension of the effectiveness of Penal Code 396 to that same date. So that was how we set that date, was that was a date that the, that the governor had, had set for the state statute. Uh, on May 8th, uh, 2018, the Council by Urgency Ordinance extended the term of the uh, price gouging ordinance to December 4th, 2018. That also mirrored uh, actions by the governor. Um, we made it, uh, the, 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 we made the term go till December 4th or for so long as the state declaration of emergency remained in effect. On November 27th, uh, 2018, a uh, week or so before the ordinance was uh, scheduled to expire, the Council by Urgency Ordinance further extended the term again to at least October 9th, 2019, and that was the point at which Council uh, directed that after October 9th, it would come, the matter would come back to the Council for a consideration of, of next steps. So the price gouging ordinance does remain in effect at this time. And similarly, Section 396 also remains in effect at this time. Uh, as I said, at the soon after the 2017 fires, the governor extended the prohibitions uh, in Sonoma County and the surrounding counties, including Lake Mendocino, Napa, and Solano, uh, to April 18th. The governor subsequently extended the applicability of, of the statute um, three additional times, all again rel relating back to the 2017 fires. Um, so under those extensions, uh, section uh, 396 remains in effect in Sonoma County through December 31st, uh, 2019, the end of this year. I'll note that section 396 has also been triggered um, by the um, uh, declarations of state of emergency relative to the Kincaid fire this year. Um, So it's now uh, up to the council to determine what uh, what next steps to take, whether to continue chapter 1044 in effect or to terminate um, the price gouging ordinance now after a little more than two years of its effectiveness. Um, there are three things that we uh, looked at. First is what is the state of uh, city's reconstruction and recovery? Um, as you know and as you uh, have heard reports, we have substantial reconstruction is underway. Uh, many homes have been rebuilt, but we're still far from completion. There's still a lot of uh, reconstruction that, that needs to uh, take place. Our rental market remains significantly constrained, um, perhaps in part due to the um, the, the destruction that was um, uh, due to the 2017 fires, but also that our rental market in general has been um, difficult for some period of time. Second element that we've looked at is the passage of time. Chapter 1044 sets a baseline of October 9th, 2017, the date on the, of our local uh, declaration of emergency and it prevents increases of more than 10% above that baseline for the duration of the ordinance. So it is a one-time cap and it survives for the entire life of the ordinance. It is not an annual increase, it is a one-time uh, one cap. Um, 
we are hearing from a number of uh, landlords. I know we get calls into our office. I know the city manager's uh, office gets calls, and I imagine that the council members do as well, um, of landlords who are feeling uh, pressure um, uh, because of that, uh, that ongoing restriction. Um, the other thing we looked at is the availability of uh, ongoing state protections. Um, at this point, Penal Code Section 396 is still in effect relative to the 2017 fires, but only through December 31st. Um, I have not heard uh, whether the governor intends to extend that, but as I mentioned, that section is now applicable under uh, the declaration with respect to the Kincaid fire. The other piece of um, state legislation is the Tenant Protection Act of 2019, that's AB 1482. Um, that'll go into effect as of January 1st, uh, 2020, and I, I think it's, it's relevant to look at what the terms of that statute uh, are. Uh, Tenant Protection Act applies to rental housing units, this is in general, applies to rental housing units 15 years and older. It does exclude single family homes unless those homes are owned by certain types of trusts or corporations. Um, the act limits rental increases to either 5% um, plus the um, increase in the CPI or 10%, whichever is less. I would note also that this annual cap is an annual cap um, and that for the initial year, it will reach back to March 15th, 2019. So any increases in rent that took place um, from March 15th up to January 1st will be included in the calculation um, of the rent increases that are subject to this limitation. The Tenant Protection Act also uh, includes uh, just cause eviction uh, restrictions. So it prohibits eviction of tenants um, without just cause and it includes at fault just cause, which would be a tenant's failure to pay rent, a uh, tenant's breach of the lease, tenant's maintenance of a nuisance and similar um, behaviors. And it also includes no fault just cause, which would be the landlord's actions, that the landlord is removing the unit from the market, the owner is moving in, those kinds of things. Um, the uh, act is, uh, does include a sunset provision that it will be in effect for 10 years and then will sunset unless the legislature at that time decides to continue it. Uh, and I will note that um, the act expressly does not preempt uh, additional local regulations um, on, top of, on top of these provisions. So with that, um, we do recommend, and this is pursuant to the council's direction from last November 2018, it's recommended that the city, by the city attorney, that to, uh, by myself, that the council consider whether to repeal chapter 1044 of the city, Santa Rosa city code at this time. Uh, repeal of chapter 1044 would terminate the city's temporary prohibition on rental housing price gouging and the associated temporary limitations on tenant evictions, again, as those prohibitions were originally adopted following the 2017 wildfires. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Sue. Uh, council, any questions for our city attorney? Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, hey, Sue, there's on slide nine, there's a little bit of an odd overlap between the local uh, ordinance as well as the state law. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding correctly that from the reach back of AB 1482 uh, to, the, to March 15th, if somebody in Santa Rosa, a landlord in Santa Rosa had not raised rent at all at that point, or say they'd done 5%, that from that point forward, from March 15th of 2019, regardless of what we do at this point through March 15th of 2020, they'd still be under that 5% plus CPI cap. That's correct, 5% plus CPI or 10%, whichever is less. Yeah, so currently they do have the 5% because that's all we've, we've got allowed in our ordinance. 
Uh, and then if the, the ordinance were to expire, then they have basically the CPI that was left. Does that make sense? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I understand. Um, our ordinance 1044 limits um, the increase to 10% over that from, um, from right. 2017. And, and that's for that entire period. So a landlord could have increased uh, the rent um, shortly after the ordinance was adopted, could have increased their rent by 10% at that time, mm -hmm. and then would have had to stay with that rent level all the way through till today, until uh, for so long as the ordinance survives. Um, you know, another scenario, perhaps someone had not raised the rent at all uh, until, and then on March 30th of last year, of this year, of 2019, raised it by 5%, they would then be limited to uh, an increase um, by the increase in the CPI um, or 5%. Um, yeah, whichever no, is less. That's the direction that I was mostly yeah. asking questions about is for folks who had not raised it to that 10% level yes. before uh, 1482 was passed, how that would interplay. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously we're not discussing this in a vacuum. The county also is discussing this. The state has been discussing, or at least the governor's office mm -hmm. has been discussing um, 396. Do we know what those conversations are looking like as well? Do we know if the governor intends to allow the emergency declaration uh, to actually sunset on December 31st? And has the county gotten into any conversations about price gouging and what that means for them on the county level as well? I'm not aware of any decisions that have come out of the governor's office, um, and I am not aware of conversations taking place um, at the county uh, either. The county back in 2017 chose not to adopt a local ordinance but to rely on uh, 396 and, um, and and so they will be, it will not be a county decision uh, at, at this point. They're at the whims of the governor. Uh, they are. Um, now that being said, if 396 continues in effect, county has adopted its own local de declaration of emergency so long as they maintain the declaration of local emergency at the local level, um, uh, 396 will continue to apply. So it applies whether it's a federal, state, or local declaration of, of emergency and for so long as that declaration remains in, in effect. So is that different from the local declaration of emergency that we do as well? No, our, we, we're um, both our local, both Chapter 10 of uh, uh, 44 and Penal Code 396 both apply at the same time within the city of Santa Rosa. Yeah, I guess my question is, uh, will we continue to see local emergencies from the city that are on the agenda that uh, are separate from the price gouging ordinance, and does it have any impact on that? that conversation? Um, yes, we'll be, the under state law, we need to bring back for review by the council the local declaration of local emergency every 60 days. Um, we will be bringing that back to the council. I believe it may be even uh, at your next meeting. Um, and so long as you continue that declaration of emergency, the provisions of 396 would continue to apply. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? Ms. Eisman? Yeah, this is sort of tagging on to um, what Mr. Rogers was saying. I'm, I'm just curious to know how, you know, when we consider repealing this, how we determine a state of emergency, because I'm wondering if staff, and I, I understand this may or may not be within your purview, but that staff will likely be recommending that we maintain a state of emergency? Um, yes, and again, um, that, that state of emergency isn't, of course, on the agenda for tonight, but I will at least answer it in the context of its impact on, uh, on this matter. Um, at this point, we will we will be recommending, I believe it's in the preliminary ag agenda that's been published, recommending continuance of the declaration of an emergency. Um, we are aware that there 
um, have been uh, suggestions that at some point we need to come back and talk about um, does it make sense to continue that uh, proclamation of a local emergency from the 2017 fires? What are the criteria that we should use to determine whether to continue it or not? And that discussion, um, we, we would be anticipating that that would happen, you know, soon. Right, so again, you feel free to, to tell me that this is not an agendized matter, and so mm -hmm. just to move on to my next question, but how, how would we determine fidelity in this one area to an emergency or saying that we're done versus not in another area? And I can tell that I've gone off the agenda here, but I'm just trying to figure out here how to justify saying that in this one matter we're not in an emergency, but we're still in an emergency for broader purposes. Um, we will either be in the dec either the proclamation of local emergency um, relative to the 2017 fires will remain in effect and would have the impact here of keeping us under 396 uh, and have impacts in other elements, uh, in other realms than the city is uh, working in at this point or it will be terminated and it will be terminated for all purposes. It would not be continued for for only one purpose. It, a proclamation of, of local emergency either continues or it doesn't. Okay, I'll move on from this because I can okay. sense I want, want to go further off okay. um, on that, but let's not do that and stay within the Brown Act. Um, at, at what rate, uh, Compared with, say, 18 months ago, are we getting complaints of rent, uh, rent price gouging? I don't have that data. Um, our office, um, early on, we were receiving um, those complaints. Um, we have not, I mean, but that's anecdotal information. But it's okay, um, I don't expect I, you to have I the numbers. Yeah, I'm just curious I don't, to know if you've seen a decline. Um, we have in our office, but again, uh, our office is not the um, proper uh, venue for bringing those complaints, so I can't That's say whether folks have learned that there are other avenues, better avenues to bring those complaints, but I am not aware um, of, I, I, I can't tell you right now what the uh, numbers are. I, I see our director coming down. Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot. So Dave Wine, Housing and Community Services. We also operate the code enforcement program for the city of Santa Rosa. And we have not had any complaints regarding price gouging where we had to open a case. Mostly when we hear about it, it comes through our Section 8 voucher program when our, <clears throat> excuse me, one of our property owners is inquiring about how they can increase their rent and what the rules are. But under, under complaints, no. So when I look to moving to considering, you know, repealing this ordinance, what I'm trying to figure out is has there been a change or a delta since the post acute post fire period? And I'm asking you if you're a, been able to track that and if there has been a change. Not through code enforcement. There has Not, been no change. There's been no change. So there it remains a continual um, complaints or. Well, under price gouging and code enforcement, we haven't received any complaints is the most direct way I can answer the question. So there's never been a complaint? No, what I was trying to explain, council member, is we get inquiries into our voucher program about, from our property owners, our landlords, about how they might work with this cap to raise rents under our program, but not through the code enforcement program. Sorry if I confused you there. Okay. All right, I'll, thank you for your, your sure. help. And, I, and maybe I can add a little bit to that. I, I think um, what Director Gwine is indicating and I think has been, um, at least as I say anecdotally experienced through our office is that while initially we received many complaints um, by tenants uh, concerned about price gouging or uh, improper evictions, um, more recently we are receiving more calls from landlords expressing concerns about how they might uh, be able to adjust their rents. Um, but again, that's only anecdotal. That's helpful. And I'm just curious to know from the, from I did go online and I saw the, the portal for filing, um, for code enforcement and for filing a complaint. I'm wondering if it's possible going forward if we are to 
to repeal the ordinance, can we have a way uh, of essentially tagging the, the type of complaint so that we know? Uh, and, and the second half of that is, is if we are able to tag it, would we be able to bring it back to council? I understand if we're potentially not under a state of emergency, we wouldn't be able to do this type of thing, but we might be able to do other policy things or just be aware that there, this has been an impact and, and work with our partners like legal aid to, to assist our more vulnerable tenants. We can uh, track complaints on this nature, and certainly if the council wanted us to return with that information, we could do so. Thank you. Thanks, and I have a just related question. So I heard there have been no formal investigations related to our emergency ordinance, but you, I also heard you say the Sonoma County DA's office investigates th uh, violations of 396. Um, do you know what their numbers are? I don't have their numbers offhand, uh, and I'm sorry I did not bring those, but the I know in the early, probably the first six, six to nine months after the fires, um, they did handle a lot of complaints, and in fact, we often referred people to the district attorney uh, if it if the, if the alleged violation fell both within our ordinance and within uh, 396, we would give people options because through uh, under 1044, it's a code enforcement proceeding, uh, whereas uh, if it's under um, 396, it's a criminal proceeding, proceeding and has all the uh, has a stronger um, and quicker enforcement uh, through the district attorney. Um, so I know that we also referred people, we, we gave them the options. I wouldn't say we referred people, but we could take care of it here or you have this other option as well. Um, and I am just not recalling the exact numbers, but I do recall uh, in generally that they process um, you know, probably a hundred or more complaints and that they did prosecute or at least uh, initiate actions against uh, um, perhaps a couple dozen uh, landlords. In those <clears throat> jurisdictionally, the DA's office, they would prosecute. In some of those cases probably were with Santa Rosa, involved Santa Rosa residents, correct? Correct. Okay, great. Any other questions from council? Mr. Rogers. Yeah, Dave, just as a question, do you have any information for us, uh, data on what the market trends are right now, uh, what the vacancy rate is in Santa Rosa versus Sonoma County at large or, or other comparable counties? I don't have that information in front of me tonight. There might be some speakers in the audience who can speak to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I would hope that they would. Thank you. Mr. Tibbetts. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'll, I'll chime in because before this item, I, I scanned three sites, uh, a site that derives numbers from the U.S. Census Bureau, HUD and Rent Cafe, because I too wanted to get kind of an idea of what's happening in the market out there. And the numbers I got, I'll share with council in 2017. Um, this is from the website that supposedly derives it from the Census Bureau. It was saying a 4.6% vacancy rate up from 3.4, excuse me, 4.6%, up 1.59% from 2016. HUD's website uh, on analysis of Santa Rosa market trends is 3.5% up 1.9%. Um, and Rent Cafe, uh, I also was curious about average rents. Rent Cafe said it went down 1% average rents in the city, but that was across all sectors of housing, so that includes studios all the way to multiple bedrooms. So I don't know how detailed that is. But I too would welcome if anybody from Legal Aid is here, I uh, might have more, uh, some other numbers. All right, seems like a nice transition. We have several cards here. Uh, so first up would be Shelly Clark followed by Efren Cavillo. Shelly has left the house. Efren, are you still here? Efren's not here. Um, Mark Gwittam, followed by Isabel Fisher. Hi, um, so I just wanted to speak to why we should extend the prohibition on rent gouging. In 2016, I moved into my house um, and I was paying rent at $1,900. Um, then in 2017, that was in May, I moved in. 
So 2017 of May, before the fires, um, my landlord raised the rent $100. Um, and then in 2018, she decided to raise it $200 after the fires. Um, and then I got an email in 2019 saying that she wanted to raise it. So now I'm paying $2,200. Um, she wanted to raise it to $2,500. Hundred, uh, which would be three hundred dollars. Um, however, I was able to speak with people who knew that there was a prohibition on rent gouging, um, and figure out that that was illegal. Um, and so, fortunately, um, I'm still paying twenty two hundred thanks to this prohibition on rent gouging. Um, and uh, the same landlord, also to give a quick story, since I have a little bit more time, um, was my brother's landlord. And um, my brother lived in Coffee Park, and he, if you drive down Coffee Park from Hopper Lane uh, going south, um, the first house you see standing in that area was my brother's house that he was renting. Um, he uh, watered down the house, saved the house, um, and so that was the, that's the first house you would see standing, and he was evicted from that house because it was below market value and uh, that same landlord knew that she could um, raise the rent uh, much higher and it currently is being uh, rented out for much higher than what uh, my brother was paying at the time. So there is a lot of rent gouging going on. Um, it will happen for sure if this doesn't get extended. Um, and you, you saw different people here talking about the homeless population and needles and whatnot. And um, I live on the other side of Highway 12, uh, where where you see all the tent encampments and whatnot. And so, if this if this doesn't get passed, my guess would be that there will be more homeless people. Um, I think it's a simple uh, deductive conclusion to reach. Um, so if we want to prevent that, uh, we should extend it. And people just uh, um, you know really need it. So uh, please extend the um, prohibition on rent gouging. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Isabel Fisher, followed by Keith Becker. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Isabel Fisher, and I'm the chair of North Bay Organizing Project's Housing Task Force. I'm here tonight to urge you to extend the prohibition on rent gouging, not just until the end of this year, but extend it uh, until the end of next year. I have several reasons why I believe you should do this. One, we just had another fire. Prior to it, during and after came power outages, and with those power outages came a lot of lost wages from workplaces being out of power. People lost the food in their homes. People are struggling to make up for these losses, and it's harder than ever to pay rent. Two, um, as was mentioned, uh, AB 1482, although it is going into effect January 1st, it's not going to protect all rental units in the state. Uh, all, all units built within the last 15 years will not be protected under this bill. So if the prohibition on rental gouging is terminated and we're still in a housing emergency, what are renters in those units supposed to do? Uh, without any protection, it's very likely going to become a free-for-all once again to raise the rents. Three, although we just passed a $15 minimum wage for Santa Rosa, which was a necessary step to help working folks, it was only one small step forward. $15 an hour is still not even close to a livable wage in this city or county, with rents still hugely disproportionate to what working and middle class folks make. Finally, if you, as you say, you haven't heard any reports on rents being raised over 10%, and you're using that to justify terminating the prohibition on rent gouging, then please consider that folks are too afraid to report when it does happen to them. Uh, in any unbalanced power dynamic, the person in the position of less power will rarely report when they are being abused out of fear of retaliation. And as we just heard, landlords have tried to raise the rent, but, but because tenants knew their rights and knew it was illegal, they were able to prevent it. So just because you haven't heard a report about that doesn't mean that raising the rent past 10% was not attempted. And finally, through UndocuFund, North Bay Organizing Project has heard stories from tenants who are receiving eviction notices because they are unable to pay their rent because of the lost wages from the power outages. 
Please extend this necessary prohibition on rent gouging for another year. We are still in a state of many emergencies, especially a housing emergency. Do this for your constituents. Please use your power to protect and extending this prohibition will protect tenants. Thank you. Thank you. Keith Becker, followed by Peter Adams. Good evening, council members. First thing, I do want to commend both city council and the county board of supervisors for everything that you've done to date because the institution of Penal Code 396, the institution of the urgency ordinance in the immediate aftermath of the fire had a dramatic effect. In the immediate aftermath of the fire, there were terrible things happening. Are those terrible things still happening? Have they been happening? I've been tracking this for many years. Um, and only recently did we start actually doing measurements, but I've been doing measurements and calculations of not just our vacancies, but the vacancies of 11 property management firms throughout Sonoma County. And as I say, only recently, this is from July to present. 11 different property management firms representing 539 properties listed as available for rent. Rents have decreased in five months by 10% on average. The length of time that they've been on the market has increased from 16 days on average to 36. The market is, and as somebody mentioned earlier on a different subject, and you're talking about the real estate sale market, moderating and actually softening, the rental market is actually doing the same. It is finding its balance. Yes, there has been and had been years ago, um, many instances of just egregious behavior, but that is not happening. Furthermore, as Chris pointed out, as long as um, you consider a state of emergency, Penal Code 396 remains in effect. Um, is it necessary to keep the urgency ordinance in effect on top of that? My argument would be no, because I think that the market is finding its own balance and it's no longer necessary to keep this in effect. Thank you. Thank you. Peter Adams, followed by Jelona Reitzner. All right, hi. I'm a junior college, college student right now. I also work uh, 30 hours a week at a restaurant as a server. And I can tell you right now that um, the only reason I'm able to go to the junior college is because I'm currently living at home with my parents. If I was not able to live here because of the higher rents. Um, I mean, I, would, I just wouldn't have the time to go to school. I'd have to get a second job as all of my coworkers who live independently do, who are in their 20s and more over. Um, so that being said, um, homelessness is absolutely a crisis here. I think we all can agree on that. I think there's sadly, um, some who view it more as it's homeless are pests who we, they, we just want to leave. But it is true that some people are homeless because of drug use, mental illness. Um, but expecting that to get better while someone is homeless is a pretty tall order. It definitely doesn't help. Um, but more importantly, um, yeah, I was looking at vacancy rates versus homelessness. And in the North Bay, there it's about three to two, three vacant homes per homeless resident. Uh, per, per two, sorry, for two homeless residents, but that's also assuming that each person is going to have one home all to themselves, which is also not how things are around here. Um, but yeah, the main reason people are homeless is because they can't afford rent. Three of my coworkers work multiple jobs and are still sleeping in their cars. Um, another two of my coworkers who both have, both parents are working, they have three children, they're sharing one room with one bed. So this isn't, these are working people who can't afford to live here already. So right, like r increasing these rents will not help anyone. Or, well, it won't help poor people, that's for sure. It, uh, it'll certainly help someone. Um, so if our solution to homelessness is to hope to out terrorize them and make it so unpleasant to live here via law enforcement raids, then maybe, maybe we can beat the other cities around here and make it so bad here that they'll go somewhere else. But that doesn't really, I don't think that's practical 
and I certainly don't think it's moral. So, yeah, I mean, I've lived here my entire life. I would like to remain here, but these increasing rents are making that very, very untenable for me. And yeah, it's like saying if the rent cap becomes 5% per year, that's 60% over 10 years. And yeah, so I mean, I definitely won't be able to have kids here at this rate. And it, I might ending up joining my friends in Nevada and Sacramento. So thank you very much. Thank you. Jelona Reitzner followed by Attila Nagy. Good evening, my name is Ilona Reitzner. I'm a teacher here, a local teacher. And uh, I, I was gonna say, I haven't really heard that the city council has reached out to get some research and some uh, data that would actually uh, inform us, which I can see by the questions you have. I have concerns that some of the data is taken from representatives that uh, from landlords rather than from the community. And I'm here to speak for the families in my school. I have, we have three schools. Uh, we have, uh, in all of our districts, we have about 12% uh, students that are registered as homeless. That means every classroom has about three students who sleep in their cars who are registered as homeless. Many of our families live with other family members. They rent garages, they uh, do couch serving. And I think it's really urgent that the council reaches out into the community and into the organizations that represent the community before we make a decision on how uh, families are still affected. And um, when we, I was here last year ago, just about a year ago, and I remember the city council saying that they got uh, complaints, but they weren't really able to handle them, so they referred them to the uh, um, district attorney who had at that time not uh, acted on it. I remember Shelley Clark from Legal Aid speaking that they had about 500 cases of rent gouging, and you have to understand that if you are afraid to be evicted and there was no protection and we still don't have any protection for that, you are just biting the bullets if your rents are enraged and erased, um, uh, raised, I'm sorry. And also I remember um, that, uh, people speaking up that they, um, that they have the eviction have been increasing. So there are a lot of loopholes with the 10% and I see there's pressure from landlords and I can see if you're a small landlord, 10% is not much if you consider that over two years. But I'm a teacher, we have to fight for a 2% pay raise every year. So if I'm looking at three years, that's 6% in three years. So I don't see why they would be in a bit different boat than we are. And uh, I'm protected with a union job, so I know our pay raises are more steady than most people's. And we have data for California, and the data in California is very different. It says in between 2006 and 2017, medium annual earnings for California, full-time workers was increased by about 2.1% annual, while the rents increased about 16.1%. And I also remember a report last year saying that the rent prices went up about 35%, um, not less. So I'm really urging you to do further research, and 1482 does not go far enough. Thank you. Attila Nagy, followed by Alex Kalfin. Hi. Um, we were talking about emergency, but really the reality as we know it is that uh, wages are low and the rent is high, and if we need to extend this, as you should know, I mean, I'm wondering, um, and I just, I just feel like nobody who's, who will be making this decision actually has this problem with rent. I, I can guarantee that. And to, for you to make a decision for other people who actually can't make the rent, and do you want to see more homeless people, which we haven't done anything about. We're concerned about the landlords, but are we concerned about the people who actually don't even have a roof? Um, what else that I, I if if uh, 396 uh, is will stop then uh, I think we need to still extend our ordinance here uh, because uh, well you know why so I just urge that you extend this and not repeal it because it doesn't make any sense at all and you should actually know that Alex Kaufman followed by Efren Curio. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, 
Ms. Madam Vice Mayor and members of the council and staff. Alex Calfin with the California Apartment Association. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to have this discussion again. Um, no one in this room is going to argue that there is a housing shortage, and it's not just in Santa Rosa, it's across the state. That is true, and the fires made an issue that was already hard that much more difficult to handle. Um, the issue with this particular ordinance is that, um, you know, we hear folks talking about 10%. Well, we're in year number three now, and if you just do the average, it's really not 10%. If someone went 3% first year, the second or the third, that's really what we're talking about. If you extend it forward, um, that creates a significant challenge for folks that are trying to manage their properties. Um, capital costs do not go up. They're not capped. Folks are still responsible the same way to maintain their units. Um, and that is a challenge for some of our members. Um, so it's not just that simple as, well, it's a 10% cap. It's a one-time issue. The other thing I wanted to mention to you is that we hear a lot of rents are high. Okay, but let's address it. And I think the real solution here is that we will continue to have this discussion until we actually increase the supply of the units. And there's no way to get around that. And one of the challenges is that the units are pretty expensive to build. That's a fact. The reason why units are expensive to build is that's, that's what they cost to be built. So when projects come forward and developers look at them, they look at these type of policies that cities have and they ask the question, well, is this project going to be feasible in this city? So it's sort of this endless cycle where we want to increase the units to get the rents down, but we can't because we have certain policies on the books that make it really difficult to do that. So it's not that simple. And while I'm sensitive to the argument of wages, I'm not convinced that wages really go along with this issue. And that is why it's so hard to actually come to a solution because it becomes a very emotional issue where it turns into many discussions and we lose sort of the goal of what we're trying to accomplish. And on the point of 1482, that bill wasn't passed in a vacuum. That was months and months and months of discussions and negotiations with stakeholders at the table that had skin in the game on both sides. And that was the compromise that was reached. And I think it provides a significant level of protection for tenants move, moving forward and next year, it's the strongest uh, bill in the country. That's also a fact. So those are my comments and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you this evening. Thank you. Stefan Carrillo followed by Thomas Ells. Does this work? Yep. yep. Uh, Mayor Schwedhelm, uh, Vice Mayor Fleming, uh, Council Members, uh, Efren Carrillo with Burbank Housing. Uh, first and foremost, wanted to uh, point the obvious. I think that the uh, emergency ordinance that the Council instituted uh, certainly uh, uh, did what it was intended to do. Uh, it prevented um, uh, uh, the possibility for, uh, in, in most cases, for folks to uh, increase uh, rents or price gouge, as was seen uh, immediately after the fires. Uh, on behalf of Burbank Housing, um, we uh, don't have a position on the extension or the continuance or um, uh, 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 potentially the, uh, the termination. Uh, the position for Burbank, however, it is if the council does decide to move forward uh, with uh, the uh, price uh, gouging uh, ordinance, uh, we would ask that you uh, consider the possibility of having uh, organizations like Burbank that manage uh, uh, affordable housing communities uh, to be exempted, as was the case with Assembly Bill 1482. Uh, the uh, uh, component is was shared a couple of weeks ago. Okay, thank you. We had soccer practice earlier today, so uh, he's with me. Um, uh, uh, as, as I expressed before the council a couple of weeks ago, uh, there have been some unintended consequences as to how uh, rent increases have uh, significantly impacted uh, communities like ours. As also was expressed a couple of weeks ago, we are essentially uh, uh, rent restricted by uh, federal or state covenants, in some cases local covenants uh, administered by the housing authority. And uh, we would just encourage, again, if the council does have the desire to continue uh, moving the price gouging ordinance forward, that you consider an exemption for affordable housing communities, affordable housing developments, because essentially we're already uh, rent controlled 
uh, by uh, default and by the funding mechanisms and the compliance that comes forward. Uh, you have a, a, a tough uh, task ahead of you, I think, in balancing uh, various uh, aspects of protecting renters, protecting communities, uh, and also affording uh, an environment that invites uh, development. Uh, as was stated, uh, we do have a supply issue. Uh, there's certainly a, a demand concern. Uh, keeping folks housed is what we do uh, at Burbank, uh, but we also recognize that the city needs to do what it, what it needs to do to ensure that it fosters an environment that invites the type of development we want to see. And this is development that is across the board uh, at all levels, uh, both market rate uh, and uh, deep restricted or affordable. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Thomas Ells, followed by Mara Ventura. Thank you for addressing this issue and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I just want to say that uh, the conditions that were prevalent at the time of the fires haven't changed. We've got another fire, in which case we're still under the, the uh, 396 state uh, conditions. So, uh, and uh, you know, as long as it, the governor would allow that. But the point is, is that we don't have the houses built yet. Uh, I think you need to really examine uh, what's going to happen, what is happening, and what's going to happen with the people as they're, they're um, uh, they have come off their payments that they've been made by the by the insurance companies. So if you remember what happened to rents was they went up to as high as $10,000 a month people were paying. Doctors had to pay really exorbitant amounts of, of rent, um, supposedly in a, in a home that that wasn't rented, I mean, where that wasn't an increase, right? But those people are still expecting really, really high rents. Those are going to affect the market as we see it until those houses are built to replace the houses that burn, the people paying high rents are gonna drag up the other rents, right? Somebody's gonna say, look, I have the same house as that guy. Why is he getting $10,000 a month? Or why is he getting $5,000 a month for this house? And I can't get that, right? Until the houses are made, until there's a stabilization in the market where the rents stabilize of their own, through the production of the houses that were burned and other houses, then you're gonna see this tremendous impact if you release this. People will just automatically raise their rents a lot, right? And uh, maybe there are some caps. We see caps uh, through the state that could be imposed, uh, but those are still untenable for the people that are here because for the very same reasons that that wages are not rising. So I would just say that the conditions are still the same. There's no reason to take off those caps. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mara Ventura. Hi, good evening, Council Mara Ventura, uh, Director of North Bay Jobs with Justice. Um, I just wanted to make a quick statement on um, hopefully the um, off chance that you decide to lift the emergency uh, rent gouging um, ordinance. Um, and what I mainly wanted to say is that my concern is that we don't have enough local data collected at the moment around the possible impacts that it could have. And I know a few of us have spoken and, and we are um, hoping that the impact will be little to none. Um, and I understand the complications of having this on top of the state law, but um, I really wanna encourage you to either um, push this off for a few months until there's more comprehensive data or there's been an opportunity for community organizations like the tenants unions, like North Bay Jobs of Justice and Legal Aid to possibly survey renters who might be impacted to get a sense of how many cases um, our organization, specifically the tenants union, have had to deal with that maybe aren't recorded at the DA's office. Um, but I also, if that is not something that this council is willing to do tonight, I really encourage you all to be prepared to collect data over the next couple months that we can get a sense if repealing this um, rent gouging ordinance did in fact have an impact. So I know it's something that I'm chatting um, reaching out to your city staff about even in terms of minimum wage, just making sure that we are at least collecting information on um, uh, possible impacts of wage theft. And so in terms of repealing this, um, I know that we are hoping the risk will be, the impact will be little to none, um, but I hope that the city is thinking about the ways in which we will provide an accessible opportunity for um, residents of, of Santa Rosa to at least 
let the city know, file a complaint, or put it in public record somehow, um, that they were um, seeing rent increases, um, especially now during the holiday season, because this was repealed. They're the folks that fall in between the cracks of where the law is, is not protecting them. So um, at the very least, I hope that um, that's being considered by this council and that there's direction to city staff to make sure there's a, a formal process for people to, to let you know so that in, a, in four months from now, you can actually know for sure whether repealing this tonight um, was a mistake or not. Thank you. Thank you. Those are all the cards we have. Council, any questions from any of the comments by members of the meeting? Ms. Vice Mayor? Yeah, this um, came up for me as I was listening to comments. Do under 1482, um, this question is probably for you, Madam City Attorney. Do the do the rebuilds count as built within the last 15 years, or do they go back to when they were originally constructed? Um, they are. Uh, I, I'm not sure of the answer with respect to whether they would go back to the original date of construction or whether they would be deemed new construction, but I would note that they are single family homes, so to the extent that they are owned by individuals, um, owned by uh, anything other than a real estate investment trust, corporation, or lim limited liability company, um, they would be exempt from the rent control and just cause eviction statute. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions? Mr. Sorry. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the, in the, in the uh, possibility that, and I'm not sure where, where the council is going to go tonight, of course, and, and because there are a lot of things to consider, but how quickly, if, if we were to repeal or make a change in our ordinance, one way or another, um, and we are still inside of our, um, our proclamation of a local emergency, and let's just say that, that um, I don't believe this would happen because I, I think that many of the landlords are, um, most of the landlords are not price gougers. We know the ones we read about, the ones we are concerned about, um, the ones that don't play fairly, um, are, are, are the, I believe are in the, in the vast minority. Um, but how quickly, if we needed to respond, if the, if the, if the landlords started to react uh, in a way to try to um, raise the rents quickly and uh, as high as they could, which I, again, I don't think it would happen, but um, how quickly could we declare a state of emergency and or reinstitute um, a price gouging ordinance? Um. Let me start by the price gouging ordinance. Um, is, um, the repeal would be uh, perhaps introduced tonight and perhaps uh, adopted next week. It would go into effect on the 31st day after that. So if you chose to act tonight or begin the process tonight, um, the repeal would take effect in, in uh, mid, mid January. Um, The 396, again, remains in effect, uh, and it remains in effect with respect to the 2017 fires and the 2017 date uh, for as long as um, the council continues the declaration, of, uh, proclamation of local emergency with respect to the 2017 fires. We now have layered on that the declaration of emergency, proclamation of emergency um, relative to the Kincaid fire. Um, so at the state level and the local level, um, that would go to setting a baseline in 2019. So there would be a 10% cap starting in 2019. Um, we could, if you decide to terminate the price gouging at this point, we can certainly track the numbers um, and also work with the district attorney's office to follow their numbers and uh, to ask, you know, to the extent that it's that that the district attorney's numbers are looking back at 2017 or more recently to the 2019 fires. Um, 
In terms of reinstituting the price gouging ordinance, um, we can cert you know, that can certainly be brought back. Um, the price gouging ordinance was initially adopted really in specific response to the impacts of the 2017 fire. So the destruction of the uh, 3,000 homes in Santa Rosa, the destruction of a couple thousand homes in the surrounding areas. And in response to, as I think one of the public speakers mentioned, um, the insurance uh, uh, companies that were willing to pay um, uh, quite extraordinary exorbitant rents and there was there were instances or at least we were getting reports of instances of landlords evicting existing tenants in order to be able to rent to um, a fire survivor uh, with with uh, insurance proceeds um, if you wanted to pursue uh, another price gouging ordinance um, we would need to be looking at those kinds of elements um, price gouging ordinance is enacted under uh, a different legal path than a rent control um, ordinance. Rent control ordinances have um, some state limitations. Um, so if you wanted to reinstitute it, we would have to look at kind of the factual basis of what are we, res what conditions related to an emergency are we responding to? I, I don't know if, if, if that answers your question or. It does, and for the most part, and um, um, I'll wait for more comment after we have a motion on the table. Okay. Thank you. All right, are there any additional questions? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Oliveres, you have this item. Thank you, Mayor. I will introduce an ordinance of the Council of City of Santa Rosa repealing Chapter 10-41 of the Santa Rosa City Code, thereby terminating the temporary pro prohibition on rental housing price gouging originally enacted after the 2017 wildfires. Second. And, and if I may clar clarify, it's 10-44, Chapter 10-44. My apologies, 10-44. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Comments? Yeah, uh, I was gonna say, Mayor, for, oh. for me, I, I feel that the ordinance has uh, done what it's intended to do. I think it's run its course. I think we have uh, other avenues in place that can still provide some uh, protections to renters. It was not intended to be a solution to our housing crisis. It was really in response to the fire issues that we had in 2017. Uh, and so I, I think it's it's time. I think we extended it a couple times, and I think we've even talked about reviewing it in, in October, even going past that date. Uh, and, and I'm not hearing uh, significant information coming forward that we've had uh, an onslaught of reports of, of price gouging related to rentals. I think if they were there, they were there. We can go out looking for them now, but I think if they were there, they would be there. Uh, but yeah, we can go back historically and see how, it's, how it started out and how it uh, potentially tapered off. Uh, that may be valuable information to learn about or hear about later on, but for now, I'm confident in uh, in uh, repelling the uh, the the, uh, the ordinance. Okay. Mr. Sorry, do you want to make any comments? Thank you, Mayor. And I appreciate Councilmember Oliveras's comments. And I, there was the one concern that I have is um, the quality of our housing stock as we move forward. Um, if we were to go another year, um, the increases would be at three and a third percent. Um, I know that that landlords still need to maintain their properties, and um, so if 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 they don't have the um, if they've been keeping their rents low, and many have, and and I do. Um, and I had a, a repair that, that required, that I lost two and a half months of rent. Well, the repair wasn't that big, but we keep our rents low, and, and like I said, many, many landlords do. Um, their ability to make the repair, needed repairs uh, dependent on the amount of rents that's coming, the, the amount of rent that is coming in. And I think that, that like Council Member Oliveira said, uh, I think this, this rent gouging ordinance has um, uh, done its job, and um, I, I'm ready to to uh, move to the state's um, to the state's position um, and uh, in the in, in the AB 1482, and then uh, look for a great deal of success in that in that in those restrictions. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I want to start with the the low hanging fruit, and, and there was a comment that was made that wages uh, are not related at all to the cost of housing. Uh, and, and actually, in fact, it's 
that's opposite to me, that that is the reason that we had the discussion about the minimum wage and increasing it, is because we have seen the desire in our community of people to stay here who are particularly service industry workers who don't make enough uh, to live here. So I do, I just wanted to start with that. Uh, we do, I think, as a council, need to have a all-encompassing conversation about at what point are we no longer in an emergency? Uh, because we are going to be dealing with issues, whether it's price gouging or whether it is some of the things that we have done in the overlay district on rebuild uh, that is going to look piecemeal if we don't have that conversation. Uh, and, I, and I think uh, depending on where you are in the recovery process or where you sit is whether or not you feel like we are still in an emergency. If you've had a chance to have your insurance take care of you uh, and get you back into a home, you might feel like the emergency is over. And if you're one of the people who are still struggling to build your house, then you might still feel like the emergency is ongoing. Making that more difficult is the fact that we are layering on top of that additional emergencies within our community that were impacted by the wildfire but were there beforehand. It will, quite frankly, continue to be there for the foreseeable future, homelessness as well as our housing crisis. And I think until we have the conversation about what metrics we're going to use to determine when we're no longer in an emergency, we're going to keep running into this issue. Uh, for me, when I was approaching this, this issue, I can see both sides of it uh, because I am a renter. Uh, I do know what that's like uh, to be sitting there and to be reliant on whether or not your rent is going to be increased. I also do understand that there are good landlords out there who are trying to make investments in their property to be able to reach the standards that we are, quite frankly, trying to push as a council as it pertains to the rental inspection program. Uh, so for me, thinking about what was the best, slowest, uh, wing walk approach to make sure that we get this right. It was going to be to come to the dais and talk about some form of uh, allowance uh, for uh, a modest increase next year as well as uh, a little bit in terms of investments. And I'm, I'm seeing that a little bit in AB 1482 where I get a little bit uh, squirrely on it is I do understand that that doesn't apply to all rental units, that 1482 doesn't. And I'm curious to see what the impact on our local housing market is. Um, I, I'm going to listen to the rest of my colleagues, but um, I want to make sure that this extends, as the city attorney said, through next year to at least make sure that at a minimum renters have the protections of 1482 and then to collect the data and see whether or not that's insufficient for what's happening in our rental market uh, moving forward. Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mayor. Um, for me, this, you know, I actually came in here tonight uh, wanting to, to do away with the price gouging ordinance. I, I felt that 1482 was um, pretty sufficient. I liked it from day one. I always felt like that was where a rent control ordinance should have ended up, and I'm glad that the state was able to convene uh, both tenants and landlords and their respective advocacy groups and reach that agreement. No matter what I want to do tonight, I want to make sure that we, we come up with a time when our ordinance will end. Um, because what I don't think is fair is that we just keep extending the goal, coast, goal post, but that goal post isn't even in sight. Um, but here's where I, where I, what I was thinking, you know, we did just pass this minimum wage ordinance because it, with the intention that it would help people pay for things like rent and goods and, and things like that. And, uh, one of the thoughts that crossed my mind, and you know, I just kick it out there to the council for consideration, maybe the, the motioner, is to have our ordinance end effective August 1st. That gives the, the landlord real estate community a hard sunset date, but it also gives renters a little bit of assurance that uh, there, there's going to be some headroom coming from their, from their jobs. Um, because I do expect, and good landlords and bad, I do expect that people will increase the rents once they're enabled to because we have put a cap on them for the last couple of years. So I think where I'm coming from, I'm operating as though that will happen. Um, and I just did a little math. If you're making $14 an hour right now uh, and it's going up to 15, that's 160 a month difference change for you. If uh, you are um, the current 
Average rent is 1,916 across all classes of units in Santa Rosa, a 7% increase roughly consistent with the state is 134. So to me, if you just kind of look at it that way, it, it makes some sense. Um, if the council decides not to go this direction tonight, I'm still supportive, but then I, like council member Rogers, I really do want us to track uh, what's gonna happen. Personally, I think that the outlook looks favorable for tenants right now, given what the market's doing based on the three sources I looked up uh, admittedly quickly, um, but more information, I would feel better with more information, uh, certainly down the road. Um, I am fearful though of the concept that we would stop a price gouging ordinance, something happens to the market or another disaster happens, it's now tight, um, and we're talking about bringing a price gouging ordinance back. I think that would almost create more disruption than just extending it to when the minimum wage ordinance would take effect. Um, but those are, those are my comments to the council and I appreciate, I appreciate everyone's thoughtfulness on this issue and I appreciate that we did a price gouging ordinance to begin with because I do think it was effective. Ms. Weissmeyer. Thank you. Mr. Rogers and Mr. Tibbetts said 90% of what I was going to say. But um, so with that, I'd like to put a competing motion on the floor that we end the price gouging ordinance effective August 1 of 2020 and see if I can get a second. Uh, since I brought that idea forward, I will second it. Okay. I wanted to respond to a couple of comments that I that I heard today. One is that th we weren't renters. There's two of us who are renters, and with further further looking at this, I think that I'm getting gouged. And it is really a tough thing to go to your landlord, and it's also a tough thing to be a landowner, it's, a landlord. But the big difference is, and I've said this before, that that there are, it's not a choice to need housing. It's a choice to be a landlord, and I'm certainly would be open to some discussion about allowing for capital improvements and allowing for increases that match CPI over the past few years, something that would be allow for landlords to be able to remain in the black and for, for tenants to be able to move forward. I understand that that's probably not tenable tonight, but um, I'm certainly open to that going forward. And as a matter of philosophy, one of the reasons why I'm in support of this sunsetting in August is that in 2017, the voters were very clear that they do not support rent control, and I do not think that we should use the emergency declaration as a method of avoiding the difficult conversations about the disparity between income and rental costs, and that we need to, as a council, continue to have those conversations and deal with those difficult issues. Um, but I am, as a matter of philosophy, loathe to supersede the will of the voters outside of a state of emergency. I'm generally not in support of government overlay, and I, and I do hope that if we do move to repeal this next year, that we'll have some streamlining in terms of our ordinances and give both our landlords and our tenants, you know, some some clarity and some time to prepare. Also, I'm interested to know. I, I did talk today with with uh, with Shelley Clark of Legal Aid, who mentioned that there was formerly a program called Scripps where. Uh, both landlords and tenants could get information. And I can just see going through this how difficult it is for landlords and tenants to decipher what is what is available to them and what they can do. And, and I think that if we're gonna persist with the overlay, that we need to offer not just clear data connect, collection from our legal and our housing and community services, which is absolutely essential, but that we also need to be clear about our support for, for people who are in the market, regardless of what side they're on, to get to get straightforward information. So I'm in support of a measured approach um, that would have this ordinance expire, and hopefully, my hope would be that this ordinance would sunset alongside the emergency ordinance so that we can have some fidelity in our messaging. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. So um, I, I'm in support of what the first motion was. Reason being, I really think it is duplicative. I think the ordinance served its purpose while we originally passed it, we've extended it, and, and now with both uh, 396 of the Penal Code and then 1482, I think those protections are in place. 
And so I, I think we should do it, because if I heard you correct, uh, Madam City Attorney, if it was we did the first repealing today, it, it would still be in effect until 2020 when both 396 would still be in effect and 1482 is in effect, correct? That, that's correct. It would be uh, effective the 31st day after the final adoption. Okay. So, Mr. Tibbetts. Thanks. So, you know, I'm, I'm reading the votes here. It's not looking promising, but I do want to ask you, uh, Vice Mayor Fleming, to clarify um, for a surety that the expiration date will be August 1st. Um, and I actually also wanted to add to it to exempt uh, federally res rent restricted properties as well. Um, again, I don't expect it to pass, but I just want to make sure should it that that's so what's I'm going into So I'm putting forth a motion wherein the price gouging ordinance would sunset on August 1st, regardless of the, the state of emergency or the local state of emergency. And the other question that, or the other, I accept the friendly amendment of exempting the, that classification of housing. Okay, thank you. If I, if I may, um, through the mayor, um, in terms of price gouging does need to be attached to a declaration of emergency. So that would be the piece of the, the motion that would be uh, um, without basis. So, so I will amend that to say whichever date is first, the emergency declaration or August 1, 2020. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was also going to throw out for a, a discussion with the council that perhaps uh, weighing all of the interests, one thing that we could do is uh, allow the provisions on multifamily homes, the, the things that are covered in AB 1482 to go to the 5% plus CPI, while also then extending the, the price gouging ordinance on the homes that are not covered within 1482 to also that 5% plus CPI as sort of a middle ground to, to move back into. We won't see a, a huge lurch in the market, but it will give landlords an opportunity to make those improvements to their home while also giving some assurity to the public with an end date, uh, as uh, Council Member Tibbetts sort of suggested, uh, call it July 1st when we'll be at $15 an hour, call it August 1st when we remove the declaration. But, but that seems to me like a, a, a prudent approach uh, for us to still see the impacts while also giving uh, landlords an opportunity to make those investments in their properties as well. So I'll make that as a, as a substitute motion. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Please. If, uh, I, if I may step in. Um, the, uh, we have two motions currently on the table. This would be a Third, um, under Rosenberg's rules, we, unless you were you were asking it as a substitute amendment, uh, I'm, I'm asking as a as a friendly friendly amendment, amendment. Okay. to uh, Vice but, Mayor Fleming's and, motion. And, bef and, and bef if I if I may, um, just before we get too far down that that road, um, the agenda item was really about whether the ordinance as it's currently written was either going to be. Uh, extended or not, and if we want to, if the council desires to delve into shifts in the ordinance in terms of its coverage or its terms, um, I would suggest that you ask us to bring that back uh, uh, at, a, at another date um, to get into the, again, the substance of the price gouging ordinance. Are you, um, um, the mayor, are you suggesting that if I were to accept this friendly amendment, that it would go into that territory? That's that's my concern. Is that we would be delving into territory um, that wasn't um, really part of the ad agenda, which was really more of a, a continuation. I think there's some flexibility, but if we start carving up who's going to be uh, subject to the ordinance and who's not and what percentages. I, I, my, I would be more comfortable if we brought that back as a separate item. And for that reason, I'll respectfully decline. Okay. And if I can just get clarification also, um, so we have these two, we'll deal with them one at a time. Yes. Um, but what is the result of it? If, if it's a 3-3 vote with the six of us, 
then the ordinance stays in effect until it gets four votes either to repeal or it'll stay in, t in effect? That, that's correct. Okay. Mr. Goon, did you have something you wanted to add? Or? Um, so Assistant City Manager Gowen was mentioning too that the motion does have the exemption for the rent limited. Um, that's I, I'm not as troubled by that as kind of the complete um, revamp of percentages. Um, so I think that's okay to have that as part of the motion that it would terminate uh, on August 1st, uh, 2020, and would uh, um, but that rent limited units would be uh, released from its terms. Um, the order of consideration would be the second motion would be considered first, the substitute motion, that would vote. And then if that does not pass, we'd go back to the first um, motion that's on the table. If that does not pass, then the ordinance um, absent another alternative motion, um, the ordinance would remain in effect and we can take your direction from there as to what, what the next steps would be. So does everyone on council understand what Vice Mayor Fleming's motion was for the vote? Because that'll be the first one we're voting on. All right, with that, we've got a motion and a second by Mr. Tibbetts. Your votes, please. And that results in three ayes from uh, Ms. Fleming, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Tibbetts, the noes by myself, Mr. Oliveras, and Mr. Sawyer. So do we automatically revert back to the first motion? Yes. Okay, and so that motion, Mr. Oliveras, could you restate it or just so we're clear as to what we're voting for now? Certainly, moving ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa repealing um, Chapter 10-44 of the Santa Rosa City Code, thereby terminating the temporary prohibition on rental housing price gouging originally enacted after the 2017 wildfires and we're further into the text. And that was seconded by Mr. Sawyer. Your votes, please. And that passes with five ayes, one no. Uh, Vice Mayor Fleming voting no. Mr. Goon, you have that look again. I just, yeah, I just, I'm sorry, I just wanted to say that we did hear you and I'll take back uh, the, the direction we heard about tracking this and bringing information back. So that was uh, heard and we got that written down. All right, thank you. On to item 14.3. But item 14.3 item 14 is a report item. It's a third amendment to professional services agreement F01622A with Bureau of Veritas North America, Inc. at Tascadera, California, waiving the competitive selection process per council policy 600-1, extending the term of the agreement, increasing compensation by $3,045,000 for a total not to exceed amount of $13,717,399 for post-fire recovery and rebuild services and amend the fiscal year 2019-2020 general fund budget by increasing appropriations of $2,425,000. And presenting um, back for a second appearance is uh, Deputy Director Gabe Osborne. Good evening, Mayor Schwedholm and members of the council. As mentioned in the introduction, the item before the council at this point in time is an amendment to the Bear of Veritas contract for fire rebuilding services. Uh, this is actually our third amendment and we've used the amendment process as an opportunity to update the council on the status of the rebuild center, some of the services that we've delivered since its opening and the financial stability of that. So really looking at the revenue in regards to the expenditures. 
So many of the slides we have today will be comparing some of our anticipated efforts early on in the process and how that's played out over the last two years. So this slide was generated when we initially approved the budget for the center back in November of 2017. And at that point, we really weren't sure what sort of services would be delivered out of the permit center. We knew there would be a dedicated one-stop shop. We knew there would be dedicated staffing. It would have to have some level of expedited plan review. And there would be a variety of different support resources and then outreach and educational material. Uh, what we found, it's fairly diverse. We have dedicated staffing. Uh, it topped out at 6,000 peak monthly staff hours, over 30 positions in its, its height. Um, there's expedited plan review process. Most minor plans or same house plans get approved in five day period. Uh, there's 24 hour building inspections with no cap. So that means whether we get two inspections or 150, we turn those around in 24 hours. Um, there's landscaping design and consultations. We found that the community struggled with meeting some state requirements on that. So we, we brought in more resources to help out. Um, there's an average number of 3,000 building inspections per month. Um, and we'll go with some total numbers and some future slides. Uh, we also provided assistance to the water department. There were stormwater inspections and a hefty amount of right-of-way inspections and community engagement. And we started up front and we continue that even today. So when we look at the status of rebuilds, this, this chart really focuses on the number of parcels moving forward. Um, we had 200, or excuse me, 2,682 parcels that experienced the loss of a unit, and the total unit count was 3,123. So the pie chart to the right actually shows the parcels and as they're moving forward. Um, so out of that total, we've had 1,983 parcels that are either finaled in the construction process or permitting. That's 75% of the total parcels that were affected by the rebuild, and that really tracks with the two year period. So that, that data was generated in October 31st of this year. When we initially came to council to develop the budget for the permit center, we created this chart, which was our anticipated revenue and expenditures. So we broke out the cost of the contract services over two years. So our initial cost up front, we assumed about 4.6 million in the first year of the operation of the center and approximately 4.2 million in the second year. And we, we thought that that would be offset by revenue with year one of that revenue being about 6 million and year two with that revenue of being about 4.4 million uh, behind that revenue, there were some assumptions about the number of plan checks. Uh, we assumed 1,500 plan checks the first year and 750 inspections. In the second year, we assumed that that would drop off a bit. We had 800 plan checks and 1,000 inspections. And behind that number is a per unit building permit fee of about 5,000. So that's how we generate those totals. So this shows our actuals. Uh, so what we saw in year one, and this slide was presented to council with the previous amendment, is once again, our estimate was 4.6. We saw an actual of 5.8 in expenditures. So that was up a little over a million. Uh, we also saw that same trend occur on the revenue side as well. Uh, we assumed 6 million in revenue and we actually saw almost 7.2. Uh, where we saw 1,500 plan checks in our initial estimate, we got really close to that. Uh, we, we had 1,460 as the total plan check. We were a bit off on the inspections. We thought 750 and we ended up with 15,000. So close, but not quite there. Um, the estimate for the number of, um, excuse me, the, the total plan check fee per unit reduced a little bit. And there were a few different factors. We saw a lot of master plan concepts. So instead of 5,000, we were slightly under that at 4,733. If we extend that out for a second year, we're seeing a little bit of a different trend. Uh, so our estimate for the cost of the, the contract in our second year was 4.2. Uh, we were right around that with the actual at 4.5. Uh, so there's a slight difference there. Uh, where we saw a bit of a change is on the number of permits coming through. So our estimate of revenue coming in was 4.4. The actual revenue coming in was 3.1. So where we thought we had hit around 800 plan checks, we actually hit around 490. So what's happened is a lot of those homes that we're going to rebuild are going to push into year three, which means that revenue is going to push into year three. Uh, what we did see increase is the average cost per plan check. Um, that went over 5,000, uh, it's sitting around 6,346. It's totally associated with the size of the home. So as we see builder, bigger homes, the plan check fee increases. So this uh, chart will track the number of 
intakes of permits that we've seen and the number of inspections we've seen. And this, this will give a pretty good example of why we see the budget picture we do. So over the last two years, we saw a significant spike in the number of permits, and that topped out at 220 in the peak month, which was May of 2018. And that trend has been dropping since then. But if we overlay the number of inspections we performed, is that really has topped out and it continues to stay there. And it's mainly due to the fact that we have uh, 1,100 homes under construction and they stayed in that period for a, a significant amount of time. So we've had invest resources um, that are fairly costly because of the 24 hour inspection turnaround to the inspection process for a significant amount of time. So that threw our projections off a bit. So if we look at the totals on that, so we have 1,983 permits submitted, but in those, those permits, that's 50, 56,000, excuse me, documented inspections. The total number of inspections probably doubles from that because we've had right-of-way inspections that are not documented through our permitting system. So there was a hefty amount of effort to make sure that those, those permits were moved through the construction process on the inspection side. So this next chart we actually showed in the last amendment that we did, it really tracks the revenue and the expenditures. So the first line is the consultant expenditures. So this is the amount of money that we dedicated to the BB process. The next line shows the total expenditures through the permit center. So there was some hard cost up front with the generation of documents, the setting up of the permit center, so that explains that gap and that gap will always follow through. But what we saw in year one is a significant amount of revenue. So it, it showed that the lines actually cross. So if we look at where we started, there was more of an investment from the general fund into the permit center, and that, that t shifted pretty quick in about April of 18, where the revenue was higher than the expenditures. And if we break that down in the first phase, that was all about permit center development. So we were developing outreach. Um, there was a hefty amount of documentation generation for as far as resource guides go. Uh, there was major policy made modification. That's when we developed the RC ordinances, and there was a significant amount of staff participation in that. When we see the lines start to cross, that was due to the fact that there was a significant amount of permits coming in. So we started seeing more submittals around the first uh, for quarter of 2018. At that point, we're dealing with light building inspections. That's not very heavy. We're still very deep into outreach material. Uh, we're still doing quite a bit of public outreach. There's minor modifications to policies at that point, but there's still significant staff participation. When we see this significant gap in the additional revenue, that's really full speed ahead on all fronts. We're doing a significant ton of inspections towards the end of last year. We're still seeing a high volume of permits, outreach material, and all those trends are really still playing out. If we extend the same, oh, and excuse me, and then at the end of the day, that resulted in additional revenue above the expenditures of a million dollars. Um, and at that time, we did it, We thought that probably about 50% of that dedicated cost would have to hold back and go to future inspections because all of the revenue is brought in with the permit intake. If we extend out the same chart into this previous year, um, we hold the same lines. So the, the blue is still the cumul or excuse me, the consultant expenditures. Uh, the orange is still the total, so that's the gap. Um, and then we saw a much different trend. So due to the fact that we were seeing a slower intake of the permits, um, that started to drop. So essentially our operational cost and our revenue have matched at the end of the year in the permit center. Um, if we look at our total cost, then it's running a slight bit of a deficit. If we look at the trends that create that, so right around the first of 2019, we're still seeing significant permits. We have right-of-way coordination and inspection, stormwater inspections, the same trends are holding true. What we saw around May of 19 is things start to drop off a little bit on the, the permit intake. So that's where we get the 1,100 homes under construction, heavy amount of inspection services. Um, but what we see at that point is our average number of new permits per month, which was sticking around 104 through most of 2019 and into 2018, dropped to 50. So we saw a reduction in the number of permits. Um, it's a little difficult to tell from the lines, but there was also a drop in the cost around that time too, because we started making staff reductions to account for the reductions in plan check. So all along, we've been preparing for this situation. We knew it would be a potential to occur, that the lines would cross from revenue and expenditures, and we've developing a game plan to account for that in the permit center. So when we look at the end of the year, it is showing a deficit of 365,000 from the total expenditures um, from the consultant, as well as the revenue that's coming in. So, oh, excuse me. There we go. 
So what we've been trying to figure out is that instead of focusing on the overall rebuild area, we wanted to boil it down to the problem we're trying to solve in year three. So essentially we have 699 inactive parcels. So as far as our year three service of delivery, we wanted to focus on that set of parcels and determine what level of service they need to move forward. And in that group, it's a bit of a mixed bag as far as who controls the parcel. We're still dealing with the initial fire victim in some situations, and so we're documenting that. And we also have got sales of properties and we now have spec home builders that are in the mix. So that's more going to be developed and sold as a market rate home and it isn't really the individual property owner that controls the property anymore. So we've been segmenting that out. We've committed to provide the same level of service to the fire victims and we wanna to try to do that to our best of our ability and that's the purpose of breaking this off. So the map you see to the right highlights that. Um, and we actually have this published currently. It's in our resilient city maps. It shows the number of parcels. So as they get into the permit, these go off the map. So it starts framing the problem moving forward in year three, year four, and however long it takes to cover the rebuild area. So when looking at that parcel number, we're still seeing an anticipated revenue there from the rebuild of about five million. Um, now, early on in the rebuild process, there were a lot of people that came to me and said, we'll never get to 100% recovery on the rebuild. Well, amazingly enough, in Coffee Park, we're 95% there. So I'm not totally sure I believe that. I think there will be some sites that don't move forward. So the reason our numbers are conservative is because they don't factor in the commercial. So when the commercial comes in, it's a much higher plan check fee. So that'll offset any loss we have of residential units not going through. So we still think that that's an accurate estimate for future revenue coming in. And what we're actually seeing now is because of the size of the home that we are anticipating 7,000 per plan check fee for the residential units. So what we've been doing is marking some of the trends of the permit intake to basically determine the amount of revenue and when it will come in fiscal year to fiscal year. Uh, so this really shows the trend line on the number of permits. So we've been tracking that to figure out if that carries forward, what's an anticipated revenue in the next six months as we figure out the financial picture for the remainder of the fiscal year. So our revenue is based on those sort of metrics where we're looking at trends and making decisions based on those. So really where we're at now, looking at those trends, is we do assume that there will be continually a drop on the permit intake, and until we start seeing a reduction in the number of inspections, which will be a mass finalization of the permits that are currently under structure. So when we start dropping to reduce some of those services to account for the reduction in revenue. So currently where we're standing, and this is our projection looking at the, really the remainder of the fiscal year, is we want to basically dedicate an additional 2425000 to the Bureau of Veritas contract. Where that is going to come from is eight hundred almost 900,000 from the general fund reserves. The rest of it is really offset by the building cost. Now, if we project that out into the next calendar year, we do see that deficit recovering based on the trends. So we think that deficit likely will take place when we get into more of a fiscal year discussion next year, but we see a pretty quick recovery because we see an avenue where we can start reducing services, incorporate some of this in-house. We don't have the hefty experience of dealing with the consultant on that, so we're gonna start making smart financial decisions to, to reduce that deficit down, knowing that we have that five million in revenue coming in. So the slide, the next slide shows the really the three year service delivery and what we're anticipating as part of that. So we really wanna attempt to maintain a consistent level of service. So we did make commitments to those property owners that lost structures as part of the fire. We wanna try to maintain that to the best of our ability. As we, the volume shrinks, uh, the program really sh needs to shrink along with that. And so we're trying to figure out the best way to do that and still meet those commitments. So what we're trying to do as part of it is take those 699 parcels and engage the community and try to better understand understand how they're moving forward, when they want to move forward, um, what is really the wall that they're running into is why they're not going, and what we can do to assist. Uh, that's going to give us some better data to understand our projections from a revenue and expenditure standpoint in the next calendar year, true or not. So that part, that process we are going through now, we've engaged the Coffee Strong group about that, and we're looking for other avenues to reach out to the remaining fire victims to see if we can better understand their situations. Um, we are going to continue staff reductions based on activity trends. So a perfect example example is when our average daily inspections, which is currently 150 a day, we can't seem to get away from that number. When that reduces down to 100 on a regular basis, we drop an inspector. So we have data set up that when the services, the reduction of services occurs with the need. So we're tracking that and we have been for the last two years. So uh, some of it is going to be based on trends, but right now we do see 
Pretty much about 80% of the dedicated staff is supporting the inspection process right now in Bureau Veritas. So there can be a dramatic reduction as those inspection needs decrease. And then we're also developing a future closure plan for the center. Um, we're trying to make a determination as to when that can occur. Uh, we're still seeing uh, quite a bit of foot traffic in the center. Um, so when that reduces down, what we'd be looking at is potentially incorporating that into the regular services planning economic development and still attempting to make those same commitments from a turnaround time from inspection and plan review process. So that really highlights our year three service. Um, and I will conclude with the recommendations. Um, many of the item number two, uh, where the money is moving, was highlighted in that slide. I wanna talk a little bit about item number one, and that is waiving the competitive selection procedure process. Um, and really the reason that's important in this situation is the permit center is very dialed in. Um, as we reduce staffing down, it's very important that that expertise that that staff has gained over the last two years remains. Um, so that's, that's very important to the delivery of services in year three. And with that, we can open it up to any questions you may have. Great, thank you for your second presentation. I don't want you to reflect the lack of an audience with this presentation, but it was excellent. Nothing personal, it's just the topic though. Thank you for that. Uh, council, questions on that presentation? See none, do we have any cards? No cards? Uh, let's see, Mr. Rogers, you have this item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I did want to make a comment as well that um, right after the fire, we had a, a pretty substantial conversation about what that meant for the future of our city's budget. And one of the things that this council had agreed upon was uh, looking at how we spend our dollars as an investment in recovery and not shying away from spending dollars because of our financial straits and instead looking at where we could spend those dollars in a way that would come back to us and be beneficial to us. And I think that more than anything, when I tell that story to folks about what the immediate recovery from Santa Rosa was, I think of the permit department and I think of the, the uh, staff bringing us uh, $8 million over two years saying, I know we have almost nothing left in our reserves, but trust us, if you spend this money, you're gonna see it coming back and it's gonna expedite our recovery uh, faster than what other cities have been able to do. And so uh, I, I appreciate the presentation from you. Uh, I am trusting staff because you guys have done an incredible job. Uh, you put a lot of work into those numbers and I hope that the public looks at this as an investment in continuing that recovery uh, in a way that is going to allow Santa Rosa to come back stronger. So with that, I will move the resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa waiving the competitive selection procedures in Council Policy 600-01 in the best interest of the city and approving the Third Amendment to Professional Services Agreement number F01622A with Bureau Veritas North America Inc. Atascadero, California to increase compensation and extend the term of the agreement for post-fire recovery and rebuilding services and waive for the reading of the text. Second. Any additional comments? Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mayor. I, I wanted to piggyback on what Chris was saying and just thank you guys. One of my favorite parts about being on the council is when I get an email from a frustrated citizen about their rebuild process and whatever that may entail. And then I forward it either to David or to somebody. I think Jesse, I forward one to you at some point and your departments, I mean, just the your proactivity in getting back to these folks is stellar. Never would I imagine that, you know, your respective roles in these organizations would actually drill down into the detail of supporting somebody on such a, you know, close level, close to home, certainly for them. And I just really thank you guys for that. It's, it's amazing. The other thing I want to say is, um, you know, the, the, I'm, I'm glad that we're drawn from the general fund and I hope that we will draw from the general fund in the future if you see need go up. One thing I just hope that by downstaff, downstaffing, gosh, it's getting late, um, that we don't, if we see an uptick in, in applications for whatever reason, springtime, I don't know, getting ready for the, the building season, that we, we go back to, the, you bring it back to council and we staff back up and we make sure we keep those permits flowing. Um, so yeah, I look forward to supporting this. Thank you guys. Yeah. And I just want to add to when, when you, I heard you say, Gabe, the uh, tying in these two concepts, staff reductions tied into activity trends. You guys have been walking the talk and you know th this is a lot of money, but I'm very confident in your fiscal management and you're taking those two things, you know, the activity trends are going to drive the staff reductions. So I have full confidence you're going to continue to do what you've been doing since the fires. So with that, we have a motion and a second. Your votes, please.
And that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. All righty, uh, we have two written communications. Uh, we have the quarterly boards commission committee's attendance report and the public safety power shutoff grant application. Uh, do we have any cards for item 17? With that, no further items on the agenda. Meeting. Can, can,